In Pursuit of a Billionaire Book 8 of the Ramsley Brothers series Written by Josephine Bintema Narrated by Josephine Bintema Chapter 1 You know you want one. Kelly had a sing-song voice. They are too cute for words, agreed Dylan, trying to judge his brother's reaction. If we didn't already have two, we might consider keeping the last one. No, firmly said Everett. He wasn't getting drawn into this. That one is for Bo. Kelly held up a bundle of squirming pug puppy. The tan one is for Bex and her baby. That leaves this little fellow wanting a home. No, repeated Everett. He wasn't getting stuck with a dog just because Kelly and Dylan had not managed to ensure Piddles or Puddles or whichever dog it was wasn't spayed when they got her from the shelter. I'm not a dog person. They are so sweet. Sterling reached into the basket and pulled out the darkest one, cuddling it. Jake and Everett shared a look. No doubt Jake was about to get a dog if his girlfriend had anything to do with it. Can we get back to the real reason we decided to meet? Everett grimaced as Dylan handed him a puppy. It was warm and had a bad habit of trying to lick him. He handed it off to Jake. Jake wants to talk about Dad and the company. Ramsley Insurance was in limbo after their father Robert's arrest for money laundering and as an accessory to drug smuggling. Their Uncle David had been smuggling large quantities of heroin into the country, then pouring the money through Ramsley Pharmaceuticals and Ramsley Insurance to hide his tracks. Now Robert was coming to trial, and David was nowhere to be found. I talked to Dad, confirmed Jake. He admits his part in the money laundering. He knew that David was obtaining the money illegally through drug running. Dad has decided to plead guilty. They digested this bit of news. What does that mean exactly? What is he facing if he pleads guilty? Quietly asked Everett. Part of him had still clung to the hope that their father had not known anything about their Uncle David's actions, that he had been unaware of the money laundering and could be found not guilty. I'm not certain, grimly responded Jake. The lawyer believes his sentence will be reduced with a guilty plea. He's hoping that Dad can get into a minimum security prison since Dad is of no threat to society. Mostly we just have to see what the judge says. Minimum security prison? echoed Everett in disbelief. Their dad wasn't exactly young, being in his late seventies. He might live the rest of his life there. In the meanwhile, Dad has asked me to step up to become head of the company, sighed Jake. That means you'll have to come home permanently, Everett. We need you to take over the Western Division of Ramsley Insurance. It was past time to put an end to the European market attempt anyways. <laughs> Is there even going to be a Ramsley Insurance? Dryly asked Everett. He had been working in Europe, trying to break into their insurance market with no success. All of the company's assets are frozen while the FBI continues to investigate. Stocks are tanking. If we can't meet our cash flow needs, we're going to be filing for bankruptcy. We will find the cash flow, firmly responded Jake. We're not going to let our customers down. I've already calculated how much I can put in from my own reserves to help the company. I'm sure that we can also look into loans from various sources to help us until the accounts are unfrozen. No doubt the company will have to pay a hefty fine, but we'll get through it. The FBI dropped in today quietly announced Dylan as he wrapped an arm around Kelly. They're kind enough to give me notice that they're investigating me. They took my files, computer notes, basically everything. All my assets are frozen as they inspect them. I expect they'll be knocking on both your doors next. That means you might not be able to give from your own personal finances to the company, Jake. If we can't give from our own savings, what are our options? Everett asked in concern. Loans, loan extensions, and we could allow other companies to take over certain sections of our business for the interim, explained Jake. We all know Carver's Insurance would love to take over our health care division. They won't give it back if we manage to weather this, warned Dylan. 
I agree. Jake nodded wearily. However, we still need to see that our client's needs get met. How are you going to be? Everett asked Dylan. Is there anything we can do for you? I doubt it. Dylan gave a rueful smile. We all know I wasn't involved in any of this. We'll just have to hope that the FBI investigation realizes that. What about money? asked Sterling. Do you need any? I've been broke before. Kelly gave a tight smile. I'm sure I can teach Dylan the best way to economize. Also, my home health business is doing okay. We'll just have to learn how to live off a much smaller income. It's only temporary, noted Dylan. We'll be okay. If you need anything, let us know, Jake told him. We need a new home for the last puppy, said a hopeful Kelly. Sterling shook her head. No, you don't. He's going home with Jake when he's ready. I suppose I did say I would help, sighed Jake, eyeing the little dog Sterling was petting. That was unwise, replied Everett. He frowned. Is there any way that we could get Dad's sentence reduced further? What do you mean? questioned Dylan. If David were to confess that he coerced Dad into the whole scheme, would it make a difference? wondered Everett. I'm not sure, shrugged Jake. He handed a sleeping puppy back to Kelly. That would be a question for the lawyers. However, I doubt that David is just going to confess. You know what our uncle is like. He does what is best for himself. Everett mulled the idea over. He didn't know what it would take to convince David to make a statement that would help their father. No doubt it would be something quite important. However, how couldn't they at least try? They discussed a few more details before deciding to call it a night. As they walked to the door, Jake took Sterling's hand. The couple had recently started dating after years of Sterling writing about the Ramsleys in the tabloids. To say that their courtship had a rocky start would be an understatement. Then again, it wasn't like Dylan and Kelly's start had been conventional either. Her friends had kidnapped him for a camping trip. The couple had eventually ended up in front of a judge for a marriage of convenience so that Kelly could keep custody of her son. Now they were happily working on becoming a blended family with three boys and soon another child on the way. Everett was the only bachelor of the three brothers left. Part of him envied their relationships. Part of him was happy not to have to modify his life for another person. While Everett was in the city, Dylan had offered to house him. As much as he loved his brothers, Everett was glad to have his own space. He had decided to sublet a condo on a monthly basis until they had things resolved with the charges of money laundering. Entering the condo, Everett unbuttoned his coat, tossing it on a chair. Alexa, turn on the lights. Set temperature to 72 and lock doors, he commanded. Immediately, the condo was flooded with light. Kicking off his shoes, Everett frowned as he looked out over the cityscape from the large glass windows. The thought of finding David, somehow getting him to confess that he was behind the entire illegal activity, and showing David had somehow coerced Robert into laundering the money through Ramsley Insurance, would not leave Everett. He had no idea what would entice David to turn himself in to the FBI. Then again, maybe it was more about finding David and just getting him to record his confession. Surely that would be helpful in reducing any sentence the judge would determine for Robert. Everett wondered if David would have to be present in court or if he could just make a video statement. He would have to ask the lawyer. Alexa, remind me to call Kramarn at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Once he had more information, he could decide what course of action to take. Feeling better about the idea of taking some sort of activity that would help his father, Everett headed for bed. Get back here! Bree yelled at the top of her lungs, legs pumping as she gained ground on the unruly canine. The Labradoodle was filthy. She wasn't even sure it was the right dog. Pushing a man out of her way, she made the turn into the alley after the four-legged beast. Aha! she crowed with delight. It was a dead end. A loading dock was the only destination here. There was no way the animal was going to get away from her. 
Pulling a dog harness out of her bag, she unsnapped it, crouching and ready. Come on, Bingo. Be a good boy. Let me catch you. Your mommy and daddy miss you. They're paying me big bucks to get you home. Her assistant, Marty, had laughed uproariously when he took the call. However, things were slow right now, and Bree had jumped on the chance of what she thought would be easy money. She had gone to all the animal hospitals, vets, shelters, and wherever else she could think of, looking for the mutt. She went knocking door to door in the neighborhood where the family lived, asking for any clues. Reward posters had been put up. Ads in the local paper, radio, and online had drawn attention and generated a lot of false leads. Finally, Bree took to walking around the area looking for the dog. She nabbed five of the loose Labradoodle lookalikes, none of them matching the microchip that the owners had installed. The shelter was starting to charge her for dropping off dogs. They charged extra for the last one since it had fleas. None of this was enough to make her quit. After a strong shower and throwing away her flea-ridden clothes, Bree had gotten dressed and come out again to look for the dog. Now she had one cornered. Sit! I said sit! As the dog made to dodge past her, Bree quickly jumped in the way, snagging the harness around its head. Wrestling with the beast, she managed to get one leg into the harness and snap it shut. It wasn't perfect, but as she snapped on a leash, Bree reflected that it would do for the moment. She needed a breather. This dog smelled badly. It was like it had been through the sewers. Wrinkling her nose, Bree pulled the microchip reader out of her bag. She had sprung for one after bringing the fifth dog to the shelter. Paying for someone to chemical bomb her car to get rid of fleas, plus the mounting fees from the shelter was taking a wad out of the reward money she was going to get when she caught Bingo. Bree had debated the ethics of scanning and releasing stray dogs. Her wallet had told her it was necessary. Turning on the reader, she scanned it over the Labradoodle. Bingo. Bree sighed in relief. Finally, she had the right dog. Sensing a momentary lapse as Bree relaxed, Bingo backpedaled in a rush, pulling out of the improperly fastened harness. Free, he ran to the back of the alley along the loading dock. Bingo, Bree growled, shoving the microchip reader in her bag. Come, come here now. The dog just stared at her, tongue lolling as it appeared to laugh at Bree. Narrowing her eyes, Bree stalked towards the dog. If you are a good boy, I will get you a burger before you get a wash at the pet store. Then you can go home with your pet parents, who were crazy enough to get a beast like you in the first place. Bingo barked. Bree lunged. The door to the loading dock opened, and Bingo disappeared in a flash into the building. No! Bree scrambled after the dog, passing a surprised employee. Hey, you can't go in there, the employee yelled after her. Bree ignored him, intent on the Labradoodle. Stop that dog! Racing through the shipping area, Bree chased Bingo until a man blocked her path. Excuse me, you can't be here. The dog! Bree pointed where Bingo had gone. I need that dog! This is a work zone. You're not wearing the proper equipment. We have forklifts here, the man explained. You could have gotten seriously hurt running around like that. You don't understand. You don't understand. Bree tried to peer over his shoulder. Sometimes it really was frustrating to be only 5'1". She sidestepped, only to be blocked by the beefy guy again. I have been hired to get that dog back to its owners. Please let me do my job. And I've been hired to keep the floor safe and production going. The man glowered down at her. You need to leave. I am happy to leave. Bree smiled up at him. As soon as I have the dog. This dog? Another man had Bingo in a bear hug, bringing the Labradoodle forward. I found him in the lunchroom. Fella gobbled down my bologna sandwich. You ought to treat your pet better. I have a mind to report you. Bingo isn't mine. 
He's been missing for a few weeks now. Bree tried to wrestle the dog into his harness. I'm going to get him a meal, a bath, and take him home to his owners. They have a boy with autism who is missing his dog. Well, then I'm glad we could help, the man said, holding Bingo while Bree snapped the harness shut, winding the lead around her hand. This time, the dog wasn't going to get away. Thank you, Bree sighed in relief. I really appreciate it. She gave them a wave goodbye, leading Bingo out of the building. The dog happily panted before going stock still. What is it now? she lamented, looking at Bingo. What are you doing? Bree followed the gaze of the canine to see a cat arching its back and hissing. No, Bree moaned before her arm was nearly yanked out of its socket as Bingo darted after the now running cat, barking excitedly. It was all Bree could do to keep herself upright as the leash tightened painfully around her wrist. Stop, Bingo! The dog had a hearing problem. Or maybe just a problem with obeying orders, Bree thought as she tried to put on the brakes unsuccessfully. It was four feet of eighty pounds against her one hundred and thirty. She worked out. She was a runner. She was no match for that much dog. The cat ran up a drain pipe, heading for a ledge of the building. Bingo barked furiously at the bottom of the pipe. Bree leaned against the wall to catch her breath and carefully untangle herself from the leash. Okay, Bingo, the car is parked just down the street. Let's go to the car. We'll hit the pet store for a bath, then I can get cleaned up. Burgers before I bring you home. Bingo ignored her, barking at the cat who was now grooming itself on the ledge. Let's go, Bingo. Bree said tiredly, pulling on the leash. The dog didn't move. Summoning her strength, Bree put her weight into it, tugging and towing the resisting labradoodle down the sidewalk. Quad straining, she huffed, yanking on the leash. One thing was for certain. Bree would not need to hit the gym today. Struggling, she made it to the car and unlocked it. Get in. The dog had stopped barking, but was now laying on the sidewalk. Bree had been dragging it the last ten feet. She pointed to the open door. I said, get in, Bingo. Bingo gave her a baleful look. I have decided I'm a cat person, announced Bree. She tied the leash to the handle of the door. Grimacing, Bree pulled on the harness. Get up and get in the car. Bingo remained a dead weight. Bree wrapped her arms around the animal, pulling it up onto the back seat. She pushed him under his bum, sliding Bingo across the seat before shutting the door. Panting, Bree tossed her bag into the passenger seat before peeling a ticket out from under her windshield wiper. She was fifteen minutes over the meter. Lousy dog! Bree searched her phone. Nearby pet stores that bathe dogs. The phone chirped the results, and Bree selected the nearest. Once she pulled out into traffic, Bingo started to howl his displeasure. Maybe I'm a fish person, Bree muttered as she hunkered over the wheel. Three turns later and feeling a little deaf, she squeezed into a parking spot, just gently touching the bumper of the vehicle behind her. She fed the meter, checked the bumpers, which both looked unharmed, then prepared herself mentally for dragging the dog into the pet store. I will win. She repeated her mantra. I'm a big bad bounty hunter. I always get my man. Or in this case, dog. I always collect my reward. I will win. Taking a deep breath and immediately regretting it since Bingo's sewer smell had rubbed off on her, Bree opened the car door, untied the leash, and dragged a resisting Bingo into the pet store. The dog laid limp on the tile, allowing Bree to pull it along. Hey, anyone want to earn some cash to bathe the dog? An employee approached her. Can I help you? Absolutely. Bree put the leash in the woman's hand. Bingo here needs a bath. I need him to look presentable for his owners. The woman's nose wrinkled. 
She looked down at the filthy dog. He's disgusting. I expect you'll want to charge extra, Bree said gleefully. She didn't care. There was reward money coming her way. Whatever he needs, just get him all spiffy so I can return him home. It will be a couple of hours at least. She pursed her lips in silent disapproval. Perfect. Bree smiled. Then I can get the car and myself clean. Say four o'clock? Four it is. I have some paperwork you'll need to fill out. The employee snapped her fingers. Come, Bingo. Bingo lumbered to his feet, following the woman to the back of the store. Traitor? Bree hissed in astonishment. Picking her jaw back up off the floor, Bree followed to fill out the paperwork. Two hours later, Bree had cleaned the car, which now smelled like a pine forest sewer, but bore no muddy traces on the back seat. She had a shower with a change of clothes and was ready to tackle Bingo once more. This time she had come fully prepared. Smiling, she went straight to the grooming area. I'm here for Bingo? Sure, the employee nodded. They discussed the final bill, and Bree tried not to let sticker shock show. That is a little pricey, Bree commented with a tight smile. Bingo was filthy, the employee returned politely. He also needed grooming to get rid of burrs that were stuck in his fur. I see. Bree crossed her fingers and held her breath as she swiped her credit card. It blinked as it was approved. She let out a relieved breath and relaxed. As long as the smell's gone. It's gone, the woman assured her. She went to the back and returned a few moments later with a shaved bingo. It hardly looked like the same dog. Just to be sure, Bree scanned it with the microchip reader to confirm that it was indeed bingo. Excuse me, the employee was offended. I assure you, this is your dog. No, lady, this isn't my dog, Bree told her. However, I'm returning him home today and will happily never see him again. Yanking on Bingo's lead, Bree started to drag the reluctant dog along the tiled floor. Bingo dug in his heels. Bree decided to go to Plan B. Fishing a burger out of her purse, Bree held it up as high as she could. Come on, Bingo, I've got a nice juicy burger. It has all the trimmings. Bingo's nose twitched. He smacked his lips and lurched to his feet. Bree quickly picked up her pace as the dog chased her. This may have been a bad idea. Running through the pet store, Bree hit the fob of her keys to unlock the car. She broke the burger in half, wrapper and all, tossing one half to the ground for the dog to eat while she opened the door to the back seat. Bree watched in amazement as Bingo downed it in one gulp. She threw the other half of the burger into the back seat. Bingo jumped in, searching for the food. Bree slammed the door shut and did a happy dance. Yes! Rubbing her hands together in delight, she pulled another ticket off the windshield of the car before getting in. Tossing it into the glove compartment with the others, Bree punched the address of Bingo's owners into the GPS. Easy money, she reminded herself as Bingo started howling as she drove. Bree put in earplugs, trying to drown out the noise. She turned up the tunes, singing along as she traversed the city streets. Soon enough, she was pulling up in an affluent neighborhood of townhouses. Parking on the street, Bree shut off the vehicle and pulled out the earplugs. Guess what, Bingo? You're home! Bree grinned, turning to look at the dog, expecting it to be grateful for its imminent release from her care. Her smile slipped as she surveyed the total destruction of the back seat of her car. Foam and ripped pieces of upholstery were everywhere as Bingo lay panting on the springs of what remained. Swallowing hard, Bree got out of the car. I will win. I will collect my reward. I don't give up. I win. It looked even worse as she opened the back door to the car, grabbing Bingo's leash as he jumped out. The back of the passenger seat had been ripped to shreds as well. 
this was going to take a lot of money to fix. Yanking on the leash, Bree pulled Bingo to the front door and rang the doorbell. Bingo sat, panting. Bingo's pet mom opened the door. Bingo! Bree dredged up a smile as the woman fawned over the dog, hugging him. Returned safe and sound as promised. He has his hair cut, she gushed. I would never have thought to do that. How clever! The employee from the pet store had been right. The dog didn't smell like sewer anymore. Pine, air freshener, and a burger, but not sewer. He had a bath. Could we come in? Of course. Pet Mom pulled Bingo in, who gave Bree a pathetic look as he allowed himself to be dragged into the house. Charles, look who's home! Bree didn't feel any sympathy for Bingo. She came inside, shutting the door and any avenue of escape off. She was intent on getting her promised pay. Bree kept her tacked-on smile as Pet Dad approached. Bingo! How wonderful! Pet Dad grinned, ruffling up the Labradoodle, who bore it with silent recriminations to Bree. Yes, it's wonderful, agreed Bree. She looked at her watch. I hate to break up this reunion, but I have another case I need to tend to. Would you mind? Oh, yes, Pet Dad straightened up. I will write you a check. That would be good. Bree smiled for real now. Let her assistant Marty laugh now. Once she had the check in hand and could pay some bills, he would have to stop giving her nicknames like the dog catcher, canine caper solver, and her personal unfavorite, the dog lady. Moments later, she had the check in hand. Feeling generous, Bree grabbed Chinese food at the angry walk before heading back to her rented office. She admired the new sign a moment. Henson Investigations. It was beautiful, in her opinion. Just another firm step in the right direction. Aubrey had loved the moment when she decided to go into business for herself. Enough chasing low-life criminals for bond money and not getting paid nearly enough to risk life and limb. Now she was through working for the local bonds bailsman. She was branching out. Bree had passed her private investigator exams. She was a licensed bounty hunter. Having her own business was a dream come true. If only it were not so expensive. Bree opened the door, struggling up the stairs to the second floor office, letting herself in. Whoa, Chinese! Marty pulled off his headset. Did you catch the critter, or are you just commiserating because he's still missing? Is there ice cream? Bree tilted her head, raising an eyebrow. Marty looked over the bags. Nope. That means you caught him. Bingo is safely home with his family. Bree pulled out the check with a flourish, laying it on the desk. We can now pay the rent, utilities, damage to my car, parking tickets, and your salary for another month. Marty picked up the check. What a ridiculous amount to pay to return a dog. Hey, they love him. Bree pulled out the food from the bag. Any luck on finding another case to pay your exorbitant assistant fees? Nope. Marty grabbed a fortune cookie, snapping it open. Things are way too slow lately. It's like people are trying to be good or something. Here's a fun cookie. Your fortune will be reversed. Maybe we will get a big case. One can hope. Bree cracked open her own fortune, reading the slip of paper. A golden opportunity will come this month. Okay, sure thing. Hey, don't knock the fortune cookie, Marty told her. That's right, a deep voice said behind her. You never know if a fortune cookie might come true. Chapter 2 Bree whirled around. There was a darkly handsome man standing in the doorway. Everything about his appearance spoke rich, from his polished loafers, his press suit, to his perfect haircut. She pasted on a smile. Can we help you? I'm looking for Mr. Henson. He assessed the room with gray eyes. Is he here? I'm Henson. Bree wiped the crumbs from off her hand, stretching it out in greeting. She hated tall guys. 
they put a crick in her neck. Aubrey Henson, private investigator and bounty hunter. He looked down on her diminutive form and disbelief, even as he shook her hand. Everett Ramsley. Would you like to have a seat? Bree motioned to the expensive leather guest chair she shelled out good money for at an auction of another business that was bankrupted. She bought all the office furniture second hand. It was in great shape and made the fledgling business look solvent to potential clients. Marty whisked the food away, grabbing his rolling chair and laptop to take notes. He adjusted his glasses. Looking like it was against his better judgment, Everett sat. I was informed that you have a 92% capture rate. That is correct, Bree boasted happily. She kept track of all her captures and fails, coming up with a stunning average. Now, if she added bingo, it might be a little higher. I get my man. What experience do you have with international bounty hunting? asked Everett. Jean-Luc Renault, Bree informed him. He was a fugitive from Europe. We apprehended him in the city. What about you apprehending criminals outside of the United States? He questioned. There are special licenses and permits for that, regretfully said Bree. I don't have those. Therefore, I can't make a capture outside of this state, let alone this country. But I can do a hired investigation and allow local law enforcement to make an arrest should we find the person you're looking for. What if he is a criminal and I don't necessarily want him arrested? What if I just want to find him? Everett watched her carefully, trying to gauge her reaction. You're the one hiring me and providing the funds to do the search, shrugged Bree. If you don't want the person arrested, then I won't inform local law. If you decide to hire me, I work for you, Mr. Ramsley. I have contracted three other agencies. Everett apprised her as he stood. I'm giving each of you the same file and would like an update within 24 hours. The agency that comes back to me with the most pertinent information to this investigation will get my business. I expect exclusivity if I hire you. That means you can't have any other clients while you work for me. I only hire the best. Good luck, Miss Henson. He pulled a file from his briefcase, holding it out. You won't be disappointed. Bree took the file, her fingers itching to open it. She laid it calmly on the desk, ignoring it while she waited to see what he would say next. Everett gave her a nod before leaving. Bree snatched up the file. He didn't ask for a quote, Marty commented as he put the laptop to the side and returned the Chinese food to the desk. He popped a chicken ball into his mouth, appreciating the fried flavor. Men like him don't ask for quotes. They just send the bill to their accounts manager. Bree read through the information, shuffling through pictures, names, dates, and other relevant info in the file. He wants a further investigation into David Ramsley. Is that the guy who the FBI can't find? Marty asked with his mouth full. They think he skipped the country. He's charged with international drug smuggling, money laundering, evading capture, and who knows what else. Better pull up whatever information you can find on him and his family, Bree told him. She grabbed an egg roll, slowing down so that she could take in all the information in the file. I want to know the whole story so we can start putting together a chart on him. Do we even want the case? asked Marty. Easy money. Bree paused in her reading to raise an eyebrow at her assistant. That should be obvious. Marty gave her a disbelieving look. The last time you said easy money, it was three weeks ago over a dog. I had to listen to you complain every day about how not easy it was to catch Bingo. I got him in the end. Bree rolled her eyes. This guy is 87 years old. How fast can he run? Fast enough that Interpol and the FBI haven't caught up with him, dryly said Marty. Why are you taking this case? Besides the payout. We both know he isn't going to be easy money. The man has resources, and he's wily in his old age. They say he doesn't have a conscience either. I've gone after worse. Bree leaned back in her chair as she bit into her egg roll. Marty just shook his head. 
I have a bad feeling about this. What about our golden opportunity? Marie held up the tiny slip of fortune cookie paper. We have bills to pay. You're right about that. Marty typed in his laptop, pulling up information from news sites. They think someone gave him a tip-off about his imminent arrest. The only ones who might have known were FBI. I want a list of all his friends, relatives, known associates, business partners. Bree ticked them off her fingers. Places he has visited, properties he owns. I'll have to speak to the wife. That might not be so easy, advised Marty. When people have this kind of money, they tend to have security. How much money? Bree wondered. Everett Ramsley didn't look like he needed to worry about pinching any pennies. If he was really rich, she could afford to considerably increase her fees just for him. GQ named the family as part of the Billionaire Club, Marty said dryly. Excellent, grinned Bree. Maybe we can make enough off one case to keep us in cash for a year or two. This is over our heads, Bree, admonished Marty. We're staying in the city, small-time crook-catching kind of guys. Not international drug smuggler money launderer catching guys. Renal was a total accident. He adds cachet to my resume, Bree said defensively. She had hit him with her car while pursuing a known purse snatcher. While at the hospital, Renault's identity had been revealed, and Bree had gone from worried about being charged with accidentally hitting a jaywalker to triumphant capture of an international fugitive. She had gotten the bond-skipping purse snatcher two days later. These guys are super rich. If things don't go the way Everett Ramsley wants, he could sue us into the ground. Then you would be back to chasing crooks for the local bondsman, warned Marty. Or we could be confident in our skills and get the guy, Bree responded easily. We know how to do this. We talk to everyone involved. We establish patterns. We follow every lead until we find our criminal. It's simple groundwork. In this case, I might not even have to tackle the old guy. It sounds like Everett just wants to talk to him. It's his uncle? Maybe he wants to know where the dear Uncle David stashed all the cash he's been laundering. Marty kept typing away, saving bits of information to a file. Whatever his motive, I'm sure he'll let us know once he hires us. Bree grabbed a tray with chicken fried rice and a fork. Wait a minute. What? Marty looked over with interest. Bree frowned as she grabbed her phone, pulling up a news article. David got around. He has a couple of kids outside of marriage. How is that a big deal? Marty went back to his own work. They weren't publicly acknowledged until this year. Andrew and Molson Colburn both had a hand in getting Michael Ramsley out of prison in the same charge as David had. It looks like the old guy framed his son for his crime and almost got away with it. Bree pointed her fork at Marty. I want to know if David had any other affairs, where those women and children are. One of them could be hiding him. I'll put it on the list to research he typed furiously. In the meanwhile, I'm going to ask Kepler for any information he has on the case. Bree crunched in a number. Marty moaned. Not nah, Kepler again. The guy's a total jerk. Maybe, but if I flash a little leg, he'll tell me anything I want to know, smiled Bree. I can't believe you dated him. Marty shook his head. I was young, impressionable, and wanted to get into the FBI. Dating Kepler was a bad move and killed that career option. He owes me. Marie frowned as she got voicemail. Bill, it's Aubrey. I was wondering if you might like to have dinner tonight. Call me. That seems a little short notice, Riley stated Marty. I'm sure he won't know something is up. He is a smart jerk. He will know that I want something, Bree shrugged. That doesn't matter. He still likes to trot me out in front of the guys to prove that he's still got it. We will have dinner, meet up with his buddies, I'll ask Bill for information, and voila! Tomorrow we will have the edited FBI file in our hands. 
heavily edited, sighed Marty. It will still have useful information in it, Bree pointed out. She picked up her cell phone as it rang. Hi, Bill. I was just thinking about you. Everett wondered if giving Aubrey Henson a file was a wise decision. She didn't look strong enough to wrestle a dog, let alone take down bad guys. Her hired help looked like the nerdiest kid she could find. They were very misplaced in that office, which boasted a professional feel. Everett had liked the office, liked the furniture. It was a comfortable, familiar feel. If Aubrey Henson could afford furniture like that, then she must be having some success. The 92% capture rate, if it was accurate, was in her favor. Against his better judgment, Everett had given her the file. The simple folder contained information about his Uncle David and the charges against him. There was a list of potential people to interview, a list of properties, news clippings, whatever else Everett thought that might be handy for the beginnings of an investigation. Everett had called Kramarn this morning to ask for his advice. After discussing it for the better part of an hour, Kramarn concluded that if David did give a confession that he had indeed coerced Robert into laundering the money through the company, it might get Robert's sentence reduced or lessened if they got the right judge. Confused, Everett had asked the lawyer what he meant. Kramarn had gone on to hint broadly that the right judge might be bought for a price. Everett had been pretty shocked, then disgusted by that turn of events. He knew people were fallible. People in all sorts of positions made bad judgments every day. But a man sworn to uphold the law? Everett tersely told Kramarn that he would have to consult with his brothers. He had immediately conference called Dylan and Jake afterward. Dad's lawyer tells me that if we can get David to admit that he coerced Dad, then it could reduce his sentence. Again, how are we ever going to get David to do that? questioned Jake. First, no one can find him. Second, he won't do it out of love or loyalty to his brother. First, I will hire someone to find David, Everett told him. Second, that's what I need help from the two of you to figure out. With what money? asked Jake. The FBI swung by this morning to talk to with me. And Dylan was right. They're probably coming to talk to you next about your accounts and your data. You are under investigation, too, growled Everett. They have to know that neither of you had anything to do with this. Did you manage to move over those funds we talked about? asked Dylan. The ones to help fund the company in the interim? Yes, it buys us a little time, responded Jake. A month, maybe. Not much more. I'm officially tapped out since they've frozen my accounts. I will transfer over some money as well. Just send me the banking codes, promised Everett. You had better do it right away, advised Dylan. I will, replied Everett. He hesitated, but decided Jake and Dylan had better know the lawyer's opinion on judges. Kramarn made a suggestion, one that I don't like. What? questioned Jake. He hinted that we should bribe the system to get the right judge, one that would reduce Dad's sentence with the right incentive, Everett told them in disgust. Wow, Jake breathed in surprise. I didn't even think that was an option. That is beyond sad. I had not thought that Kramarn would be so crooked that he would be willing to try to pave Dad's way out with bribery. I know, complained Everett. I never thought he would do that. We have always been above board otherwise, in everything that we do. Did Dad say anything about this? No, responded Jake. He was adamant that he would plead guilty and face whatever punishment the judge deemed appropriate. His main concerns were for us and the company. Dylan, you've been quiet, remarked Everett. Dylan took a deep breath. That is why Kelly and I got married. A corrupt judge was about to hand over her son to her deceased husband's parents. I had promised her that Bentley would not be parted from her, so we got married to prevent that from happening. 
the Islingtons had bribed the judge to rule in their favor. It happens. Not often, but it happens. What else are you thinking? questioned Everett. He knew Dylan, and his younger brother wasn't done with whatever was weighing on his mind. I'm wondering if we should do it, carefully said Dylan, if we should bribe the system. I didn't just hear that, Jake bit off his words. I know it's a bad idea. With the press this case has garnered, it could backfire spectacularly if it became public knowledge. Plus, it's wrong, Dylan agreed miserably. I just keep thinking about Dad. Spending the rest of his life in custody? Mom, alone for the rest of her life? I hate the thought of bringing his grandkids to visit him in a facility. It's wrong, reiterated Everett. I agree with you, sighed Dylan. I'm just conflicted on it. He is our father. He did a crime. He's willing to pay for his actions, calmly stated Jake. We're not going to bribe the justice system to give our father preferential treatment. That isn't how he and Mom raised us. Which is why I think we should hunt down David, interrupted Everett. We can figure out a way to get him to help Dad's case. Or maybe it will be as simple as asking for a reduced sentence for giving the FBI David's whereabouts once we know where he is. Could it be that simple? asked Dylan. We help them, they help us, suggested Everett. The only thing we can do is ask. Then you'd better move some funds out to use for whoever you hire, Jake warned him, before the FBI comes knocking on your door to freeze your assets. I will get it done right away, Everett assured his brothers. Ending the call, he quickly called his banker to set up some contingency plans. He was glad he had made the calls when not fifteen minutes later after he got off the phone with the banker, there was a knock at the entryway. Everett opened the condo door to find FBI agent Kepler and a few men standing behind him. Agent Kepler, FBI. Kepler showed off his badge. We have a warrant to search the premises and seize any evidence pertaining to the case of money laundering and Ramsley insurance. Everett took the paperwork, not even bothering to skim it. He would give it to his lawyers later. Come on in. Where's Agent Law? He remembered that Agent Law had been the primary lead agent on the case when his cousin Michael was arrested. Everett was glad that Michael had been proved innocent of the charges against him and was now free to be with his family. Agent Law is busy. Kepler had a tight smile as he watched his men search the condo. Everett frowned as his laptop was seized. A clerk was writing down the items the FBI were taking. The good news, there really wasn't much for them to take. Most of Everett's files were back in Europe at the tiny office there. One laptop, one external drive system, three USB sticks. The clerk read his list, handing Everett a copy for his files. Is there anything else I should be aware of? Everett asked Kepler. Is there anything I should be aware of, Mr. Ramsley? Kepler returned the question as he turned his icy blue stare on Everett. Everett chose to ignore Kepler's question. He wasn't intimidated by this man. I heard that both my brother's assets were frozen by the FBI recently. I was wondering if I was about to face the same issue. No, Kepler was annoyed. We couldn't find any evidence of your involvement in the money laundering at this point. With your business activities in Europe, we feel certain that you were removed from the initial crime. Right now, your assets will remain unfrozen unless we find otherwise. Why? Are you worried, Mr. Ramsley? Not particularly. Everett watched as the men left the condo, leaving Kepler and him alone. Tell me, are you any further in finding Uncle David yet? He is pretty old and frail. You would think the FBI could manage to find him. A muscle twitched in Kepler's jaw, and his icy eyes sparked a little. We will get him. If I were to find out information on David's whereabouts, Everett proceeded carefully, I would love to be able to help you out by giving you that information. Were I to have any. 
It would be your obligation as a law-abiding citizen of this country to give me that information. Kepler narrowed his eyes. If you didn't, you would be aiding and abetting a known felon. That is a crime. If I were to find out his location, repeated Everett, would that be considered as part of the sentencing in my father's case? Are you trying to bribe me, Mr. Ramsley? Kepler's voice went venomous. No, I'm asking a simple question, clarified Everett. I currently have no idea where my uncle is. I was wondering if it was worth the effort to try to find him. Don't worry. The FBI will find him, vowed Kepler. Nor am I about to make any deals. While well, Everett was disappointed, he made certain not to show any emotion. Have a good day, Agent Kepler. Kepler took his cue to leave, giving the apartment one last glance, like it might suddenly produce a hiding David Ramsley. Everett was glad to close the door on him. His cell phone was buzzing in his pocket. The call display confirmed it was Cramarn. Everett Ramsley here, Everett said tersely into the phone. I had an idea, excitedly said Cramarn. If you were able to get David's location, give it to Robert and myself. We might be able to bargain with the prosecution for the information. Might be able to, curtly asked Everett. I want assurances, not maybes. The FBI was here, and Agent Kepler isn't exactly fond of me. He reminded me that if I know David's location, it would be a crime to keep a secret from authorities. There's no reason we cannot bargain the location in return for reduced sentence with the prosecution. Bypassing the judge and the FBI, responded Cramarn. It can be done. Then I will find David, Everett assured the man before hanging up. Now he was waiting less than twenty-four hours for five different investigative agencies to get back to him to decide who he was going to hire to find his Uncle David. Bree waited at the bar. She was impatiently swinging a leg as she sipped an ice water. She didn't really enjoy bars, yet this was where Kepler had asked to meet. They would go to the dining area of the restaurant after. He asked for this specific hotel at a specific time. Bree thought he probably had someone he was wanting to impress, an ex-girlfriend or, more likely, one of his colleagues. He was staging the area for his audience. Kepler had even asked her to wear the red dress. She wore the red dress. Bree had paired it with a shimmering white shawl, high heels, and a gold clutch. Her hair and makeup were perfection. She would play the part of expensive-looking date for the evening. Once they got up to the hotel room, it would be all business and talking about the case. Afterward, she would turn down the nightcap and leave. Kepler wouldn't mind. When they had dated years ago, their relationship had never gotten physical. Bree wasn't sure Kepler was wired that way. However, he liked to have his peers think he was. It didn't hurt Bree's feelings to have others think that they were having an occasional affair. She and Kepler knew the truth. That was the reason she never applied to the Bureau. Kepler had intimated that if she did, he would put a stop to her career. He didn't want anyone inside knowing about his personal issues with the ladies. Now they had an interesting sort of trade-off relationship. She occasionally looked good on his arm while expecting information. Adjusting the strap of the dress, Bree looked around. It was a pretty posh place. Kepler had to have spent a lot of money on tonight. Whoever he was trying to impress, they would be important in his career. She was glad she had made the extra effort with her hair. Hey, babe, can I buy you a drink? A man came forward. He was good-looking in a beefy young way. Bree spared him a smile. I don't think my boyfriend would like that. Come on, he wouldn't know. The guy grinned, putting a hand along her back. He isn't here. He's an FBI agent and owns a gun. Bree turned a little, putting her hand in the clutch, pressing it into the man's abdomen as she blinked up at him guilelessly. I have one, too, in my itty-bitty purse. You should go. Whoa, it was just an offer to buy a drink. 
He had a sheepish and slightly panicked smile as his arms rose in the air to ward off her poking with the clutch. You got issues, lady. Again, another reason not to buy strange women drinks, Bree sweetly told him. Is this guy bothering you? Kepler scowled at the guy, his icy blue eyes boring into him as he approached. No, beefy guy shook his head. I'm not bothering anyone. I was just leaving. Bree frowned. It was really annoying how Kepler could instill fear at a single look. Bree didn't have that talent. No one looked at her petite form with any amount of fear. In her line of business, it was irritating. Then again, being tiny meant she was often underestimated. That had worked in her favor multiple times. Kepler would never be underestimated. Aubrey? Kepler offered his arm. I overheard I've been upgraded to boyfriend. You were that once upon a time. Bree hopped off the stool and took his arm, offering her cheek for him to kiss, which he did willingly. I just forgot to insert the X in front of the word. My apologies. I did date you the longest, Kepler remarked as he led her to their table. There was always something about you that made you difficult to let go. Don't remind me, Bree smiled up at him. It was probably my unbridled enthusiasm for your career which you killed when you didn't want me to follow you. You and the FBI would never have worked. You don't like structure. Kepler pulled out her chair for her. It would have been disastrous. I put up with you and your structure. Bree got settled at the table. That was our first major argument. It had also been their last. Bree wasn't about to let him think that he could determine her life. Did it work out better for you? Kepler raised an eyebrow. I hear you've opened your own business. I have. Bree was genuine in her smile. She was proud of her new business adventure. It's going well. I'm pleased for you. He set the menu to the side. Kepler already knew what he wanted, what she would want. He always ordered the same thing, no matter where they were. Now... Let's stop discussing business and chat about other things. Three hours later, Bree had consumed a lovely salmon while Kepler had steak. They shared a piece of chocolate cake. They chatted amicably over nothing much. Bree smiled, held his hand, and pretended he was just the best thing in the entire world. She allowed him to put his hand on her hip as he escorted her to the lobby before they waited at the elevators. You know, that dress is getting a little tight. You might want to lay off the junk food a little, remarked Kepler. Bree rolled her eyes. She would get the dress a size up before she gave up takeout and chocolate. Who was it this time? Kepler knew she was asking who it's trying to impress. My boss. He's a stickler and a ladies' man. He's coming this way. They entered the elevator. Before the doors could shut, Kepler pulled Bree into his arms, laying a kiss on her. Bree ground her heel into the top of his shoe. The door shut, and he let her go, grimacing. That hurt. Good. Bree wiped her mouth. What was that about? There have been a few rumors lately. Kepler sighed, taking out a handkerchief so he could wipe off her lipstick. I just needed them to go away so I can concentrate on my job. Bree frowned. She wasn't going to be drawn into this. She had an agenda for tonight. Yet the words popped out of her mouth before she could stop them. What sort of rumors? That I'm gay? Kepler leaned against the elevator wall. I'm not. It's just that it's still a little frowned upon by some of the guys, and I don't want them giving me grief. There's a chance for a promotion in the works, and I can't have anything bungle it. Are you gay or not? Bree wasn't sure she should be insulted or not. Kepler had shown more physical passion in the last minute than in their entire relationship. Was it her, or was it him? Some guys actually don't prefer to be physical, Kepler told her quietly. He cleared his throat. Look, Bree. I would really appreciate it if we never talked about this again. 
if that's what you want. Frey was surprised he had even confided that much. Kepler liked to be in control of everything and admit to no weakness. It said how much he was worried. She wondered if it would affect the advancement of his career. He was a good agent. His personal life should not be a consideration in how he progressed at work. Thank you. Kepler automatically put his hand on her back, escorting her to the room that he had procured. Once inside, Bree shucked off her offending shoes, setting down her clutch and shawl. Kepler lost his shoes and jacket. He sat down on the bed to massage his foot. Next time I'll give you some warning. That would be appreciated. Bree took the chair from the desk, swinging it around to face him. Can we get down to business? Please, sighed Kepler. What are you looking into now? The Ramsley case, announced Bree as she sat down. He looked up at her sharply. You're kidding. Nope. Bree leaned back, enjoying the comfortable chair. I've been hired to find David Ramsley. I want everything you've got on him. Kepler raised an eyebrow. That isn't going to happen. Why not? Bree cocked her head to the side. I'm the lead in the case, Kepler told her. I know everything. Then I have hit the jackpot. Bree smiled happily. Spill it all. Tell me every gruesome detail. Who hired you? questioned Kepler. Everett Ramsley. He wants to know where his uncle has gotten to. Bree shrugged. I don't have his motive yet. Then he was telling the truth when he said he didn't know where David was, mused Kepler. You talked to him? Bree was curious. Today. I had a warrant for his computer and files, Kepler informed Bree. We are going through the data to see if he had anything that might incriminate either of his brothers in the Ramsley Insurance money laundering scandal. Everett have anything to do with that? asked Bree. Not that we're aware of. We'll see what his files say. Kepler wasn't going to commit to a firm answer. Let the data tell the truth. He asked if he found David, if that would affect the outcome of his father Robert's judgment. Would it? wondered Bree. No, not with me, Kepler stated firmly. Would it be a coup for you if you did bring in David? Bree considered his worry over his career. If we all work together, then you could be the one who ultimately has the information that leads to his arrest. I bet your boss would like that. He would, allowed Kepler. However, I've already made one deal regarding the case. I don't want to make more and be seen as a deal maker. What deal? frowned Bree. Originally, Agent Law was lead. I found out that he was planting evidence and taking bribes. I made a deal with a police officer to recheck evidence if he could get me absolute proof of Michael Ramsley's innocence and Law's corruption. He confessed as he pulled off a sock. You broke the skin. Quit whining. Bree ignored his complaint. She knew he had not liked Law. It had probably been a good day for Kepler when he had been able to open an investigative file on the man. You could bend the rules a little bit again, right? With law being put under review, everyone is now on a tight rope. Kepler frowned as he inspected his foot. Any false move could be misinterpreted. I have no desire to be investigated. There isn't anything particular that I'm worried about as I have led an exemplary career. However... Just the threat of investigation can lead to stigma. Would bringing in David be worth it? inquired Bree. Bill, I'm sure your boss would love the opportunity to brag that his people were smart enough to make a small deal to bring in the fleeing criminal. Or maybe he doesn't even need to know about the deal. He would know about the deal. It would have to go through him if I wanted to lessen the charges against Robert Ramsley, Kepler told her. Then ask him. Give him the opportunity to decide. She crossed her legs, leaning in the chair. That won't work with me, Kepler reminded her. What? Bree asked guilelessly. I was just getting comfortable. I will ask. Kepler rolled his eyes. I suppose you want the entire case file. It wasn't a question. Bree smiled. 
Having the full case file would be extremely helpful in our search to find David. What makes you think you can find him before we do? he asked. What makes you think I can't? Bree challenged him. We are the FBI. We have an entire team of experts at our fingertips, Kepler said dampeningly. Maybe that is the problem, shrugged Bree. Your experts have a hard time thinking outside the box that they've been taught. I, however, have no such restrictions. Then why not tell me what you think? Kepler began outlining the case, and Bree leaned forward with interest. Chapter 3 Everett rubbed his face as he leaned against the door. The third contender for hire to track down David had just left. He had basically regurgitated everything that Everett had handed him in the file. It was like the guy had barely read the material and followed up on none of it. Contenders 1 and 2 had not come up with much new, which Everett found disappointing. Contender 5 had already called in, saying they could not do the work. He knew that he had not given them much time, but this was their job to find people that generally didn't want to be found. Surely they were better at it than this. Looking at his watch, Everett found Contender 4 was running late. Grimacing, he decided he could not wait much longer. Everett got changed, grabbed his keys, and headed to the elevator. Pressing the button, he was pleased to see the elevator headed to his floor. The doors opened, and Bree Henson was there. Oh, hi! I know I'm late, but I think you will think it was worth it. I don't like it when people I hire are late, Everett said tersely as he entered the elevator, hitting the button for the garage. I can understand that. Technically, you haven't hired me yet. Bree responded as she juggled a coffee in a thick folder. However, again, I think you'll believe it was worth it. Not likely. Everett didn't have much confidence after the other three men who actually looked capable of doing the job had not found enough new information to make him believe they could track down David. Maybe he had been asking too much of them. Perhaps he needed to broaden his search for a reputable company outside of the city. Would you just listen a moment? Bree followed him out of the elevator. I'm telling you I have a lead, a solid lead. You do? Everett frowned as he unlocked his rental car. Really? Is there a reason you would think that I wouldn't have a lead? Bree frowned right back at him, annoyed that he had discounted her. Get in the car. Everett opened his door, getting in. Quickly, Bree got into the car, doing up her seatbelt. I have a list of possible people who might harbor your uncle. I also have an analysis of David's tendencies so that we will be more likely to predict his moves. You said you had a solid lead. Everett wasn't impressed by what she had told him so far. He pulled out of the parking garage. I'm getting to that? Bree sipped her coffee. She needed the caffeine. She had been up the entire night. Where are we going? Out of the city, Everett said shortly. He would send her back with the car or get her a cab. I'm late for an important event. You should slow down before you get a ticket advised Bree. She shuffled through her paperwork. I believe that this man, a lawyer named Dan Cramarn, is most likely to have an idea where David is. He worked for David and Robert for years. If I'm correct, he's known about the money laundering the whole time and advised them on how best to hide it. Those are pretty heavy charges. Everett wasn't amused. Cramarn is Dad's lawyer. Why? He's a finance lawyer, not a trial lawyer. Bree informed him. What is he doing being your dad's attorney? The only thing I can think of is that David is influencing your father through Cramarn. Everett turned this new information over in his head. He had not thought to question what sort of lawyer Cramarn was. The idea that Cramarn might be influencing his father, his father's choice of plea, or information that he chose to bargain with, just didn't sit well with him. It's just a theory. Bree inserted into the silence. It's a good theory. Everett hated to admit it. They had blindly trusted Cramarn. The fact didn't sit well with him. He would talk to Jake and Dylan about Cramarn, see if they had any further insight into the matter. He had to admit, just by that bit of information, 
Bree had outdone the other bounty hunters he considered hiring. That didn't mean he was going to hire her, no matter how impressive her record was. I think we should start with Kramarn, Bree told him. He's the most prominent on the list of people who have potential to harbor David. If he doesn't know David's exact location, he might still be in contact with him. And if Kramarn doesn't work out? Everett wanted to know what other thoughts she had for trying to find David. David had numerous affairs. Bree grabbed an envelope out of her file. He could have hunkered down with any of the women he'd been with over the years. My hunch would be one of the ones he married or his last mistress, whom he's been with the longest. Excuse me? Everett was certain he had not heard Bree correctly. He had been surprised as anyone when they had found out that they had new cousins in Andrew and Molson Colburn, two sons that had been born to David out of wedlock. Did you say married? Multiple times? He is a polygamist, confirmed Bree. We found at least four marriage certificates. He had multiple girlfriends that we can tell. One longtime mistress, plus numerous children. David got around. How many kids? Everett wanted to know. Um, let me count. Bree started on the birth certificates. Eight. Eight kids. Everett wondered if any of his cousins knew. The youngest is now fourteen, Bree commented. Fourteen. That would mean David was... Everett trailed off as he did the math. Seventy-three! The wonders of Viagra, Bree remarked dryly. That is just gross. He was slightly disgusted. Eight kids? Eight kids, plus the three that he says are legitimate. Bree made a face. That's eleven. What do you mean that he says are legitimate? Everett made the turn down a long, winding stretch of road with large houses. It's doubtful that they are. Bree looked through the marriage certificates. Since he married a minimum of four women, only the first marriage is considered legitimate. There could be more women that we don't know about. Not only that, but at least one marriage certificate was dated before his marriage to his acknowledged wife, Rachel. If we can verify its authenticity, then his marriage to Rachel is void. This is a mess. Everett understated it. It was a complete disaster, in his opinion. How could his uncle do this? To his family, his wife? Robert had always impressed upon him to be faithful. Had his father known about David's affairs? had he covered for him this whole time. His dad had a lot to answer for. Everett pulled up on the side of the road as the driveway was crowded with vehicles. Turning off the engine, he faced Bree. How did you find all this stuff out? Simple digging, frowned Bree, shutting the folder. My assistant Marty is a whiz on the computer. Plus, I have some connections. After that, it was chasing down the information further. Persistence and a knack for knowing what is important is key. Are you going to let us take the case? Everett hesitated. Look, I have no doubt you're good at digging up information. You've proven that. However, what happens when we get close? Can you take anyone down? David's bound to have security, and they won't have any scruples about hurting you. You mean because I'm small and I'm a woman, Bree said dryly. Yes. Everett decided to be blunt about it. Exactly that. I run the Boston Marathon each year, Bree enlightened him. I go to the gym, not just for cardio, for strength training. I train with other people who do apprehension so that I know the latest techniques and equipment for taking down criminals with the least chance of getting hurt. I know what I'm doing. Everett still didn't like it. She seemed far too small to be going up against bad guys. She was the type of woman who invoked feelings of protectiveness, not of a physical respect or fear. I don't think so. This is a rental car. You can take it back to my condo. I'll catch a ride with one of my brothers. He got out of the car, leaving the keys in the ignition. Bree quickly pulled the keys and followed him. I talked to Kepler. That stopped Everett in his tracks. He turned to look at her in surprise. About what? Hire me, and I will tell you. Bree waited, holding her breath. I don't like ultimatums, Everett informed her. 
Hire me and give me one week to prove that I can do the job, bargained Bree. If you don't believe I can manage after the week is up, then fire me. What did Kepler say? asked Everett. Bree shook her head. Not until after you hire me. Everett dragged his gaze away from her, contemplating the house as he made up his mind. This wasn't how he liked to do business, but he could admire her tenacity. One week. I'm coming in with you every step of the way. I want to know every detail of information. I want to go where you go. I want to know exactly what is happening at all times. Excuse me? I work alone, protested Bree before she added an amendment. Except for Marty. Now you work with me or no deal, decided Everett. It was unconventional. She didn't like it. I don't like ultimatums. That makes two of us. Everett liked that she tossed the words back at him. She had spunk. Fine, Bree snapped out. She needed the money, she reminded herself. That office furniture wasn't going to pay for itself. What did Kepler say? questioned Everett. He confided that he talked to you earlier yesterday, Bree apprised him, that you wanted to try to trade David for a reduced sentence for your dad. Everett grimaced. She really had talked to Kepler. Are you two friends? Something like that. Bree had the suspicion that she was probably as close to a friend as Kepler got. I convinced him that it might be in his best interest to repeat your offer to his boss. You what? Everett stalked back to Bree, intent on her answer. You got him to see if it's possible? He is giving his superior the choice. If Kepler gets the go-ahead, we need to find David and turn him over to the FBI, stated Bree. She stood her ground, not intimidated by Everett in the least. Everett was amazed. Kepler had not wanted to listen to him for even a moment. Yet Bree had somehow managed to get the man to consider doing exactly what Everett was hoping for. Leave the file in the car. Pardon? frowned Bree, wondering at the sudden turn in conversation. I'm going to introduce you to my brothers and some cousins. You can gather first impressions from them, Everett told her. However, no talking about the case today. This is a celebration of Michael's return from prison. I don't want any talk about David to mar the day. Bree put the file in the car, stuffing the keys into her pocket after locking it. Are you sure about this? If you introduce me as a bounty hunter, they're bound to be suspicious. Then I won't say what you do for a living responded Everett. What if they ask? Free hurried up to keep up to his stride as he opened the front door. She was glad she had decided on a comfortable pair of jeans, sandals, and blouse. At least she looked presentable for an occasion like meeting family. Or if they ask how we met? Make something up. Everett pulled the door closed behind them. It must be outside already. I work in data analysis. That's true and believable. Bree looked around the house. It was beautiful. She thought about her own small apartment. The two did not compare. I've run the Boston Marathon, Everett said suddenly. You've run the marathon? I've never seen you there, frowned Bree. Not that she would have seen him, considering the number of entries each year. It was years ago, replied Everett. I have been in Europe working for the family business since then. Well, I suppose we could have met at the marathon originally, concluded Bree. Maybe they had and didn't even remember the incident. It could be the truth. I guess you ran into me a couple of days ago. That is sort of true. Everett moved forward to the open patio doors. There was numerous people chatting in groups on the sandy beach. Everett pointed them out to Bree. That is Anne and Michael. He's the one just out of prison after being falsely accused of David's crimes. Noah and El are right there, Max and Paget. Those three are brothers. Detective Andrew Colburn and Bethany Searson. Andrew and his brother Molson helped with proving Michael's innocence. They're also David's sons, but you already knew that. My brother Jake is right there with Sterling. They're dating. That is Dylan and his wife Kelly. He's my younger brother. Rachel Ramsley, David's wife, is over there talking to that woman. I don't know her name. We've not been introduced. I would assume she came with Molson. That other lady is Fenley, the housekeeper, and her nephew. 
there are a lot of children. Bree tried to count them and gave up as they ran across the sand. Fourteen, Everett told her. He stopped talking as Anne's voice drifted up to them. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Anne smiled tremulously. We have been very grateful to everyone in this room for supporting us, for being determined to find the proof of the truth, for giving us some time of privacy after Michael's release. You're all very dear to our hearts, and that's why we've asked you to come to celebrate today with us. There was some applause before she continued. We especially want to thank people that we had not truly considered family until this hardship. That was wrong of us, and we fully wish to call you a part of our family. Drew Colburn, for his help with convincing the FBI to investigate Agent Law's activities, and Molson Colburn for finding proof of Michael's innocence and bringing it forward so that justice could be served. We have a plaque on our wall where part of the quote says, A brother is born for adversity. Michael and I went through a very difficult, adverse time. Drew and Molson, you are brothers to us. Anne tucked herself against Michael's side. Amy has been helping Michael to practice all week, so please be patient. Michael cleared his throat. He opened his mouth to speak, then shook his head ruefully. Anne whispered something to him, and he tried again. Thank you. Everyone clapped, and Fen Lee declared dinner ready as she wiped her eyes. People took their places at the long table that had been set out on the sand of the beach for the outdoor gathering. Michael had an operation. He isn't usually able to speak very much nor say what he wants to say. Words get substituted or mixed up. Everett explained to Bree. They watched as the family sat down together, talking while getting ready to share a meal. Michael is out of prison. No, grimaced Everett. It is not ended. It won't be over until David Ramsley's found and admits that he coerced my father into this mess. He isn't going to be very easy to find, she told him. He's hidden accounts with lots of money in them. He has criminal connections, as well as a lot of powerful friends who might be willing to help or hide him. That doesn't matter, Everett looked at her. I'll pay whatever is necessary. Good, she gave him a mercenary smile. Because my services don't come cheap. Shall we? Everett pointed toward the group. They haven't seen us, Bree made a suggestion. We could search through Michael's study and see if there's any information that we need to track down David. David framed Michael, scowled Everett. If Michael knew where his father was, he would have given him up. Anne most certainly would have. She has zero love for her father-in-law. I'm not saying they wouldn't have said something, Bree explained patiently. Sometimes people don't think they know where someone is, but they have a crucial piece of information that will lead to the person. I just want to double-check. No, I'm not going to get caught snooping through Michael's study, decided Everett. Who said anything about getting caught? Bree raised an eyebrow. Everyone is busy out there on the sand. It won't take twenty minutes. We can talk to Anne on another day. I'm sure she'll be more than cooperative, he said, raising a hand to wave as someone below spotted them. Bree gave him a sideways glance but dutifully followed him down the steps to the sand. It really was a lovely spot, a beautiful house on a nice stretch of private beach on the ocean. There was even a marina a little ways away. Not someplace Bree would want to live. She would miss the hustle and bustle of city life, but someplace nice to visit or vacation. Bree endured introductions. She didn't like that these people whom she would probably have to interview later, were thinking that she was dating Everett. Their story about meeting up at the marathon was flimsy at best, yet everyone seemed happy to believe it. Perhaps it was the mood of the day. It seemed a happy, carefree group. An extra chair was brought out, and everyone made room. Bree was looking forward to the food. She had skipped breakfast this morning, and the three-in-the-morning Chinese leftovers she had scarfed down were not cutting it any more. This lunch was more than welcome to her hungry stomach. "'Have you and Everett known each other long?' the woman beside Bree probed. "'Not very long,' smiled Bree. She remembered this was Dylan's wife. Thinking a moment, the name came to her, Kelly. He invited me out for the day, and when he remembered he had plans, he was kind enough to let me tag along. "'That's nice,' responded Kelly. "'I thought someone said you were a data analyst.' 
What is that like? It's more exciting than it sounds. Bree thought that Kelly might actually be shorter than her. It was a refreshing change. She immediately warmed to the petite woman. I look through data for patterns and important information that will be relevant to a case. Like a law case? asked Kelly. Bree noticed Kelly and her husband were holding hands under the table, using their other hands to eat. It was a sweet gesture. More like criminal investigations. That's interesting. I'm a nurse, commented Kelly. My mom is a nurse, noted Bree. It's a hard but rewarding career. I think she would have preferred I followed in her footsteps, but it wasn't for me. They chatted for a while longer, until Bree noticed Sterling looking at her oddly. Bree had to admit that the other woman looked familiar. Then it dawned on her. Sterling Denver, the tabloid reporter who had done a piece on an itty-bitty bounty hunter who caught Renault, the international fugitive. The article had been condescending and depicted her as some sort of joke, commenting on her size, sex, and stature. It had enraged Brie for days. Yes, capturing Renault had been a total fluke. Not that the papers had needed to portray her that way. Bree watched as recognition flickered over Sterling's face. She put a hand on Jake's arm, whispering in his ear. Great. So much for Everett's brilliant plan not to tell anyone today. Bree put a hand on Everett's arm, gaining his attention. Sterling knows. She's telling your brother right now who I am. How? Everett whispered back, frowning. She did an article on my capture of Renault, Bree said dryly. She just recognized me. The brother's eyes met, and Everett set down his fork. I had better go talk to Jake. Want me to come with? offered Bree. No, I've got this. He stood up. Jake followed suit, and the two men went for a stroll down the beach, talking. Bree, Sterling said from across the table, a false smile on her face. Why don't you join me in the little girl's room? Why not? Bree smiled in return as she got to her feet. She ignored curious looks as she followed Sterling up the stairs and into the house. Bree waited for Sterling to speak first as they entered the luxurious spa washroom. Aubrey Henson, bounty hunter. Sterling identified her. Does Everett know who you are? I'm just giving you a heads up because Jake is talking to him about you right now. Bree leaned confidently against the counter, folding her arms. That's great. I imagine Everett is telling Jake that he hired me to find their Uncle David. Sterling eyed her, debating if she was bluffing. I'm just wondering why you're introduced as a data analyst rather than your real occupation. Do you think that would be appropriate? Bree raised an eyebrow. Hey, everyone, I brought the bounty hunter to lunch, the one who's going to hunt down your dad. I don't think Everett would be well thought of for announcing that. Why are you here? asked Sterling. To get the lay of the land, Bree told her. She decided to go on the offensive. Why is New York's most notorious tabloid reporter here? It's no secret the Ramsleys have been your main focus. I'm Jake's girlfriend. I've also retired from writing for tabloids, Sterling informed her. I've decided on a new career path. Bree thought that was pretty convenient. She chose to keep the observation to herself. Checking her hair in the mirror, she rued the fact that she had not put on makeup this morning. What are the Ramseys like? Sterling joined her in the mirror. Stubborn, annoying, aggravating, and worth every moment. They have a bad habit of expecting things to work out exactly as they want, since they have the money to throw at every problem to make it disappear. Not this problem, noted Bree. Robert is still going to go to prison. It's just a matter of determining how extensive his sentence is going to be. There will always be a black mark on the family name now. I suppose you are right. Sterling gave her an assessing look. You really think that you can find David? Bree had a predatory smile. It's just a matter of time. I hired her. Everett told Jake out on the beach as they stopped far enough away from the table that no one would be able to overhear them. I know exactly who she is. She has a 92% capture rate. 
That tiny woman is a bounty hunter? Jake shook his head, non-pulsed by the idea. When Sterling told me, I couldn't believe it. I wasn't all that convinced either, admitted Everett. However, in 24 hours, she's come up with information I had no idea about. We'll see if she's practical in the field. I have given her a week to prove herself. A week to catch David? Jake raised an eyebrow. That is a tall order. A week to make significant progress, clarified Everett. Did you know Uncle David was having affairs? Jake motioned back to the luncheon. We knew that. Molson and Drew are right over there. They didn't appear out of nowhere. No, I meant he has more than just them, explained Everett. David has more kids. He's also married to three women besides Aunt Rachel. He's a bigamist? Jake was shocked. I think the term might be polygamist, ventured Everett. I'm not really sure. Is there proof? Jake lowered his voice. Brief found marriage certificates. She has a file an inch thick on David already. Everett ran a hand through his hair in frustration. The man has been leading secret lives. That's crazy, stated Jake. I have enough trouble keeping up with Sterling. I couldn't imagine trying to keep multiple relationships straight. Think of the birthdays, anniversaries, special events. Who to spend the holidays with? That's a nightmare. Everett decided to redirect the conversation. How well do we know Dan Cramarn? He's been Dad's lawyer for years, frowned Jake at the turn in conversation. What about him? He's David's lawyer as well, a grim Everett apprised Jake. That is a big conflict of interest in my opinion, especially since he's telling me to let him know where David is so that we can use that as leverage against the prosecution in Dad's defense. Is he even allowed to do that if he's David's lawyer? wondered Jake. I don't think so. It would be against his interests as David's lawyer. He's also our primary target for finding out where David is, noted Everett. I also want to know why Dad only has Craymarn representing him. Why wouldn't he have a team of lawyers? Craymarn is a financial lawyer, not a trial lawyer. I thought it was because Dad trusted him. Jake acknowledged the oddity. I never questioned it. You're right. He should have a legal team. Bree thinks that David is trying to influence Dad through Craymarn. Everett looked out over the waves. It was such a beautiful day, marred by the cloud of Robert's imprisonment. Jake digested his brother's words. Do you think that this is true? I don't know, but it bears further investigation. Everett was serious. If you could talk to Dad without Cramarn present, you might be able to find out what's really going on. I will do that. Jake didn't like the thought of anyone manipulating their father. He would get to the bottom of things. Should we tell Dylan? No, decided Everett. I think it's best if we temper what information we give to Dill. He's been through a lot, and being investigated right now by the FBI is stressful enough for him. Agreed, nodded Jake. Dylan had had a disastrous first marriage. The brothers knew that while Dylan was fully capable in his role at Ramsley Insurance, he was going through therapy with Kelly to face his past. He seemed happier than he had been in years, and neither Jake nor Everett wanted to disturb him. Everett didn't like to use the word fragile when it came to his younger brother, but Dylan seemed to feel things internally more than his brothers. They had been protecting him for years. "'You take care of Dad's lawyer representation,' said Everett. "'I will take care of hunting down our uncle. The FBI may be willing to work with us if we can find David first. "'How are you going to pay for all this?' asked Jake. "'My accounts aren't frozen,' Everett enlightened him. The FBI took my computer and drives, but my money is untouched until further notice. I guess they think because I was in Europe, I wasn't involved. Lucky you, Jake had a wry smile. I'm not used to living on a budget. I suspect it's going to be a bit of a shock. If you or Dylan need anything, let me know, offered Everett. We will. I guess we should go back. Jake looked back at the group and frowned. I wonder what Sterling got up to. Probably grilling Bree. Everett noticed the two women coming back from the house. Your girlfriend isn't always subtle. True, smiled Jake. I like her anyways. We suit each other. Everett suppressed an annoyed sigh. Ever since Jake had fallen under Sterling's spell, he was a little different. Less driven and happier. 
The happier part wasn't a bad thing. The less driven might be. Looking at the group as a whole, the men seemed settled. They were settled into happy domesticity with their wives and girlfriends. Everett wasn't sure he would ever be ready to settle down. He enjoyed leading an exciting life. There was an energy about him that Everett didn't think would translate well into family life. He enjoyed excitement and doing things. Another reason he really didn't want to take over the western half of Ramsley Insurance. Europe had seemed an impossible challenge that he worked hard to get a toehold into. The truth was, it had been impossible. There was no chance for Ramsley Insurance to make any headway in that market. It was past time they pulled the plug on that endeavor. Come back and work for Jake? Everett didn't want to think about getting stuck in more boardrooms, heading up boring meetings, and dealing with mundane paperwork. He had done it enough in Europe. Perhaps it was selfish of him. They had all been drilled at an early age that they were going to become part of the family business, part of the Ramsley Empire. They were going to do insurance because their dad did insurance. It was expected. Everett didn't want to any more. Surely it would be better for all involved if they hired someone to do the job that actually wanted it. He would stay for the interim until Jake had things stabilized with the company finances. Afterward, he would be free to figure out what he wanted to do. Automatically, his eyes were drawn to Bree, who was laughing over something Max had said. Everett would bet that Bree led an exciting life. Jake and Everett headed back to the table. Once seated, Drew Colburn caught Everett's eye. He deliberately nodded his head to Bree, who was busy talking to Kelly, and raised an eyebrow. Everett frowned. Then he realized that Drew must know who Bree was. Drew was a detective with the local police agency. He had probably seen Bree at the police station when she was turning in criminals. Cluing in, Everett nodded. The two men shared an understanding look of determination before going back to their meals. Bethany, when were you going to tell us? Paget grabbed Bethany's hand. Bethany blushed. It's Michael and Anne's day. I thought it could wait. Paget exclaimed over the small ring on Bethany's hand. They've been engaged almost since they met, Molson said dryly. He just didn't give her a ring till now. My brother has a thing about debt. We waited until I could purchase it outright. I don't like owing anyone anything, shrugged Drew. It's beautiful. The detail is lovely, noted Paget. I'm so happy for both of you. Thank you, smiled Bethany. The group descended into talking about weddings, which Everett automatically tuned out. Bree leaned toward him. We could be checking out the office instead of listening to the merits of what gown shops to go to first. No, responded Everett. He was starting to like her attitude a woman who didn't get all mushy over the thought of weddings and kept to the business at hand. He wondered how the coming week would play out. Chapter 4 Everett showed up early to Henson Investigations. He intended to put time, money, and effort into finding David. Bree had not seemed all that impressed with him shadowing her investigation. Therefore, Everett was going to make sure she didn't start without him. The last thing he wanted was to be left cooling his heels in her office while she was following leads. Opening the door without knocking, he spotted the assistant typing at his laptop. Is Miss Henson in? asked Everett. She's getting breakfast. The man frowned and adjusted his glasses. Can I help you, or do you want to take a seat and wait for her? I will wait, Everett said curtly. Now that he was here, he was impatient to get started and a little annoyed at the delay. The fact that Bree was out on a useless task that she could have given her underling didn't sit well with him. He was used to paying for top quality. He wanted efficiency and results. Checking his watch, Everett sat in the comfortable chair. He waited for five minutes. Surely she could have just had breakfast sent over to the office. It would have been much more expedient. Everett took out his phone, scrolling through his emails. He worked on having his files and belongings from his apartment sent back to New York. The European division of Ramsley Insurance was shutting down. He notified the landlord that he was breaking the lease on the office building in Europe and would be willing to pay the penalty that the lawyers negotiated. 
Ten minutes later, still no Bree. Everett sent notices to the few employees that he had overseen. They would get ample severance packages to soften the blow of unemployment. He notified his assistant to hire someone to clean out the office properly and send all relevant information to him. Fifteen minutes later, Everett checked his watch again and put his cell phone away. This was ridiculous. How did someone run a business like this? He scowled. Everett was just about to say something to the assistant when the door flew open and Bree entered, throwing a bag on the desk. She popped out her earbuds as she set a tray of coffee cups down. It's about time, Everett commented as he looked at her jogging gear. Oh! Bree jumped about a mile, swirling around to find him sitting in the chair. What are you doing here? I'm helping you to find my uncle, remember? Dryly said Everett. If you would just check your texts, you would know he was here, Marty told her as he grabbed a coffee and delved into the bag, pulling out a breakfast burrito. Did they have the extra secret sauce? I am so glad I am not going to be in the office today. Bree handed him a container. Could we get to the matter at hand? Everett ignored the good smells coming from the bag. He already had breakfast. What are we doing today to try to find David? I thought first I would have breakfast because I don't think well on an empty stomach, Bree told him. Then I'd like to take a shower because I stink. While I'm doing those two momentous things, you can call Craymarn and set up a time to talk to him. You're going to go home and take the time to shower? Everett shot her a disbelieving look. What time does your workday start around here? Soon, prevaricated Bree. And I'm not going home. There's a shower here, and I have some changes of clothes here, too. A shower? Here, frowned Everett. Sure, you try being a bounty hunter. Some people don't have the best hygiene, Bree told him. It's super convenient to have a shower here. I can run to work, shower, and change here, then be ready for the day. Is this really a professional agency? Everett asked the assistant. No, responded Marty, wiping sauce off his chin with a napkin. Yet you hired us, and you won't go back on your word, Bree smiled smugly. I might be unconventional, but I get results. That remains to be seen. Everett grimaced. He wondered what he had committed himself to. Maybe he should look at hiring more than one agency at a time. Make it a true race to see who caught David first, with the promise of a hefty bonus. Just call Kramer. Bree grabbed a burrito. There's an extra in the bag if you want one. She left the room, closing the door behind her as she munched on breakfast. Everett gave in to temptation, snagging the extra burrito, unwrapping it and taking a bite. It was good. What is in the special sauce? It's extra secret sauce. No one knows because it's a secret, Marty informed him. I have tried recreating it with no success. Can I try it? Everett raised an eyebrow. Sure, if you promise not to get all mushy over Bree. Marty dipped the last of his burrito, popping it into his mouth. I have no intentions of getting all mushy over Bree, frowned Everett. You say that now, but I know Bree. She flirts. She is cute. She can be beautiful when she chooses. She's also super bad taking down the tough guys. You say you won't fall for her, yet eventually everyone does, remarked Marty. I just don't want to see you hanging around her like some lost puppy dog when David is captured and this is all done. I will be fine, Everett assured him. He had been around much more beautiful and sophisticated women. Bree wasn't his type. Marty slid the special sauce to the side of the desk, shrugging. Don't get mad at me when I say I told you so. The ones with the most pride tend to fall harder. Nothing is going to happen. Everett dipped his burrito, tentatively tasting the sauce. That is very good. No, that is magnificence in a plastic container, Marty corrected him. He took a sip of coffee and began working at his computer again. Dipping again, Everett had to agree that the sauce had a sort of afterbite that was enjoyable. He gave Marty a glance, wondering if the guy had a crush on Bree. It would be pretty funny if he did. Finishing breakfast, Everett pulled out his cell phone to make the call to Cramarn. Dan, it's Everett. 
I'd like to set up an appointment to talk to you today. There's been a new development. He left a voicemail. Bree returned, looking fresh in new clothes. What did Cramar say? Voicemail, replied Everett. He eyed the coffee, but decided that since there were only two, he would not ask. Next time, he would bring his own. Do you think he would still be at his office? She questioned. Probably. This is the time where normal business people are at their businesses, dryly said Everett. Most people started work an hour ago. Funny. Bree grabbed a set of keys. Let's go see Mr. Kramer. Afterward, we can follow up with some other leads. Finally, they were going to do something, Everett thought with satisfaction. He followed Bree down the street and watched as she grabbed a ticket off the windshield of her car. Frowning, Everett checked the meter. It was broken. He got into the passenger side of the vehicle. Why would you park at a broken meter? Because it was the only available spot yesterday? Bree informed him as she leaned over to put the ticket with the growing pile in the glove compartment. I ran to work this morning, remember? You left your car overnight? I'm surprised it didn't get towed, he commented. I know the tow guy, smiled Bree. He owes me for the time I took his mother in for jumping bond. That sounds like a story. Everett's voice trailed off as he looked in surprise at the back seat. What happened here? Oh, a client did a little damage, Bree replied easily as she swung into traffic. That reminds me, we need to stop at the garage so I can order new seats. A little damage? Everett wondered what her version of a lot of damage would be as he surveyed the ripped upholstery and foam stuffing. Nothing that can't be fixed, she assured him. Following the GPS directions, she pulled into a parking garage. Credit card. Excuse me? Everett frowned, not sure of her meaning. For the machine, you are paying, Bree told him sweetly. You wanted to come. Everett pulled out his wallet, handing her a card. Bree used it for the machine, handing it back to him while she put the parking pass on the dash. Finding a spot, she pulled in. Let's go talk to Mr. Kramarn. She gave him a grin and got out of the car. Everett frowned as he followed. She was getting a lot of enjoyment out of this. Going into the building, Everett led the way to the offices of the lawyer. He smiled at the secretary, telling her he had an appointment with Kramarn. He didn't. However, being a Ramsley had its benefits. Rarely was he ever refused. Of course, Mr. Ramsley. Please, just have a seat while I notify Mr. Kramarn that you're here. She gave him a practiced smile. Thank you, Dolores, nodded Everett. He waited patiently as she entered the office behind her desk. You know her name? commented Bree. Of course I know her name. Everett didn't mention that it was right there on a nameplate on the desk. You haven't bothered to find out Marty's name yet, Bree remarked with a censoring look. Was that the name of the assistant she kept? Everett mentally filed the information away. It didn't come up. That doesn't mean I didn't know his name. She gave him a look like she didn't quite believe him. Mr. Kramarn is ready to see you, Dolores told them. Everett was glad for the interruption. He didn't want to face Bree's annoyance over his not bothering to remember the name of someone who he probably would never see after this week. Kramarn? Everett! The older man shook Everett's hand. Good to see you. Who is the lovely young lady? This is Bree. Everett deliberately didn't give her full name. He wasn't sure he wanted the lawyer to know her profession just yet. Nice to meet you. Kramarn lingered over her hand, smiling. I might lose my bet now. Excuse me? Bree questioned, tilting her head a little in confusion. I had a bet that Everett here would always be a bachelor. I can see I might be wrong. Kramarn laughed at his own little joke. Bree gave a false smile, pulling her hand out of Kramarn's clasp. I wouldn't worry about that just yet. Dan, we were wondering if we could talk to you about Uncle David. Everett decided to take charge of the conversation. What about David? Kramart's smile reasserted itself. Shame he did what he did, but things were a little different back then. Less restrictive. You are David's lawyer. Did you know about his activities? The money laundering? Everett took a seat. Bree, if you'll take a seat, 
Cramarn offered, waiting for her to sit before sitting as well. Would either of you like coffee? What we would like is for you to answer the questions, please, pressed Bree. Are you sure? Cramarn asked Everett. You wish to talk about this in front of the little lady? Yes. Everett could feel Bree bristle beside him. He hastened to keep them on topic. I'd like to know just how much you knew about David's endeavors. David came to me for financial information, Cramarn commented, his expression shuddered. I provided advice in my capacity as a lawyer. How can you be David's lawyer and represent Robert at the same time? Bree asked with steel in her voice. Isn't that a conflict of interest? I was David's lawyer, but I no longer represent him. Cramarn gave her a condescending look. Everett, it would be better if your secretary waited with Dolores. Bree completely ignored his remark, studying his face. I'm surprised. I thought you knew David's whereabouts and were still advising him. Something undefined flickered across Cramarn's face. Everett, this woman needs to leave. I disagree, Everett said softly, his voice deceptively mild as his eyes sharply scrutinized the man. She asked the most interesting questions. Do you know where David is? I do not. I'm quite disturbed that you would ask me that. Cramarn was defensive. This interview is at a close. Cramarn stood abruptly. Everett and Bree rose as well. It would be better for you if you were truthful, Everett told him, an edge in his mild voice, his gaze boring into the lawyer. Leave, commanded Cramarn. Bree grabbed Everett by the arm. Let's go. He isn't going to tell us anything more. Jake will be in contact with you. I expect he'll be firing you and finding someone else to represent Dad, Everett warned him. I am hired by your father, not you or your brother, Cramarn coldly told him. We will see about that. Everett allowed Bree to tug him out of the office. They were quiet on the way to the car. Once in the parking garage, Bree pulled her phone out of her purse, switching it to speakerphone and hitting the voice record button. Dolores, cancel the rest of my morning appointments. Cramarn could clearly be heard. What did you do? frowned Everett. Shh! Bree covered the phone before hitting the mute button. Bugging someone is illegal, he hissed as they got into the car, careful to shut the doors quietly. I accidentally left a cell phone in the office. Oops, it happens all the time to people. Phones get lost every day, shrugged Bree. Now be quiet and listen. They listened as Cramarn made a call. David, we have a problem. Bree did a fist pump in the air. Your nephew Everett came to see me this morning. He's been talking about using you as a bargaining chip to the FBI to reduce Robert's sentence. I think he's searching for you. There was a pause. What David said was unintelligible. I'm not concerned that he will find you, continued Cramarn. What concerns me is that he just threatened to push me off Robert's case. David's volume rose. Still, Bree could not make out the words. I will talk to Robert, remind him what he owes. Cramarn sighed. Are you certain you don't want the records destroyed? I could have it done. It really would be for the best if they were. David growled something. Fine. I'll pass them on to Crawford. Cramarn hung up the phone and swore repeatedly. Something shuffled around and a door slammed shut. Bree shut off the phone with a satisfied smile. That could not have gone better. What about the cell phone you left? asked Everett. Will they know it was you? I'll bribe the cleaning crew to look for it and return it to me. She started up the car. If they don't, it's not a big deal. That phone can't be traced to me. Huh. Everett blinked in surprise. She was better at this than he thought she would be. I suppose you know who Crawford is. Bree grinned. Yep. Are you going to tell me? he asked. Not yet decided Bree. Do you own a tux? What am I saying? Of course you own a tux. It's back in Europe, Everett said dampeningly. I can get one. You'll need it for tonight, Bree cheerily told him. What is tonight? questioned Everett. He didn't like it when she talked in circles. Tonight you get to pretend to be James Bond. 
Bree winked at him, laying on the gas as she took a turn. Everett fastened his seatbelt. He was relieved when Bree pulled up to a pay parking lot. She was a bit of a dangerous driver. Credit card. Bree held out her hand. Rolling his eyes, Everett fished out his wallet, handing over the plastic. She swiped it through the machine and handed it back to him. Where are we going now? he asked. A block down is the ever-posh Miss Everly, Bree told him as she parked, exchanging the passes in the windshield, tossing the one from Cramard's building on the floor in the back seat area. She is expecting us. The ever-posh Miss Everly? Everett was amused. Who is that? David's mistress. Bree jumped out of the car. Everett quickly followed. She's willing to speak with us? Sure. Bree eyed his business attire. Are you wearing comfortable shoes? You should get some. Probably should dress a little more casually as well. You just told me to get a tux, he pointed out dryly. That's only for tonight. Bree walked briskly. Does Miss Everly have a first name? Everett wondered as he easily kept pace with his longer stride. I doubt Everly is her real name, Bree informed him. More of a persona. I can't believe the old man still has a mistress. Everett shook his head. At this point, he's probably keeping up appearances as a measure of pride. Sometimes men keep on women because they've gotten used to the relationship. They can talk to this woman who knows them so well and isn't their wife, responded Bree. You seem to know a lot about it. Everett raised an eyebrow. Only because I happen to have to talk to a lot of women as a private investigator. She shrugged. If men would behave and stay in their marriages, I wouldn't have to. David sure didn't stay in his marriage, frowned Everett. Did you ever find out which marriage is the legal one? Marty verified it today. So far, it looks like the marriage from Atlantic City is winning. Bree pulled open the door of a high-end apartment building. We'll see if it holds up as we find more about your uncle. She approached the lobby security man with a disarming smile. Hi, it's Aubrey Henson to see Miss Everly? Of course. Let me just check if Miss Everly is in. He gave her a friendly smile in return before going to the desk where a clerk presumably phoned Miss Everly. It's really nice in here, Bree remarked, enjoying looking at the impressive decor of the lobby. There's a fountain! Everett watched her in amusement as she openly admired the fountain. There are fish in here! Bree leaned over, fingering the vegetation. You have a thing for fish? he questioned. They are almost the perfect pet. If I didn't have to clean the aquarium, I would get one, she confided. It's about my level of responsibility. I'm not much of a nurturer. Miss Henson, you can go up. The security guard had returned. Thank you. Bree followed the man to the elevator. As Everett made to join her, the guard held up a hand to stop him. Sorry, just Miss Henson, the man told Everett. Everett was surprised. I'm with Miss Henson. Again, just Miss Henson, the man pointed to the lobby. We have some fine areas to sit while you wait. I'm sure that if you ask Miss Everly, she'll be happy to let me come upstairs. Everett was terse. Miss Everly was explicit. Only Miss Henson, not you, Mr. Ramsley, the security guard told him. I didn't tell you my name. Everett was immediately suspicious. Miss Everly recognized you over the video system, the guard explained. It will be fine, Bree assured him. I'll let you know exactly what she says. Everett gave an irritated nod. He watched Bree enter the elevator before returning to the seating area to listen to the now annoying tinkling of the fountain. Taking out his cell phone, he resolved to get some work done while he waited. When the elevator reached the top floor, Bree was taken to a door with a camera and a buzzer system. The security man buzzed her in, holding the door open for her. Thank you. Bree gave him a generous smile before entering the foyer. There were marble floors, columns, and skylights. Exploring further, she found a beautiful living room full of tasteful tans and creams with a grand piano. Outside, darling, a voice floated back to her. Bree found her way to a series of French doors. Miss Everly was sitting at a wrought-iron bistro set, 
sipping coffee in a silk robe on the rooftop. There was a small infinity pool overlooking the city. Bree tried not to let her jaw drop. A pool on the roof? For a mistress. How much was David paying her? Would you like a coffee? asked Miss Everly, pulling off her large sunglasses. Even in her fifties, she still looked gorgeous. Have a seat. Sure, Bree sat down at the little table. Thank you. Elon, bring a coffee. How do you like yours? Cream? Sugar? She inquired politely, her finger on a small gadget. Sugar, Bree responded. Please. Bring some of those macaroons as well. Miss Everly took her finger off the button. They are fresh made and absolutely to die for. That sounds lovely. Breen noted that it was nearly silent up here, the noises of the city contained below. He looks a lot like David used to, she remarked as she sipped her drink. Excuse me? Bree questioned, a little lost. The man downstairs in the lobby. I assume he's related? She raised an eyebrow. David's nephew, Everett Ramsley? confirmed Bree. David was such a good-looking man, sighed Miss Everly. He has preserved himself very well. However, back then, he was handsome. The woman flocked to him. Who wouldn't? He had power, looks, charm, and money. Where did you meet him? Bree didn't want to interrupt this stroll down memory lane. Miss Everly was volunteering information, and once talking, Bree had found that people liked to unburden themselves to her. At a fundraiser, I scooped him up right under his wife's nose. She had a nostalgic smile. It was a bit of a scandal. But you know how polite society is. If they can ignore the unpleasantness, they will. The wife ignored me very well, up until that interview on television, where she denounced David for the man he is. Miss Everly had a musical laugh. Silliness. We all knew David was enjoying the company of any woman he could. He is a man, and they think only of themselves. Bree wondered what experiences had clouded this woman's judgment. Yes, she did sometimes find men a little selfish, but then she wondered if women didn't condition them to be that way. Women were by nature nurturers, and catered to their men. However, Bree had seen many relationships where caring men were committed and invested. How young were you when you met David? I was twenty, and looking for a meal ticket. Miss Everly motioned to the beautifully landscaped rooftop. I certainly found it. Madame, your coffee and macaroons. A thin man came forward with a tray, carefully setting the items on the bistro set. He gave them a little nod before leaving. I think I might live better than the wife. She picked up a macaroon, delicately taking a bite. Then again, a woman only gets what she demands. What will you do now that David's on the run? Bree took a sip of coffee. It was gourmet stuff, almost too good. She was used to the quick java of a coffee shops. He's still depositing money into my accounts, so I suppose I will wait until that stops, or he dies, shrugged Miss Everly. I'm rich enough I don't need to take on another lover. This was my career and I did a fine job of it. Now I can choose to retire. It sounded a little cold to Bree. Do you happen to know where David might be? She smiled as she sipped more coffee. When you first proposed speaking to me, I thought, no, I won't talk to the very people that want to take David away. Then the novelty of speaking to a bounty hunter made me reconsider. I thought, why not? I'm sure I don't know anything much that can lead you to David. I suppose I should apologize. I have no idea where the man is. I just wanted to talk to you for a bit of fun. Did he mention anywhere he liked to vacation? A place where he went to get away from everyone? Questioned Bree. He went everywhere. David flew for business all the time, and he had his own private jet. Miss Everly shrugged lightly. He never mentioned where he was going or what he was doing. I admit, I didn't ask. When is the last time you saw him? Bree wanted to know. She thought about it for a moment. 
two weeks ago. He's an infrequent visitor. Mostly he comes to swim in the pool and boast about things or complain. David didn't like how Michael was running the company. He was ecstatic when his eldest was put in prison. He said it served Michael right for blackmailing him out of the company and for marrying that tart. David's words, not mine. He didn't like Anne? Bree raised an eyebrow. Anne had been very nice and accommodating to Bree, who had been an unexpected guest just yesterday. She had been the perfect hostess, making Bree feel welcomed into the family fold. She rejected David's advances. It was years ago. Miss Everly shrugged. Put him in a snit for nearly a month. David isn't used to being refused. But that's the thing with him. Just when you think he's finally forgotten some wrong done against him, he strikes like a viper. David likes a cold revenge. I suppose it wasn't just revenge against Michael, but against Anne as well. He nearly ruined their lives. He sounds a little scary, Bree frowned, wondering what she might have gotten herself into. She reminded herself that she needed to pay the bills, and this promised to be a big payday if she could deliver on David. Darling, if you manage to catch him and put him in prison, Miss Everly swung her cold gaze to focus on Bree. I would watch your back for the rest of your life. Even when David is dead, I have the feeling he'll still be reaching out from amongst the graves. A chill raced along Bree's spine. Chapter 5 Crawford is a close friend of David's, explained Bree as she maneuvered through the crowded mansion with Everett. He is known to have a secret tropical island. No one knows exactly where it's located. And you think that's where David might be hiding, guessed Everett. He nodded to a few of the men that he knew. Entering the party had been easy since they had simply stated his name. He was recognized as a desirable quantity at a house party in this society. Even though he wasn't on the guest list, he was immediately allowed entry. Bree was done up so nicely with her red dress, stilettos, and golden clutch. Everyone thought she was his date rather than the bounty hunter she was. When Everett had first seen her at the office, she had taken his breath away. She was one sexy little package. It's a possibility. Nothing is certain, Bree cautioned, leading him up the stairs. It helps that we overheard Kramer talking about giving Crawford some files. That means there's a good connection to start with. If we can find out the location of the island, we can search it and either find David or eliminate it from our list of locations where he might be. She smiled at a couple who walked past them. The second floor was quieter than the first. The public areas included a terrace, lounge, and washrooms. What interested Bree the most was the office. According to the blueprints she had looked at earlier, it was just down the hall past that security guard. We need a distraction, Bree told Everett. What sort of distraction? asked Everett. I don't suppose you could fall down the stairs and break a leg? She raised a delicate eyebrow. Everett looked at her in surprise. No. Too bad, murmured Bree. I know you're not exactly happy about having me tag along, dogging your every step as we try to find David, patiently said Everett. It's just something that you're going to have to deal with. You're right, she admitted, feeling a little guilty. Like it or not, he was paying the bills, so he would get what he wanted. Okay, you stand by the doorstep of the lounge. I'm going to distract the security guard. When you can, slip past him and search the office for the location of the island. Great. Everett was pleased she had finally given him something of value to do. It showed maturity on her part to cooperate with him. Wait, where should I look first? His question was lost as she slipped away into the crowd. Sidling up to a man, Bree tugged on his sleeve. Excuse me, sir. I just thought I should say something. Pardon? The gray-haired man looked quizzically at her. Do you see that man? The handsome one with the black hair, standing beside the doors of the lounge, with the blue pin on his tie. Bree unerringly described Everett. 
I saw him bump into you earlier. I think he was one of those professional thieves. You know the ones. They take people's wallets. No, surely not. The man smiled patiently as his hand automatically went to his pants pocket to check. His face registered alarm as he encountered an empty pocket. It's missing. Oh, breathed faked shock. How terrible. My goodness. The man pressed a hand to his lips. I've been robbed. Sir, Bree pointed out, the security guard's right there. Perhaps he can apprehend the thief? Yes, yes, I'll go tell him. Thank you. He quickly walked to the security man, gesturing agitatedly about his missing wallet. Bree melted into the crowd, finding a potted plant to tuck the wallet into, as she watched the security guard walk towards Everett with the still agitated man. A smile crossed her lips. She wished she could stay and watch the fun, but there was an office that needed to be searched. As she walked down the hall, she caught Everett's eye and blew him a kiss. Satisfied that she had detained him for a while so that he would not be in her way, Bree made her way to the office. With quick work from her break-in tools, she unlocked the door, slipping inside. Turning on the laptop, Bree inserted the coder that Everett's money had so thoughtfully provided. It would work on obtaining the password while she meticulously went through Crawford's desk. She perused an address book, not finding anything relevant. Setting everything back exactly as she found it, Bree next searched through the filing cabinets. By the time she came up empty there, the coder had worked, making the laptop free to use. Pulling the coder out of the USB drive, Bree put in a USB stick that had a search program on it. Last night, she had put together keywords for the program to search for, which should unearth any mentions of the island in Crawford's data files. She set the program to run as she wandered the office, trying to find a hidden safe. Checking her watch, Bree noted that she'd been in the office for perhaps a half hour, probably more time than Everett had been able to distract the security guard. She would not be able to walk out into the hallway and pass the guard without alerting him. She could get detained if she tried that. It would have to be an exit out the office window. Bree let out a sigh of frustration as she replaced a picture of a map on the wall. She couldn't see any sign of a safe where Crawford would keep his most valuable information. It would be disappointing to get this far and not turn up what they had come looking for. Tilting her head, she looked at the map a little closer. Bree had always been good with geography and she knew that the picture was off a little. There was something not quite right. Her brows came together, puckering as she thought about it. Chiming softly behind her, the search program was finished and had brought up its results. Ignoring it for a second, Bree looked at the longitude and latitude measurements on the side of the picture. It was all wrong. Quickly, she took out her phone and snapped a set of pictures. She would look at it later. This might well be exactly what they needed, or it could just be a picture where the artist had taken license with reality to draw people away from the truth. Hopefully, with a little more study, she could figure it out. Popping out the search drive with its saved information, Bree tucked the drives into her bra. At the window, she looked down into the backyard where people were milling about. If she was careful and quiet, it was likely no one would notice her. She would have to take the chance. Slowly opening the window, Bree hiked up her skirt. There was a small ledge that she could perch on. If she calculated correctly, she could edge her way around the building until she came back to the lounge, which had windows, where she could get back into a public area of the mansion once people had their backs turned. Straddling the window, she cautiously planted a foot on the ledge. It was just wide enough for the front half of her shoe to balance on. The heel hung off into air. Swallowing hard, Bree gently maneuvered her second foot out. She didn't expect any surprise shouts. People were chatting with each other, involved in their own little world. The chances anyone would look up and see her were slim to none. Straightening up, Bree took in a shallow breath as she gently closed the office window. Holding on to the frame, she was fairly comfortable where she was. The real fun 
would be leaving the window and clutching bare brick while she inched along. She was only one floor up, Breach sternly told herself. If she fell, she wasn't going to die. She would be highly embarrassed, maybe sprain an ankle or wrist, and have a lot of explaining to do. She had just better not fall. Inching along, Bree didn't look down. Heights were not her thing. Being too far up did funny things to her stomach and made her go dizzy. As a bounty hunter, she pretended to be fearless all the time. The truth was, she had her kryptonite just like everyone else. Finally, Bree found the right window. She could see the lounge, people chatting and drinking. There had been no shouts from below, so she was safe from discovery. Now Bree had to figure out a way to open the window and slip inside without anyone noticing. Everett was fuming. Bree had set him up. It had been difficult to convince the security guard not to call the police on him. Everett had to argue that he really was Everett Ramsley, had come to the party with an invitation, and that the man with the missing wallet had been mistaken in thinking that Everett had filched it from him. Nursing his bruised pride and a whiskey, Everett scowled as he waited for Bree to make an appearance. For all he knew, she was halfway across the country, hot on the tail of David and leaving him behind yet again. She had made her feelings as to his participation in the chase known. If he had not given his word that he would give her a week to prove her adeptness as a bounty hunter, he would fire her this instant. A movement at the window caught his eye, causing Everett to stare in disbelief. Bree was peeking in. How she was outside the window, at the second story of the building, was a mystery to him. Everett quickly looked around to see if anyone else had noticed. People were happily chatting, oblivious to the woman at the window. Calmly, Everett came to the window. Bree sighed in relief, motioning him to open the sash. With a smile, Everett reached up and locked the window. Bree gasped in shock. It was obvious she had a few words to say, but could not since she didn't want to draw attention to herself. Everett smiled in complete satisfaction, ready to turn around and leave her hanging. Bree reached into her cleavage and pulled out a USB stick, raising an eyebrow. For a moment, Everett hesitated. However, no matter his anger at how she had handled the situation, Bree had gotten into Crawford's office. Hopefully, the drive contained information that would be useful in the search for David. Everett unlocked the window, opening it a little so that she could put it up the rest of the way, as he turned his back, shielding her from any possible curious eyes in the room. He sipped his drink, pretending that it was entirely normal for a woman to crawl through a second-story window. He could not believe that no one even noticed. Was everyone really that self-involved? What did you find out? Everett asked briskly. Not sure, Bree told him. We'll have to let Marty sift through the information. I can transmit the data to him once we get back to the office. Everett decided not to bring up the fact that she had almost had him arrested. Then we should go. Not yet, Bree straightened her skirt. We should circulate. See if anyone has heard anything about David's whereabouts. The likelihood of someone knowing anything relevant and actually telling us isn't very good, Everett said depressingly. We won't know till we try. Bree gave him a determined smile. You flirt with the little old ladies, and I'll flirt with the little old men. Meet you back at the front door in two hours? Flirt? Everett was taken aback. Why would I flirt with little old ladies? To get information from them. Bree gave him an exasperated look. You are half handsome. You can do it. Half handsome? What does that even mean? Everett's brows lowered. Well, you are too tall for starters, Bree told him. Maybe you're just too short, he retorted. Normally, women fawned all over him. It hurt his ego a little that she wasn't. She grabbed his arm in a stranglehold. Is that Kramar? Where? Everett immediately turned to search the crowd. Over by the buffet table. He's talking to a man. Bree glowered as someone got in her line of sight, blocking her view. What is he doing now? He's shaking hands with Crawford. 
Everett frowned as he watched easily from his advantage of height. I think he passed him something. Small or big? What did it look like? Bree wanted to know. She craned her neck, but people were in the way. Something small. Crawford put it in his pocket, exclaimed Everett. It could be a copy of the records that Kramer had promised to hand off to Crawford. Bree was starting to get excited. Once Kramer moves on, I want you to talk to our host. I can do that. Everett looked down at her. She was still clutching his arm, smiling that Cheshire cat smile. What are you going to do? Pickpocket him, Bree said confidently. What? scowled Everett. That isn't even legal. Maybe not. But we want to know what's in those records. Bree was matter of fact in her explanation. Plus, if we have the records, we might be able to draw David to us. Or use them as a bargaining chip, grimaced Everett. If you're really worried about the legality of it, we can say we borrowed it for a short while, shrugged Bree. We are potentially going to give it back to David. Everett thought of all the bad things his uncle had done and hardened his resolve. Okay, let's do this. Great. When you see me, just concentrate harder on Crawford. Bree let go of his arm and slipped away into the crowd. Everett hoped she was a credible pickpocket. He would hate to have to explain to his host what his date's hands were doing in his pockets. He waited for Kramarn to move away. Finally, the man ended the conversation and moved toward the foyer, intent on leaving the party. Everett breathed a sigh of relief. He didn't want to run into Kramarn and have the lawyer even more suspicious of them. Moving toward his host, Everett smiled easily. Crawford, what a wonderful party you have managed. I don't believe I have ever enjoyed myself more. Crawford smiled, pleased with the praise. He shook Everett's hand heartily. It's all Naomi's doing. You know how women are. She loves to throw a bash. She's done a fine job. Everett continued to make small talk. I heard it from a friend, and he said I absolutely should come, so I did. I hope you don't mind my inviting myself. Not at all. We're very pleased to have you here, Crawford assured him. You met my daughter, Brittany. Everett's smile grew a little fixed. Oh, the matchmaking trap. It was inevitable at nearly every gathering, and he hated it. However, he had not seen Bree yet, therefore he needed to keep Crawford busy. No, I have not had the pleasure. Crawford searched the crowd. I believe I saw her this way. Lead on. Everett turned his grimace into a smile as his host glanced his way, before leading him through the crowd. Here she is, our pride and joy, Crawford said jovially, putting a hand on a tall brunette's shoulder. Brittany, I'd like for you to meet Everett Ransley. How do you do? She sized him up with a single glance. Everett had the feeling he was found wanting, which was interesting. Quite well, Everett greeted her. Pleased to meet you. The orchestra is starting up a nice song, Crawford not so subtly told them. Why don't you have a swing around the dance floor? With no polite way of refusing, Everett offered his arm to Brittany. Care to dance? She gave him an insincere smile and took hold of his forearm. They made their way to the floor, and Everett drew her into his arms. "'I'm not sure why my father is trying to set you up with me,' sniffed Brittany. "'The Ramsleys are knee-deep in trouble. I've heard all the rumors about the pharmaceutical and insurance companies. Likely you'll be out of business before the year is even through.' "'I imagine your father likes my bank account,' Everett said dryly. Having assets are nice, but if you blow through them with no income to replace your lavish lifestyle, she shrugged, unimpressed. Ramsley Insurance will weather this, Everett said confidently. He had full faith in Jake. I highly doubt it. Brittany cocked her head to the side. Mathematically, with the average fine that is levied against companies that have been found guilty of money laundering, plus the crackdown on the insurance market's margins that have been going on by the government, rising interest rates, the sell-off that has been happening to your shares, and the fact that the majority of the board have had their accounts frozen. Everett frowned, a little surprised at Brittany's knowledge of the situation facing Ramsley Insurance. We will be fine. I have a degree in business math, she told him. He was starting to see why her father was pushing Brittany 
at eligible men. She was a bit of a know-it-all. Ramsley Insurance has been operating for 50 years and will continue to operate, Everett assured her. It's just a minor setback. Brittany raised an eyebrow, silently telling him exactly what she thought of his assurances. She changed the subject. I went to school with Gabriel. I believe he is your cousin? Yes. Everett was surprised. He searched his memory. Gabe had complained bitterly about a girl named Britt. Could this be her? Did he call you Britt? He mentioned me? she asked, pleasantly surprised. He did, nodded Everett. He recalled Gabe saying something about her being a know-it-all brat. You must have made an impression on him. She seemed gratified at Everett's response. Belatedly, he wondered if she liked Gabe. Out of the corner of his eye, Everett spotted Bree chatting up an older gentleman. She looked back at him with a frown. He hoped she had managed to get whatever was in Crawford's pocket. Do you happen to know Gabriel's number? she inquired. Everett turned his attention back to Brittany. Gabe wasn't going to be happy with him. Yes, however it might be better if you just attend the yearly gala at Mercy Hospital. He is sure to be there. Hospitals are sound investments if one can manage the liabilities, she informed him. I would suppose so. Everett was glad that the song was drawing to a close. Would you like to go back to your father? No, she decided. I see a friend over there. I'll just go and say hello to her. It was nice to meet you, Everett. You as well. He repeated the insincere words. Brittany didn't particularly care about him in the least. He wondered if he was losing his touch. Then again, she seemed to be smitten with his cousin. Poor Gabe. Everett mingled with various people, greeting and turning the conversation to his uncle where he could. The funny thing was, he was certain they were talking about David. No one would want to miss out on the latest gossip. However, everyone was reluctant to bring up anything in front of Everett. He supposed because he was family to David, people were trying to be polite. Despite his prompting, and since he refused to flirt, he learned nothing. Late in the evening, Everett caught up with Bree. Did you manage to get whatever Cramar and passed to Crawford? She smiled triumphantly. Yes. Did you manage to learn anything of interest from all the ladies? Not a thing. Everett was disappointed to report. He wasn't contributing very much to this investigation, and that annoyed him. Too bad, remarked Bree. I discovered a few things that might be of interest. However, I think we should get back to Marty and see what he can learn from the information that we've gathered. Agreed. Everett put his hand along the small of her back, escorting her through the crowd. The valet parking brought up Everett's rental vehicle, and they went directly to Bree's office. Coming into the office, Everett was surprised to see Marty still tapping away at the computer, a pizza box open beside him. A large bottle of soda was on the desk, with an obscenely big straw sticking out of it. More work for me? Marty asked as Bree handed over the computer drives. This one first, grinned Bree. It's the most interesting. It contains files from David's lawyer. Everett eyed the pizza. Crawford had not put out that good of a spread. Bree, do you want pizza? I'll buy. Her eyes brightened considerably. Meat lovers. I'm on it. Everett pulled out his phone. He openly admitted he was a junk food junkie. The only reason he managed to keep fit was his love of sports and working out. He put in the order to a local place that would deliver. Bree kicked off her heels, flopping into one of the comfortable chairs. Did you get any drinks? I did. Everett frowned as he noticed information on a large white board. What is this? A map of people David knows. We're slowly eliminating prospects of people who might know where he is. It spirals out from the people who are closest to him to the people more removed, Bree explained. We've left a blank area for the illegal activities David is involved in as we don't know his contacts in those areas. I can get you some names. Everett pointed to the blank space and looked at Bree. Molson Colburn has gang members willing to testify that David dropped drugs to their operations when the FBI finally catches up to him. He could tell us who to talk to. 
Okay, rich boy, Marty weighed in. You can't just go talking to gang members and ask him if they know where David is. Why not? frowned Everett. Not you. Bree shook her head. You would end up getting ransomed. If Molson Colburn has the contacts, ask him to press on his friends and see if they can give any information where David might be. I will text Jake. He knows how to get in contact with the Colburns. Everett consulted his phone. This is interesting, Marty pointed to his screen. It's heavy data. Bree and Everett came to stand behind Marty. That's a lot of numbers, noted Everett. Those dates? Dates, times, locations, weights, amounts, accounts, and banking information. Bree scanned the information. Names! It's a laundry list of all his illicit activities, whistled Marty. Thirty years' worth in spreadsheets. Why would he want Cramarn to give this to Crawford? wondered Everett. What is the point of such a risky move? It was safer with his lawyer. I don't know, but we should give a copy to the FBI. Bree pulled out a new USB stick. Copy it. Wait, interrupted Everett. Let's think about this for a moment. My goal is to get my dad as little jail time as possible. If we just hand this over to the FBI, how does that help him? Plus, there could be information that would implicate my father. I want to know what is on this drive before we go any further. It's still a good move to make copies. First, because if we give it to anyone, we still have the information for ourselves, explained Bree. Second, if there's any software booby traps, we can have a second chance to work with the data if the first disk gets wiped clean. Always make backups. Marty grabbed the new USB stick. It just makes sense. Third, if we don't hand this information over to the FBI, then we are technically accessories to the crime, Bree informed him. Everett ran a hand through his hair. I just don't want to make things worse for Dad. I understand, sympathized Bree. However, I'm sure your dad would not want you to face charges either. I can sort out the data and see if there's any mention of Robert or Ramsley Insurance, offered Marty. Then we'll know what you're up against. Thirty years of financials and you're just going to sort it? Everett was a little disbelieving. It could take a crew of tech guys and auditors a month or more to do that at the company. They're using the wrong equipment. Plus, they all want a significant payday, Marty responded dryly. We need results, therefore I'm far more efficient. While Marty is busy with that, let's look at the photos I took from Crawford's office. Bree grabbed her phone out of her clutch. She plugged it into another laptop, downloading the photos. It's a picture of a map. Everett leaned over her shoulder to better see the screen. It's a flawed map. Bree pointed to the screen, ignoring how his warm hand had come to linger on her shoulder. See the longitude and latitude? What about it? he asked. If I pull up the coordinates on Google Maps, Bree brought up another screen. A pin was dropped in the ocean. It says nothing is there. Then the map is wrong. Everett was disappointed. There is no island there. Or there is an island there smugly said Bree. I don't get it. He frowned at her. She smelled like coconut rum. He tried to ignore it and focused on the computer screen. If you were a billionaire with an island that you wanted to keep a secret from the world, would you pay someone to just erase all record of it from the web search engines? Bree raised an eyebrow. Really? Everett was very handsome, she thought. Too bad he was so tall. The army has blackened out Ares all the time, citing national security concerns. Then this could be the location of Crawford's Island, Everett stated with satisfaction. We don't know that for certain, Bree cautioned him. We won't know that until we hire a plane and do a flyby. I can hire a plane, Everett assured her. Chapter 6 Whose stupid idea was this? Everett shouted over the noise of the airplane. Bree grinned as she adjusted her goggles. A crew member helped Everett fasten the parachute securely on his back. Everett's stomach was rebelling, as was his brain. It didn't make sense to jump out of a perfectly good plane. The ground was hard. Very hard. He swallowed with some difficulty. While he enjoyed moderate risky fun, 
This was downright scary. Everett didn't jump out of airplanes. Max was the one who was crazy enough to do that. Max had gone on all sorts of adventures. Everett had been on some of them. Dylan tagged along on most of them. From scuba diving to camping out in the poorest nations of the world, Max had been an adventurer. Everett enjoyed adventure in manageable doses. He was too much of a control freak. He didn't like heights. Anything else, he was usually good. He dragged in a breath, trying to calm his nerves. Bree looked like she was having the time of her life. Remember, count down to twenty, pull the cord, a crew member yelled as he tugged on Everett's jacket beside the ripcord. If it doesn't go, stay calm, pull this cord. Everett nodded as the man tugged beside the other cord. What happens if that doesn't deploy? You're a dead man, the man shouted. Don't worry, it won't happen. I packed the chutes myself. Everett wasn't reassured. What had he gotten himself into? Bree was already at the door. Everett swallowed hard. He wasn't going to let this diminutive woman best him. He could do this. He would do this. Everett came to stand beside her. The crewman opened the door, and the world was tiny below them. See the island? We're about to clear it. When I say go, you have less than twenty seconds to jump. After that, you will land in the ocean, too far away from the island. They waited, Everett's stomach rebelling. Go! the crewman bellowed. Bree didn't even hesitate. She jumped into nothingness. Everett came to the door and paused. This wasn't going to happen. Go! Everett knew he was supposed to jump. He didn't need someone yelling in his ear for that. However, his feet were stuck. He should. Someone planted a foot on his backside, and he was pushed out into the air. Ah! Everett's arms and legs waved around, trying to find purchase. After a few panicked moments, he realized he was supposed to have been counting. Now he had no idea on what number he should be. Was it too soon to pull the chute? Too late? He didn't see Bree. The ocean and the island were getting closer. Uncertain, Everett decided pulling the cord early was far more preferable than pulling it late. He pulled the cord, and his body was yanked upward as the parachute caught the air. Thank you. Everett closed his eyes and murmured a prayer. He wasn't going to die today after all. Opening his eyes, he looked around for Bree. It was difficult to see her, because they were both wearing blue sky suits, and the parachutes matched the color. The idea was that even though they were parachuting in during the day, they would be hard to spot for anyone who was actually on the island. A boat was scheduled to pick them up during the early morning hours overnight. It was a crazy James Bond sort of thing to do. When Everett and Bree had discussed it at the office, it had seemed easy and fun. It would be an adventure. The reality was, well... Everett looked around from his vantage point. It was kind of fun. Not getting the kicked out of a plane part, but slowly descending from the sky was pretty cool. He was starting to realize they might be in over their heads. What were they thinking, that they could just go to a secret island and see if a fugitive was residing there? The island rushed closer, and Everett realized that he was going to land on the beach. He could not have timed pulling the cord any better, he thought with some satisfaction. Soft knees, Everett remembered from the instructor. He pulled his legs up and tumbled into the sand. Unclipping the parachute, he rolled it up and stashed it in some bushes. Looking around, he no longer saw Bree. The walkie-talkie strapped to his belt crackled with static. Quickly shedding the jumpsuit, Everett put it with the parachute and grabbed the walkie-talkie. Bree? I'm in a tree, she complained. Everett looked around. There were a lot of trees on the island. Where? South of you, Bree informed him. I can see the beach from where I am. If you walk by, I'll let you know. South it is. Everett looked up at the sky to judge the direction. It was late afternoon, and the day was a scorcher. It was a beautiful place. 
probably would be a nice spot to vacation on some winter day. Everett grabbed his pack and trudged through the sand. A half hour later, he pulled out the walkie-talkie. Are you sure I haven't passed you? Not yet, Bree was annoyed. Could you hurry it up? My legs are going numb. Everett didn't like the sound of that. He pushed his speed up from a slow jog to a run. There, Bree was excited. I see you. Come into the trees and I'll direct you. Soon, Everett was looking up into the trees to find Bree hanging from her parachute ropes. You are stuck. I noticed. Now get me down. Bree was impatient. I tried to cut it with the knife, but it dropped. Look for it in the sand. I don't want you to step on it. Found it. Everett pocketed the jackknife. The only way to get to Bree was to climb. Pulling on a pair of gloves, he proceeded to carefully make his way up the trunk of the old and gnarled tree. It was getting thinner as he progressed upward. He seriously doubted it would support his weight if he were tried to climb high where the parachute was stuck. He would have better luck just getting to Bree. Coming parallel to Bree, Everett reached out his hand. Grab my hand. She stretched out. You're too far away. I'm not going to be able to reach you. Sure you can. Everett stretched as far as he dared. Swing a little, like when you're a kid on the swing set. When you get close, grab my hand. Bree nodded. She had already divested herself of her goggles and looked a little pale. Trying to swing in the harness, she managed to stretch out far enough on the swinging motion to touch his fingers. A little bit further, coached Everett. You've got this. She bit her lip and swung her body harder. After a few more tries, she managed to clasp his hand. Everett drew her close toward him. Okay, hold on to me and I'll cut the cords. Thank you. Bree wrapped her arms around him in a bear hug. She was shaking. It's going to be okay, Everett assured her as he fumbled with the jackknife. Getting it open with one hand wasn't easy. He sawed at the parachute straps. Just hold on tight. I am, Bree said breathily. She wasn't about to let go. Finally, the last strap was cut, and she was free. Everett put away the knife. I'm going to climb down now. If you feel yourself slipping, let me know, and I'll stop so I can help you get a better grip on me. Okay. Bree would be happy to hit the ground. After the terrifying jump from the plane, the parachute ride itself had been thrilling. She loved it. Being stuck in a tree for that long? Not so much. Her legs were aching from the harness straps, which had been cutting off her circulation. She knew that it had been dangerous to be stuck there like that for much longer. They slowly descended from the tree. Once on the ground, Bree tried to stand but sank on unsteady legs. Everett grabbed her before she could hit the ground. I've got you. Bree held on to him, thankful that he was here. If he hadn't been, she would have been in real trouble. Never before had she had to rely on anyone to get her out of a sticky situation. Bree leaned into him, relaxing against Everett as they sat on the sand. She had never felt so safe and protected in all her life. Which was silly, because she had been fighting against being protected by well-meaning males most of her life. Just because she was small, men seemed to think that she was fragile. Normally, Bree hated to be cosseted. This time, it was comforting to be held. She stayed in his arms, listening to the steady beating of his heart. Are you going to be okay? Everett gently asked her. He had been holding her for a good five minutes at least. Not that he minded. She was curled up against him, and Everett had to admit that she fit very nicely in his arms. How do the legs feel? Pins and needles, Bree murmured against his chest. At least they have feeling again. Give me a few more minutes and I'll be ready to stand. Take all the time you need. Everett breathed in the scent of her and looked through the trees to the crashing waves of the ocean. He had the distinct feeling that he belonged here. Not necessarily on this island, but with Bree sharing her adventures. Marty might have something when he said that people had a bad habit of falling for Bree. Everett wondered what it might take to have her fall in return. Not that he was looking for a relationship. Relationships meant responsibilities. And kids. Women always wanted kids. 
Not that Everett had anything against children, as long as they were someone else's. Kids were not very interesting until they were fully mobile and talking coherently. Before then, they were hot messes, full of poop, vomit, slobber, and sticky sweat. Everett admitted he wasn't into the idea of kids. I hate heights, confided Bree. The jump terrified me, and yet, when I was just drifting in the parachute, it was beautiful looking down at the world like that. You didn't seem terrified. Everett was surprised. You jumped like a champ. They had to kick me out. Really? Smiled Bree, drawing back to look at him. Seriously, Everett told her. I have the boot print on the back of my jumpsuit if you want to see it. Now I know you're just trying to make me feel better, Bree responded ruefully. It's true, insisted Everett. He pushed a strand of hair out of her face, hooking it behind her ear. He was glad to see she wasn't pale anymore. I hate heights. Bree decided she had done enough lounging on Everett. He was a good pillow and was starting to feel very manly under her touch. It was time to put some distance between them. She pulled herself to her feet, legs aching, but supporting her. Everett quickly got up and lent her a hand. If you want, I'll carry your pack until your legs feel better. Sure. Bree handed it over. Normally, she would protest that she was fine, but she really did feel a little weak. She needed to get moving to pump the circulation system of her body. She stripped off the jumpsuit, happy to be comfortable in her jeans and tee. It was humid on the island. Let's go find the house. After you, Everett picked up both the packs easily. When we're in the sky, I noticed a building, Bree told him as she started to walk through the trees on shaky legs. If we angle ourselves this way, we should meet up with it. It wasn't a big island, so it was unlikely they would miss anything of interest to see. As they walked, Bree slowly increased her speed, grateful her legs were returning to normal. Sweating from the heat and brushing away mosquitoes, Bree halted as she saw a house through the trees. Everett looked through the dense bush. It's a nice place. Off-grid. See all those solar panels and the small wind turbines? Bree noted the appearance of the house. It's newly built. If I were a criminal needing a hideaway, this one looks pretty plush. Everett noted the large windows, wood decking, patio furniture. It looked like someone had not spared any expense. It was encased in green wood siding with a green metal roof to try to blend in with the surrounding trees. Bree turned to Everett rifling through one of the packs until she found a set of binoculars. She lifted them to her eyes, surveying the area. There should be a groundskeeper, someone who cleans and possibly cooks, a couple of security guys and some dogs, two or three, I'm thinking. Dogs? Everett didn't like the idea of that. For security or as pets? Security. Bree pointed to a flag in the ground. They have been installed an in-ground fence around the property. You can see all the little flags. Do you think they're out now? Everett looked around. No, they probably just get released at night, sighed Bree. That means we're going to have to go in earlier than I had hoped. Everett took the binoculars that she offered to him. He studied the property. The windows were tinted so they could not see inside. Does that up our chances of getting caught? It does. However, I would like to keep my limbs from getting bitten by two over-eager dogs, Bree said dryly. She was about to take a step forward when she abruptly stopped. Stay still. Everett froze. What? Bree swallowed. There are cameras. And a tripwire near her feet. I bet it triggers the cameras to start recording. Everett looked to where she was pointing. If she had not mentioned it, he never would have seen the tiny thread that was perched at ankle height between two trees. Why not just go with a motion sensor camera? <laughs> then they would see every deer, raccoon, and squirrel on the island each day and every day. Bree carefully backed away from the wire. It's not like the city. Everett experienced a moment of doubt. Security? Dogs? Cameras? What did they think they were doing going up against these guys? I should have hired some professionals to come here. I'm the professional. Bree scowled up at him. This is no different than doing surveillance and a minor break and enter on a property in the city. 
That is illegal, frowned Everett. Did you think that David was just going to come out to the deck and wave to us? She lifted an eyebrow. We have to go in to see if he's there, or any sign that he might have been there recently. No one is going to volunteer that information at a place like this. It's up to us to follow the clues. Yes, but I also have no desire to end up in jail for trespassing, grimaced Everett. Maybe he had been a little idealistic and caught up in the excitement of planning the adventure. Executing it was a little different. Don't get cold feet on me now. Bree edged around the property. Let's have a look from the other side. Then we can figure out what the best point of entry will be. They crept through the brush. An hour later, Bree determined that a side door was probably their best bet. It was closest to the trees, had minimal line of sight to the house, and the dogs were on the other side of the property, which meant that they would not make a fuss when Bree and Everett crossed the lawn. There was even a gardening shed halfway to help mask their movements. When the sun starts to set, it'll be difficult to see this way, Bree pronounced in satisfaction. We've got an hour or so to rest and then make our move. Everett nodded. They retreated back through the trees, making a quick little camp to sit on a dry tarp and have a snack of granola bars with water. The goal was to find out if David was there, or had been there without getting caught. They would have to go back to the sandy beach area tonight to catch their ride out. If David was here, it would be the chip that Everett needed to bargain with the FBI. He could hardly believe that it might be this easy. If it was, why was it that the FBI had not found David already? I'm having a nap, Bree declared, setting an alarm on her cell phone. You can watch for anyone coming our way. Everett munched on the granola bar she gave him. He was still hungry, but decided not to raid the bags, just in case they might need the food later. Bree had stretched out on the tarp, an arm above her head, the other on her stomach as she tried to catnap. Everett leaned back against the tree and decided that if it were not so muggy with mosquitoes, it would be a nice day. An hour later, the sun was setting, and Everett shook Bree awake as she hit the snooze button on her phone for the fourth time. Hey, time to go. Bree grumbled and wiped her eyes. I love the land of sleep. Everett rose to his feet, extending a hand down to her. Too bad. We're on the clock, remember? Bree allowed him to help her up. They gathered up the tarp and put it away before creeping back towards the house. Don't forget the trip wire, she cautioned him. They scouted the area, carefully stepping over the wire, and made their way to the shed. Looking around, there was no one that they could see. Perhaps everyone was away for the day, Everett thought. He certainly hoped so. He had no idea what he would do or say if they ran into anyone. Bree scurried toward their pre-selected door, and Everett followed. She brought out a set of breaking tools working on the lock. I can't believe we're doing this. Everett had never broken into anyone's house before. It will be fine, Bree assured him. The lock turned and she gave him a brilliant smile. Not bad for a first time. You're kidding, Everett stated in surprise. At least he fervently hoped she was. Bree rolled her eyes. Absolutely. She led the way into the house. Everett carefully closing the door behind them. It was a long hallway with a couple of bedrooms and a small sort of staff room. Bree guessed that this was where the help lived. Two bedrooms, so that meant there was likely only two staff on hand. Moving further into the house, Bree peeked into the kitchen. It was massive and well kept. She crept over to the dishwasher, opening it. What are you doing? Everett hissed at her. Three sets of dishes, Bree whispered back as she gently closed the door of the appliance. That means two staff, one guest. Or three staff, because two of them are in a relationship, Everett countered. Don't be such a pessimist. Bree carefully checked the next room. There was an empty dining room with large windows to the ocean. She crept along, slowly opening the next door so that she could peek into the room a tastefully decorated living room, empty as well. There was a cigar in the ashtray. Bree moved forward to study the ashes. It's still warm. Then there probably was a guest. 
Everett looked around nervously. A book had been put down, a marker in the spot where the reader was still reading from. We should move. He may have gone to the washroom and will be back any minute. Dining room, Bree pushed Everett back. We can wait there until he returns and see just who he is. Everett nodded. That made sense to him. Hopefully it was David, and then they could be on their way with a simple picture snapped of his uncle for proof. They both hovered in the doorway, an inch of space letting them see into the living room. Nothing happened. Bree looked at her watch. It's been twenty minutes. We should wait. Everett was okay with waiting. Waiting meant they were less likely to be discovered. He was patient enough that he could wait it out. Bree gave a huff of air as she looked into the room. Deciding enough was enough, she moved carefully into the living area and approached the next door. Grimacing, Everett followed her. She was too impatient, in his opinion. They could have waited a little longer to know for certain if anyone was going to return to the room. He hovered behind Bree as she cracked open the next door. "'You won't find anything there,' a voice said from behind them. Everett turned with his hands up in surrender. His disarming smile faltered a little as he saw a man with a gun pointed at them. "'We were just looking for my uncle. Have you seen him around?' "'I see only you.' The man motioned with his gun. "'Sit down in this chair over here where I can keep an eye on you.' Everett glanced behind himself. Bree was gone. Clenching his teeth, he wondered where the petite bounty hunter might be. He slowly moved toward the chair the security man had mentioned. I'm Everett Ramsley. Perhaps you've heard of my Uncle David. I have reason to believe he might be here. Sit. The man was in no mood for chit-chat. Where did your girlfriend get to? Not sure, Everett said honestly. He decided he would not deny that Bree was his girlfriend. Maybe, if they underestimated her, she would be able to get away and call for help. He carefully sat in the chair. If David Ramsley is here, I would like to speak to him. Suspect one is secure, the man said into a handheld radio, keeping his weapon trained on Everett. Copy, a voice returned over the device. Everett wondered what he was going to do. More importantly, what were they going to do with him? Bree slid into a closet. Her heart was pounding and her breath fast. She cracked open the door, watching a man race down the hall towards the living area. Two security goons, at least. One of them had Everett. Slipping out of the closet, she quickly and quietly traversed down the foyer. There was a study to the side, and she went in, closing the door behind her. Files were open. There were all sorts of pictures and notes scribbled on paper. Bree looked over the massive desk. Pictures of a much younger David with a variety of people. Bree picked up a stack, sorting through it. Some from partying with friends. Some with children. Some at various vacation destinations. Some with him on a boat called the Sweet Bethany. Bree recognized Ted Searson. There were even barrels in the background of the pictures. Could David have been so stupid? as to document his entire illegal activities? Bree searched through the photos, and there were more. Grainy night photos of David and Ted loading or unloading the boat. Bree could scarcely believe her eyes. She took out her cell phone, using the camera to snap pictures as she spread out the photos for better shots. I'm writing a book, a mild voice said from behind her. Bree whirled around, the photos scattering. There was a thin man with glasses standing in front of her. He came forward, picking up the pictures from the floor. I don't believe you are supposed to be here, he said reasonably. No, not really. Bree looked to see if he had any sort of weapon or a radio to alert security to her presence. I'm searching for David Ramsley. A lot of people are looking for him. He dumped the pictures back on the desk. Do you know where he is? She persisted, keeping a watchful eye on him. No. He pushed up his glasses to look at her. Then how did you get all this? Bree gestured to the documents, photos, and notes on the desk. He gave them to me. Then he left. The man sat down. I'm a ghostwriter. David hired me to write his story. 
He wants the world to know how he got away with everything. It's a homage to himself. What do you do if you have questions? frowned Bree. How do you contact David? I don't. He rearranged some papers that Bree had touched. It all goes through an intermediary. If you'll excuse me, I would like to get back to work. I have a deadline. Who is the intermediary? asked Bree. I couldn't say. He tissed as he noticed a mark on one of the pictures. I'll have to get this reprinted since you stepped on it. I asked, who is the intermediary? Bree glared at him, leaning across the desk. What do I get in return? He adjusted his glasses again, looking at her in cool disdain. What do you want? she questioned. Bree hoped it would not be anything that would be a real issue. Money, he told her. I want money wired to an account so that when I leave here, I'll have an even bigger retirement plan. My boss has bags of it, Bree assured him. How much and what account? Five million. He named the number easily. Grabbing a sheet of paper, he wrote down a bunch of digits. Five million? Bree nearly choked on the number. The bounty for Ramsley has gone up to ten million. Half of the reward money seems appropriate to me. He handed over the paper. You can deposit the amount. Leave me a way to contact you, and I'll let you know the name for the intermediary once the funds are in my account. Are you kidding? Bree shook her head. There is no way to know if you would even give me a name or if that was the truth. I want the name now. I'm supposed to believe that you're just going to deposit the money after I give you the name? He scoffed. Not happening. Bree scowled. They were at an impasse. She wrote down a phone number quickly. I'll see what my boss says. You do that. He tucked the number in his shirt pocket. Are you going to tell security that I was here? Bree wanted to know. I'm sure they are ready now, he sighed. There are cameras all over the house. Now, it might make an interesting side note in the story if you would tell me who you are so I can write this in. Bree quickly went to the door. Sure enough, there was a lug of a man waiting in the hallway for her to try to make a break for it. She closed and locked the door. Crossing the room, Bree opened a window, crawling out. Who are you? the guy called after her. Bounty hunter, Bree cheerfully told him before she raced along the lawn. Counting windows, she estimated she was at the kitchen. Pulling out her small lock tool kit, she opened the kitchen door, went into the dining area to peek into the living room. A thug had Everett sitting in a chair, guarding him. Bree ignored the little flip in her heart. She didn't like that she was responsible for putting him in danger. Bree tried to tell herself it was just because she needed him to pay the bills. Truth was, she was starting to like Everett Ramsley. That was a problem. She had thoroughly investigated him and knew that he was firmly entrenched in being a spoiled rich guy. A relationship between the two of them could only be temporary. Then again, it wasn't like Bree was looking for anything permanent. She liked her lifestyle. She liked her job. She enjoyed being able to be accountable to no one but herself. Having a guy in the picture always cramped her style. Guys wanted to curtail her activities. Some of her previous boyfriends had said she should get a different job. They expected her to cater to them when they wanted something. That wasn't going to happen. Bree liked being up at odd hours. She enjoyed the adrenaline rush of capturing a criminal. She wasn't going to settle down any time soon. Maybe Everett was perfect for her after all, as long as she could make her traitor's heart understand that it was just temporary. Bree snuck into the room when the guard's back was to her, just as she heard the radio crackle. Suspect 2 just entered through the kitchen. Chapter 7 Bree jumped behind the sofa as the guards swung around to keep an eye on the dining room door. Crawling on her hands and knees, she snuck a look around the side of the piece of furniture. Bree, he has a gun! Everett yelled toward the door. Shut up! The man hissed at Everett. It was all the distraction she needed. While the guard's attention was on Everett, she pushed herself to her feet and flung herself at him. All 130 pounds hit him from the side, and he stumbled. 
grabbing the wrist of the hand that held the gun. She brought her hands down hard while bringing her knee up to his elbow. The man let out a cry of pain, dropping the gun. Everett suddenly had an arm around the man's neck. What do we do with him? Everett asked as he struggled to keep hold of the wriggling guard. Bree pointed the gun at the guy. Sit in the chair, close your eyes, and start counting. Everett quickly stepped back out of the weapon's way. I would listen to her. The guard grimaced, but chose to sit in the chair. Start counting, loudly. Bree motioned Everett to back away with her toward the dining room door. One, two, three. The guard gruffly called out, annoyed and irritated by his situation. Count louder! Bree stashed the gun in a nearby plant and opened the patio door as quietly as she could as the guard's volume increased. Everett grabbed her shoulders, hustling her out of the living room. Guard coming from the dining room, he whispered in her ear as they rounded the house, trying to stay out of sight of the windows. We need to go, Bree pointed to the trees. Did you find David? Everett asked. No, Bree chose to elaborate later. Run! She sprinted across the lawn and could hear Everett running after her. Then the dog started barking, and Bree sped up as fast as she could, knowing the canines could outrun them. Everett had longer legs and was catching up. Bree burst through the trees, hoping the dog still had their collars on and would not go off the property into the woods. She continued to weave her way through the bush, remembering which way to go to the beach. They would need to find a place to hide until the boat came for them. It was dark, and more than once Bree stumbled, branches leaving scratches on her arms and face. Finally, she stopped, gasping for breath. It was deathly quiet around her. Too quiet. Where was Everett? Everett? She whispered loudly into the stillness. Everett? There was no reply. Swallowing down panic that the security goons had managed to nab him again, Bree turned around to retrace her steps. She took out a small pen light, covered with red cellophane to dim the light a little. Slowly making her way back toward the house, Bree came back to the edge of the property. The dogs must have been penned up again, because she didn't see them. They were barking in their enclosure. The house had a few lights on, and she could see a security man sweep the yard with his flashlight. Backing into the trees, Bree tried to estimate where she and Everett might have entered the brush. Making her way around, she found the telltale signs of their entry. Numerous broken branches and flattened grass told the story. She followed along, noting that one of them had broken the tripwire. Bree frowned. If the cameras were going all the time, then what was the tripwire for? Moving forward, she followed the path that they had made. Bree was surprised that no one had followed them into the woods. Maybe the goons were just hired for the house and to keep the ghost rider safe. Or perhaps they had been followed and they now had Everett. She tried to tamp down the fear that thought brought. She needed Everett to be okay. He was a good guy. Plus, he was there to pay the bills, she reminded herself firmly. It had nothing to do with how he made her feel when he wrapped his arms around her. Keeping to the trail they made, not even a hundred feet from the perimeter of the house, Bree found Everett face down in the mud and grass. Everett! Kneeling beside him, she checked him for injuries when a snore erupted from his frame. Bree rocked back on her heels, scowling in confusion at the form of the man before her. He was sleeping? Shutting her gaping mouth, Bree gave him a firm shake. Nothing happened except another snore was emitted. Bree pushed on his shoulder with both hands, turning him over so that she could see his muddy face. He was obviously asleep. Bree uncapped a water bottle from her pack and poured part of the contents over his face. Everett jerked, his bleary eyes opening. What is wrong with you? Why are you asleep? she countered. Grabbing his arm, she tugged on him. Get up! We need to get going! What happened? Everett mumbled as he frowned, lumbering to his feet. He sagged against Bree, nearly causing her to fall under his weight. Where are we? 
The island? Bree grunted, trying to move him forward toward the beach. Walk, one foot in front of the other. We were running, he nodded with some exaggeration. Everett yawned, blinking his eyes in the darkness. Something hit my neck. What? Bree looked up at him. She shone the flashlight at his neck. She didn't see anything. Got stung by a bee. Everett yawned again his eyes closing as he leaned heavily on her. He set his head on hers. Everett, Bree said desperately as even more of his large frame draped over her. Wake up! He muttered something incoherently. Bree elbowed him in the solar plexus. He coughed, jerking his head up. What? Walk, Bree commanded. He stumbled along with her. You smell nice. Bree highly doubted that. They had been running around on a humid day. She really didn't think she smelled nice at all. Coconut rum, he murmured, closing his eyes again, stumbling over a root. Everett, pay attention, Bree huffed as she tried not to collapse under his weight. We need to get to the beach. I'm not going to drag you there. You're too big for me to handle. A sigh graced the crown of her head as his feet staggered along with hers. Too tired. Bree wondered if he had met up with a poisonous spider or something. This wasn't good. You can do this, Everett. One foot in front of the other. We'll get you to the beach, camp out for a few hours, and take the boat back to civilization. If you need a doctor, we'll get you one. She wasn't going to let him die on her watch. Bree continued to labor under his weight as they pushed through the trees. It was a good thing no one was hunting them, Bree reflected ruefully. Anyone could hear Everett snoring a mile away if they were so inclined. No longer worried about his health, Bree had sat beside him for three hours in the sand and realized that all he was going to do was sleep. Thankfully, she had managed a catnap of her own. Bree could sleep through anything. It was a blessing because her apartment was near one of the busiest freeways in the city. It was a curse because she often slept through her alarms. As a coping mechanism, Bree had five alarms set in various places around her apartment so that she would have to leave the comfort of her warm cocoon of a bed to shut them off. She had a habit of sleepwalking a little too, so four alarms were not enough. It was surprisingly cool, so Bree had wrapped them both in a blanket at the edge of the trees and used Everett as a pillow. He was a nice pillow. Bree told herself to not to get used to the idea. After she caught David, she would never see him again. When her cell phone went off, Bree packed away the blanket and started to scan the waters. She didn't see anyone out there. Then again, she had been told the boat would be very discreet about noise and light. Bree stuck to the plan, taking out two inflatable life jackets. Putting one on herself, she shook Everett hard. Wakey, wakey! Is it morning? groaned Everett, wiping a hand along his face. Time to get going! Bree pulled on his arm, making him sit up. You need to put this on. Why? Where are we? He frowned as she coaxed him into the life jacket, fastening it up like he was a child. Everett yawned. Oh, no, you don't. Bree tapped his face with the back of her hand to get his attention. No sleeping. We are going for a swim. Swim? He looked at her in confusion. Then he rubbed his neck. I was stung. You told me that? Bree rolled her eyes, pulling the cord to inflate her own vest. Get up, Everett. He lurched to his feet with her help. Pulling something from his pocket, Everett held it out to her. This stung me. Bree shone the flashlight into his hand. It was a tranquilizer dart. No wonder Everett was trying to sleep all the time. She carefully took it, making sure it didn't prick her. Okay, I'm just going to leave this here. Stand up for a moment, and then we'll inflate your vest and turn on your light, okay? Everett nodded numbly. He stretched and nearly toppled over. Bree caught him, steadying him. Stay! 
she left him weaving on his feet while she buried the dart in the tree line. Coming back, she was surprised that he was still upright. He blinked bleerily at her. Was David here? No. Bree pulled his cord and his vest inflated. She turned on both their rescue lights. They blinked in the darkness. But we may have a new lead. Oh? Everett somewhat perked up with interest. Bree helped him on with his pack before putting her own on. Into the water. Let's go. He dutifully followed her. Aren't you worried about the sharks? Not really. You? Bree grabbed his hand to make sure he didn't wander in the wrong direction. He threaded his fingers through hers. Nope. The likelihood of getting bit by a shark is less than getting hit by lightning. Or drowning, being in a car accident, or dying from a fireworks accident, he told her sleepily. I like holding your hand. Bree tried to stop the flutter that danced across her abdomen at his words. She wasn't sure what to say. I like you, he confided on a yawn. Bree tried to stop a smile from creeping across her face. You like me? He nodded solemnly. Tugging his hand out of hers, he cupped her cheeks and leaned down to give her a kiss. And missed as he lost his balance, his lips trailing across her cheek before he fell into the sand. Bree snorted with laughter grabbing her ribs as she was engulfed in helpless mirth. That wasn't cool. Came his annoyed mumble from the sand as he rolled over. No, but it was memorable. Bree wiped a tear from her eye in amusement. She could not help another chuckle as she lent a hand to haul him to his feet once more. He pulled her against him, this time planting his feet better as his hands cupped her face again. Leaning forward, he kissed her. Bree leaned on him, enjoying the kiss. He certainly knew what he was doing, she reflected breathlessly. Warm, happy feelings bounced around inside of her. Her hands crept up along his life vest, and it was a long minute before he lifted his head with a satisfied smile. Now that was memorable, he told her. Bree rolled her eyes. He was such a man. Ignoring the flutterings in her stomach, she grabbed his arm. Into the water. The boat is waiting. Everett obediently followed her until they were thigh deep in the surf. It's cold. No kidding, Bree said through chattering teeth. During a hot day, it would be refreshing. At night, not so much. She tugged on his arm. We need to wade out. What if the boat isn't there? Everett seemed much more alert, reluctantly following her into the waves. What if they didn't come? They are there. We hired them to be there. They are experts at search and rescue. They will find us, she assured him. Everett had paid a pretty price to make this whole island exploration happen. Soon they were swimming in the water, both of them keeping a hand on the other to make sure they didn't end up drifting away in the currents. Bree didn't admit that she was a little worried about the boat. She hadn't seen it yet. She assured herself it would be there. That was how she got through most of her life, with misplaced confidence that generally saw her through. What she really wanted to do was repeat her mantra of winning and finding her target. However, that would seem a little silly in front of Everett. Suddenly, a searchlight lit up the waters near them. Bree twisted to see it coming from a boat that was maybe fifty feet away. Thank you, breathed Everett. Relieved that rescue was coming at last, he began tugging Bree in that direction, swimming as best as he could in the waves. Over here! Bree waved her arms in the light. She hoped it was the boat that they had hired to rescue them from the island, and not Crawford's men. At this point, she was so cold she would be grateful to get out of the water. Minutes later, a swimmer in a wetsuit approached them. Aubrey Henson and Everett Ramsley? That's us. Bree said with relief. She was shaking from the cold. The man flashed a light in their faces to verify their identities before he hooked a couple of lines onto their life vests. You'll feel a slight tug. Just concentrate on keeping your head above the water. Put your back toward the boat. It will be easier for you. We will reel both of you in with the cables. Great. Everett kept hold of Bree's arm anyways. 
He didn't want to get separated just in case anything went wrong. He noticed she continued to keep his shirt sleeve in a stranglehold. Thanks. This is what we're trained to do. He gave them a big grin and spoke into a microphone. Two rescues secured. Bring us in. He grabbed one of the lines, and they were all pulled toward the boat. Once there, two men helped to haul them up into an inflatable boat with a motor. The wet soup man spoke into his mic again. Two rescues on red boat. Copy, came the reply. Heading to home boat, the man said. Copy that. The motor revved to life and they started flying through the waves. Everett put an arm around Bree as they huddled in the middle of the boat, shivering against the night air. Soon the motor was cut, and they drifted beside a much larger vessel. A ladder descended. The wetsuit guy went first, then Bree, then Everett. Up on deck, Everett and Bree were led to a cabin where sweats and towels were laid out. Showers right there. Use as little water as possible the man cautioned. He pulled off the hood of his wetsuit, and they could see his friendly face. Hot coffee is coming. Afterwards, the captain would like to see you. There'll be a man stationed outside the cabin, and he'll lead you to the captain. Thank you, Everett held out a hand. The man gave him a handshake. No problem. It was a fun drill. Tomlin, a man poked his head into the room. Captain wants to see you. I'm on it, Tomlin replied. He pointed to the man standing outside the door before he left. If you need anything else, ask that guy. Thank you. Bree's teeth were chattering. She looked forward to a hot shower and dry clothes. You go first, Everett insisted. Bree wasn't about to argue. She grabbed a couple of towels and a smaller set of clothing. It was a tiny space, but everything worked perfectly. It was amazing what money could do, she reflected. Without it, they would never have been able to get to the island, nor arrange for a clandestine pickup. Bree wondered how often it might have made her life a little easier in her job. Then again, it wasn't like she went after men like David Ramsley a lot. Mostly, she was a small time getting crooks off the city streets, not chasing men who would disappear at a moment's notice through connections and money. Bree slipped on the sweats, which were far too large for her. No one disappears, she reminded herself. Everyone leaves trails and traces. She just had to be good enough to find the traces and follow the trails. Flipping her hair out of her face, she wiped away the steam in the mirror. They had a lead. David was commissioning some guy to write his book. There was an intermediary between David and the ghostwriter. Once they found out who the intermediary was, they could find David. Bree would get her man. She cleaned up her wet clothes and towels, making way for Everett to use the small bathroom. Eyeing the shower, she wondered how well he was going to be able to tuck himself into the space. Shrugging, Bree decided there were times when being small was her advantage in this world. She used a comb to get rid of the tangles in her hair. As she brushed her hair, she relived the kiss that she and Everett had shared. Not the first almost kiss, but the real kiss. It had been very good. Truth was, it was probably the best kiss she ever had. There was something about Everett Ramsley. Bree sighed and put down the comb. He was just a guy who had hired her to do a job. So he thought she was attractive. A lot of guys did and Bree used that fact whenever necessary to help her do her job. Perhaps that was a little wrong, but since she was small in stature, Bree needed to use whatever she could to her advantage. Giving herself one last look in the mirror, Bree went out to find Everett chatting with the guy who was standing in the hall. Bree looked longingly at the bed. She hadn't had much of a sleep, and she admitted she enjoyed a good sleep. Shower is open. Good. Everett amicably ended his chat with the guy. Grabbing the clothes and towels, he went to the washroom. Bree smiled and gently closed the door on the guy. It might only be a fifteen-minute nap, but she was going to take it. Bree was gently shaken awake. Do you want to stay here or go see the captain with me? asked Everett. Bree really wanted to stay. Instead, she pulled herself up from the warm blankets. I'm coming. Did you learn anything at the house? 
questioned Everett as they followed the crewman along the small hallway. David is writing a book, Bree said wryly. I expect it's an autobiography of all his exploits over the years. That's why he's wanted to keep those files from his lawyer. It's data for the ghostwriter. Ghostwriter? frowned Everett. If he puts all this information in a book, he's going to look extremely guilty. I suspect it's him thumbing his nose at the world. Bree yawned. He's telling everyone what he did, how he got away with it, and how no one will ever catch him because he is so smart. At least, that's what he thinks. Wow. That takes some guts to do. Everett shook his head in amazement. Not really. More like he's bragging, shrugged Bree. He likes the attention. It must be killing him that he isn't currently calling the shots. That means he had to find control over something in his life and create a book glorifying his deeds as a balm to his ego. You sound like you've met him, Everett said dryly. That's exactly who he is. I like to analyze the people I hunt. The more I know about them, the more likely I will be to catch them, Bree informed Everett. It makes their behavior a little more predictable. Then it's a bit of a science, mused Everett, predicting patterns and behaviors. Absolutely, nodded Bree. She was glad he understood and was taking her seriously. Usually men of her acquaintance just thought it was cute that she thought she could take down the bad guys. They didn't have any confidence in her abilities. They approached the wheelhouse where the captain was having a cup of coffee. He had someone bring them each a cup after greeting them. That was an interesting mission. Normally we don't get much of a chance to do an ocean rescue. We appreciate your being available for picking us up. Everett happily sipped the coffee, glad to be warm and safe. The good news is we have a way of getting you home. The bad news is we have been tasked with a new mission. That means things are going to change a little. The captain pulled out a map. We'll be passing land here. Using the helicopter, we can drop you off near this town. If you call for a car service, you can get a ride at the nearest airport, which will be able to bring you wherever you need to go. You've been tasked with a new mission? frowned Bree. She thought they had hired the crew to be at their disposal for the day. We're not only for hire, we also obey the call of the government when necessary, the man smiled. In this case, that's what we're going to do. Obviously, I can't tell you anything more as a matter of national security. We understand and we appreciate that you're willing to help us out, Everett assured the captain. He had been on a helicopter ride before. As long as they are not going to parachute him out of the door, Everett was fine with that. Bree studied the map. It's not an international airport. This is going to put a little extra time on our agenda. Perhaps we could move things around a bit. What do you mean? asked Everett. One of David's wives lives here, Bree pointed. We might be able to get a direct flight to talk to her before going back to New York. That sounds like a good idea nodded Everett. You two are really going to find him, the captain asked, a little amused. We will find him, Bree was confident in her response. Then I wish you the best of luck, the captain replied. You have about three hours before we need to deploy the helicopter. I would suggest sleeping in the cabin that you've been assigned. We'll notify you when it's time to come on deck. Thank you again, nodded Everett. They followed the crewmen back to the room they had been in earlier. Everett pulled off the shoes he had been given and stretched out on the bed. I am so tired. I can't believe someone set up a booby trap and tranquilized me. I still can't believe you set off the tripwire when I warned you about it. Bree tossed off her shoes and took up her half of the bed, crawling under the covers. Although, to be fair, the guards might have had tranquilizer guns and just shot you. Better that than a real bullet. It was fun, though, he admitted, besides the being drugged part. Bree had to smile. She loved the rush that the chase gave her. Now tell me everything about what happened in that house and what I didn't see. Everett turned to her. Leaning towards him, she filled him in on meeting the mysterious ghostwriter and taking pictures of the documents on the desk. A couple of hours later, someone pounded on the door. The familiar voice of Tomlin called out to them. Rise and shine! Ten minutes until you need to be on deck. 
Everett groaned and rubbed his face. His arm was around Bree, and she was using him as a pillow. He shook her shoulder. Wake up. No, Bree snuggled closer. Comfortable. Too bad. You'll miss the helicopter ride, he warned her. I only hope they're not going to make us jump out of it. Bree sighed and pulled away from him. Chicken? Yup. Everett readily agreed. He was in no hurry to repeat the experience. Rubbing the sleep from his eyes, he sat up and went in search of his clothes, pack, and shoes. Bree did the same. Do you think they'll feed us breakfast before we go? Bree wondered. Coffee would be great. I think they're just going to dump us. Everett stretched and yawned. There was a knock at the door. Five minutes! Coming, Bree groused as she tied her shoes, then put her hair back in a bun. Everett pulled open the door, waiting for her. Tomlin was there in fatigues. He led the way to the deck, where a helicopter awaited them. Wait, it doesn't have any doors, Everett frowned. Nope, she's stripped down so that she'll have just enough fuel for the return flight to the ship, shouted Tomlin over the rotating blades of the helicopter. It's the bare necessities today. Everett wondered how he was going to like flying over the water and land in a machine that had no doors. Somehow, it made the experience feel a lot less secure. Tamping down any nervousness, he grasped Bree's arm as they made their way to the helicopter. Tomlin helped Bree up, waited for Everett, then joined them. He showed them how to buckle up, then stowed their gear securely. Putting on helmets, they could hear the chatter through the radio. Going up, Tomlin grinned as the machine began to take off. Chapter 8 Visiting Mrs. Hannah Ramsley was a bust, Bree declared to Marty as she came into the office. What happened? questioned Marty. She slammed the door in our faces, Everett said dryly, right after giving us a few choice words about David. I don't think we have to worry about her harboring my uncle. Bree crossed to the whiteboard, striking Hannah off their list. I have good news. Everything on the file for the drops cleared Robert. He wasn't involved in any of those illegal activities. However, as suspected, it does show amounts of money and the dates he laundered money through Ramsley Insurance, taking a cut and reinvesting that money into the company, Marty told them. Nothing we didn't already suspect. Everett grimaced. He knew that his father was guilty of the money laundering part. Dad said he was involved. He doesn't deny laundering the money. What is the bad news? Bree asked as she flopped into a chair. There was nothing of value on the files that you pulled from Crawford's computer. Marty leaned back, taking in their disappointed looks. Here, Bree tossed Marty her cell phone. I took some pictures of documents on a desk. Expand them and see what you can find. Marty happily plugged the device into his computer. So all we have is the fact that David has a ghostwriter writing his book and they speak through an intermediary, Everett said dampeningly. It's further than we were two days ago, Bree pointed out. Ghostwriter guy says he'll give up the name for a cool five million, but we don't know that's true. Five million? Marty choked out. Everett sighed. It wasn't that he wouldn't give up the money in a heartbeat if he actually thought it would help his dad, but Bree described the guy as shady. She didn't think he could be trusted. We will do it as a last resort, decided Everett. He hoped that they could find something that would lead them to David. It didn't look like they had much at the moment. What is next? We should interview the wife and the kids, suggested Bree. Which one's more likely to know where David is? Probably Michael and Anne, responded Everett. However, I would think that if any of them knew where David was, they would have told the FBI. Sometimes people know things that they think are not important. Bree got up and pulled a different cell phone out of a desk, stuffing it into a pocket. Or their memory needs to be jogged. It's always good to go over things with the nearest family members. Michael was closest to David. He worked with him at Ramsley Pharma for years, noted Everett. Max didn't have as much contact with David since they had a blow-up. Noah hasn't talked to David either for a while. 
Then the wife and Michael are the best bet, agreed Bree. Not sure we want to talk to Aunt Rachel, ever frowned at the thought. She's older and fragile. I don't want to see her upset. She looked pretty strong at that interview she gave on television when she denounced David to the entire nation, Bree said wryly. Everett decided to offer up a compromise. Let's talk to Anne and Michael first. If they think Aunt Rachel will be okay to talk to us, then we will do that. Okay, Bree agreed. It was his money funding the investigation. She would agree for now. However, if it became essential that they talk to Rachel Ramsley, Bree would make it happen. Everett pulled out his own cell phone to call Anne. Hey, Marty pointed to his screen. You might have something. Bree came to lean over top of his shoulder. What is it? A name and a phone number for a movie director? Marty zoomed in a little, then wrote the information down. Looks like David has optioned not only the book, but he's going to have a movie of his life. You're kidding me, snorted Bree. The guy knows no bounds. Thanks, Anne. We'll be there soon. Everett ended the call. What did you find? Your uncle might be trying to get a movie made about himself, Bree said dryly, handing over the name and phone number. Everett frowned as he eyed the name of the famous director. You're joking. Not a bit, Bree responded, taking the slip of paper back and putting it in her pocket. We need to follow this after we talk to Anne. Agreed, concurred Everett. He pulled out a set of keys. Shall we go? Bree nodded, heading out the door with Everett following. It was a long drive to the beach house. Everett and Bree spent the time discussing their next moves and what questions they should ask the couple. Anne greeted them at the door. Michael was dropping Amy off at a neighbor's house for a play date. She insisted that he be the one to take her. Amy's been a bit worried lately that her daddy might disappear if she isn't here to keep an eye on him. Fenley is looking after the babies at the moment, so we'll be able to talk uninterrupted. I'm sorry to intrude like this, Everett told her as she led them to the kitchen. I know you've talked to the FBI already, but we're trying to find out where David is in the hopes that it will help my dad's case with the FBI. Believe me, the sooner that man is found and put in jail, the sooner I will celebrate the fact. Anne pulled out some mugs. Coffee? Please, Bree perched on one of the stools. How long have you known David? Since I started work at Ramsley Pharmaceuticals, I was seventeen. Anne poured them each a cup, putting out cream and sugar. Thank you, Everett gratefully took the coffee. What is your impression of Mr. Ramsley? questioned Bree. Egotistical? Anne answered shortly. He's all about himself and thinks he can do anything. He's a master manipulator and blackmailed his own children to get what he wanted. David also made inappropriate passes at the women employees. Really? frowned Everett. Yes. Anne stirred her coffee. Bree remembered that Miss Everly had mentioned David was angry that Anne had not succumbed to his advances. He sounded like a complete scumbag. Who were his friends? I'm not sure that he had any, frowned Anne as she thought. It's more like he had colleagues and people who were too afraid to go against him. He's very powerful and has a lot of money. Was he currently having any affairs in the workplace? queried Bree. I don't know, shrugged Anne. I haven't worked at the company since Michael's surgery. It has been six years. Neither of us had had much contact with David since then. He wasn't pleased that Michael married me. So he cut off all contact? Everett was surprised. A lot of people had in-laws that they didn't like. That didn't mean they stopped talking to their children. Thankfully, yes, responded Anne. She took a stool sitting down at the large breakfast bar. I admit I don't like David at all. If I could think of where he might be, I would give him up in a heartbeat. He has been the poison in this family for too long. How are Noah and Max taking things? Bree sipped her coffee. Do they feel the same way about their father? If they knew anything, they would tell the FBI, Anne firmly told Bree. They used to have family loyalty to their dad. Now I think they realize exactly what kind of man he is 
and want him in prison where he belongs. The front door opened, and soon Michael joined them. Anne grabbed her husband a coffee while Everett, Bree, and he exchanged greetings. As they sat down again, Michael made a motion with his hands to Anne. Anne sighed, reaching out to take his hand. It's a phase. Once she sees that you're here all the time, Amy will slowly stop being so reluctant to let her out of your sight. I'm going through the same thing, too. Michael trailed a finger down his cheek and grimaced. Poor dear. Anne gave his hand a squeeze. I'm sure she'll be very happy to see you when you go and get her later today. Michael nodded, taking a sip of coffee. He looked expectantly at Everett and Bree. We were just talking about Uncle David, explained Everett. Michael nodded again. Bree realized this might be a little difficult. She hoped Anne was up to interpreting whatever Michael said. Do you have any ideas where your dad might be? Bree asked the obvious question. Michael regretfully shook his head. He gestured something to Anne, and she reached over for a folder that was on the kitchen counter. We put together a folder of everything Michael had dug up on David over the years. It's not much, warned Anne. Some of it's a little shocking, so we would appreciate you keeping it to yourselves as much as possible. We hope that it will help you find him. Thank you. Bree was grateful they were being so cooperative. Then again, it didn't seem like anyone much like David. Everett skimmed through the contents of the file, looking for anything they didn't already know. Then you knew that David had affairs. Michael nodded. Numerous affairs and numerous offspring, Anne confirmed dryly. Did you know he had other wives? Everett pulled his gaze away from the file to see Michael and Anne's shocked faces. Other wives? How is that possible? Anne wanted to know. How many? At least three that we know of, mentioned Everett. Bree kicked him on the leg. They were supposed to be asking questions, not giving information away. Disrupting the flow of conversation could mean that they might miss out on an important detail. Are they still married to him? Anne voiced Michael's question. Yes. Everett gave Bree a wry look. David's currently married to multiple women. Poor Rachel. Anne shook her head in amazement. Michael scowled and did a complicated series of hand movements. It wasn't exactly sign language, Bree knew. Some of it was, but some of it wasn't. Who is the first wife? asked Anne. Is Rachel's marriage the legal one? No, Bree said regretfully. She hesitated, not wanting to tell them, but not seeing how she could get out of it now that Everett had steered the conversation in this direction. So far, a woman named Margaret Colburn has the honor of being married to David first. Their marriage was registered in Atlantic City two years before David married Rachel. We've barely scratched the surface on this. I expect there may be more women believing they are legally married to David. Michael leaned back and wiped a hand over his face, trying to absorb the news. What a nightmare, breathed Anne. Michael abruptly stood, walking out of the kitchen. Anne watched him go with trepidation. I'm just going to see if he's okay. Bree and Everett watched as Anne hurried after her husband. You shouldn't have told them, quietly said Bree. The purpose of today was to get information from them without upsetting anyone too much. Now she will have to calm him down. They might call an end to our interview, and then we're not left being any further ahead. He needed to know. Everett's voice was full of sympathy. I would want to know if Dad had done that to my family. I'm not saying they didn't have the right to know. Bree was reasonable. I'm saying that it could have waited for another day. Michael and Anne returned, Michael carrying an envelope that he tossed down on the breakfast bar. What is this? Everett pulled out a sheaf of papers from the envelope, perusing them. I'm not sure, Anne replied, a little confused as Michael took his seat again. She poured out more coffee, waiting to see what Everett would say about the paperwork. Everett sucked in a breath. Shaking his head in amazement, he handed the papers to Bree. 
I can't believe he would do that. Do what? Anne wanted to know. Bree frowned over the papers. It was David's will stating that the bulk of his wealth was to be transferred upon his death to his firstborn legitimate child. That would be a complete circus. Everett was still gobsmacked. David would have to make everyone scramble to find out who his real heir was once he died. By putting that wording in, firstborn, legitimate child, his estate could be in limbo for years. Bree handed Anne the will, which she looked over. Does that mean that Janet Colburn is David's heir? wondered Anne. She's listed as a child on the birth certificates, noted Bree. As I said, we don't know for sure that Margaret Colburn is in fact the first wife, making her marriage the legal one. All we know is that Rachel's marriage to David isn't legal, since he never obtained a divorce from Margot. This is crazy, Anne set aside the will. We don't care about the money. Michael and I will be more than okay without it. What I'm worried about is how Rachel's going to take this news and what it means for her financially as she seeks financial support from David. Surely she'll be awarded something after all these years with David, frowned Everett. Bree wondered if Rachel would get anything. Even if a court did decide to award her alimony, or something similar for being with David all these years, how was she supposed to get the money from him? All of David's legitimate assets were frozen. Bree decided to get back to the matter at hand. Did David have any favorite vacation spots? Some place where he went to be alone? Michael shook his head negatively. He didn't recall any. David traveled extensively, Anne commented dryly. He said it was for business, but we've come to the conclusion that it was to visit his girlfriends as well. Everything we have on them is in the file if you would like to follow up with them. Thank you, responded Bree. Do you have a full list of any properties he owned? It's in the file as well, nodded Anne. When you were a child, was there ever a time where David brought you somewhere without your mom that seemed a little off? A cabin, a house, an apartment? Some place that you normally didn't go. Some place you have not been to since, questioned Bree to Michael. You might have been bored with not much to do. David would have left you there alone for periods of time. When he came back, you would have done activities together, someplace without your mom. Can you remember anywhere like that? Michael thought about it. He gave a slow nod. Where? Bree leaned forward, knowing that this might be the break that they were looking for. Michael frowned. He gestured helplessly with his hands. He can't verbalize the address, even if he knew. Anne said softly. But there was some place, pressed Bree. Michael nodded. He tried to communicate to Anne. An apartment, I think? It was in the city. Anne was confused. I'm not sure what you mean. Michael tried again, and Anne just shook her head. He gave a frustrated sigh, tried to say something, and grimaced. It's okay, Michael. Everett was disappointed but didn't want his cousin to feel bad about not being able to tell them the information. Getting up, Michael went to the study. Returning with a pencil and blank paper, he began sketching. A few minutes later, they had a credible sketch of the interior of an apartment. A small boy with a book was sitting on a chair near the patio. That would be you, Anne pointed to the figure. Michael nodded. He grabbed another sheet, sketching again. This time, a high-rise building emerged from his confident hand. It was starting to look familiar to Bree. Was anyone else there? Michael shrugged. He didn't remember. Bree had a sinking feeling about this, noticing the rooftop terrace in the patio doors of the picture he had drawn. She would like to think that no father would bring his young son along when visiting his mistress, but it appeared that David had no morals. Grabbing another piece of paper, Michael began sketching a face. Who is that? queried Anne. Uncle Oscar, remarked Everett. Michael put a question mark on the paper, looking to Anne. You should ask Oscar about it, interpreted Anne. He knows more. Thank you. 
Bree took the first two sketches. We certainly will. If you remember anything else, please let us know. Michael nodded, wrapping an arm around Anne. Are you close to getting him? asked Anne. Bree smiled. Don't worry. I always get the man that I pursue. When could you get me an appointment to speak to him? Bree asked crossly. The woman was a gargoyle guardian of a personal assistant. She wasn't about to let Bree talk to her boss, and they both knew it. Bree had the feeling she wasn't even going to pass on Bree's contact information to the film director. I see. Bree hung up the phone, annoyed. She handed the paper that Marty had given them to Everett. Your turn to try. Everett dialed the number, asking to speak to the famous film director. He explained who he was and that he had heard the man was going to work on his uncle's movie. Everett smiled, pleasantly talking into the phone, then waiting. I'm on hold. You're kidding me, scowled Bree as she got out into the car, unlocking the door so he could get in. Mr. Big Name Director is going to be bothered to talk to you? There are advantages to being a Ramsley, confided Everett. Bree pulled out into traffic heading toward the downtown buildings that housed the offices of Oscar Ramsley. They had decided to simply drop in on Everett's uncle to see what they could learn from the man. Everett chatted amicably to the film director, discussing all sorts of things before finally getting down to business. I heard that you might be working on a film about my uncle. Bree shamelessly eavesdropped as she traversed traffic. She wished Everett would put the phone on speaker but wasn't about to distract him. Is that so? Everett chuckled as though amused. The irritated look on his face said otherwise. Uncle David is such a joker. Snagged in the backlog of downtown traffic, Bree waited for the light to change color. They were just a block from Oscar's building. Everett shifted, taking out his wallet. Automatically, he handed her his credit card for the parking garage. Bree had to smile. She was getting him trained. She was going to miss him when David was caught, and Everett had no reason to hang around any more, she realized. It had been kind of fun having someone to share the adventure of hunting with. Not that Marty wasn't great, but he didn't venture out of the office. He was solely there for research and assistance with technology. Since Bree spent most of her time on the streets, or in the car, chasing down suspects, she was generally alone. Having Everett by her side had been good company. Bree shook the thought out of her head, paying attention to traffic as it started moving again. They barely knew each other, she admonished herself. Pulling into a spot in the parking garage, she waited while Everett ended the call. Thanks again, said Everett. I appreciate it. We'll get together for lunch sometime. He made a face as he slipped his phone back into his pocket. Well? Bree raised an eyebrow. He said he was doing a film. Everett shook his head in amazement. I can't believe David. He's making sure he goes out with a bang, trying to create a devoted following. Do you know my uncle has a GoFundMe page? A kind of stick-it-to-the-man movement that advocates doing what you want, no holds barred, rather than what society expects of you. It's crazy. Did the guy say anything about how to get a hold of David? Bree cut to the chase. All that other stuff was interesting, but not necessarily relevant, unless Marty could trace where the money was going. She texted Marty quickly to get him to look into it. He goes through the same guy as the ghostwriter. Everett met Bree's eyes. He says it's my Uncle Oscar. Then it's a good thing that we're about to go talk to him. Bree got out of the car. She waited for Everett to catch up as they went to the elevators. I like Oscar, Everett told her. He's my favorite uncle. He was always game to do fun things with my cousins and I when we were boys. He is the youngest of the four brothers, right? Bree asked as they made their way to the lobby. He is, Everett affirmed. I hate that he might be involved in all this. Bree had the sneaking suspicion that all four brothers were involved to some degree. How far each of them was invested in David's crimes was yet to be seen. Excuse us, Everett smiled at the receptionist. 
I'd like to surprise my Uncle Oscar with a visit. My girlfriend and I were hoping to take him out to brunch. I'm Everett Ramsley. How thoughtful, she smiled prettily, tucking a piece of blonde hair behind her ear, completely ignoring Bree. I will just call his secretary, if you'd like to have a seat, Mr. Ramsley. Thank you. Everett stunned her with another perfect smile before putting his hand on the small of Bree's back and escorting her to the lounge area. Girlfriend? Bree shot him an amused look. Sure, shrugged Everett. Better than saying bounty hunter. Bree was a little disappointed and struggled not to show it. Really, she needed to get Everett Ramsley out of her system. The sooner she found David, the sooner that could happen. She sat on the couch, grabbing a magazine. Plus, I might want to make it the truth. He leaned down to confide in her ear as he sat down beside her. Maybe go out on a few dates and see where this leads. Really? Bree winced at the breathless enthusiasm in her voice. She was never overeager when it came to the other men she had dated. Really, confirmed Everett. He put an arm around the back of the couch, sliding closer to her. I do like you, Bree. You already told me that, grinned Bree. When? frowned Everett, trying to remember. When you gave me that sloppy kiss on the beach and fell over? Bree giggled at the memory. I was hoping I dreamt that. Everett responded ruefully. Not my finest moment. No, Bree laid a hand on his cheek. But one I will cherish. Then it's okay smiled Everett. Everett, to what do I owe the pleasure? Oscar Ramsley beamed as he came forward. Who is this lovely young lady with you? Bree, meet my uncle. Everett stood, helping Bree to her feet. Uncle Oscar, this is Bree Henson. Beautiful. Oscar gave Bree a chaste kiss on the cheek. You have outdone yourself, Everett. Bree gave a non-committal murmur as she eyed Everett's uncle. It was easy to see the family resemblance between the two. Oscar was trim and gray in his low seventies. He dressed very neatly and had an open countenance. Thank you, Everett said dryly, enduring the praise. Someone said something about going to brunch? Oscar looked at them hopefully. That is my most favorite meal of the day. Plus, anything that gets me out of work is fully appreciated. Bree could not help an answering smile. Everett was right. Oscar was very likable. We hoped that you would be available, Everett told his uncle. It has been a while since you and I talked. Oscar rubbed his hands together. Then let's go. Oscar had a limo waiting for them. Soon enough, they were being led past a line of people at a popular restaurant. It's always good to have a standing reservation. Oscar winked at Bree as they were seated. Bree hoped the man wasn't trying to flirt with her, especially since she had been introduced as Everett's girlfriend. She wondered at the privilege of the Ramsley family. Everett is one of my favorite nephews, Oscar said jovially. Bree had the feeling he would say that about all his nephews. You should have met the boys when they were younger. What a regular lot of thrill-seekers they were. Scuba diving, skydiving, snowboarding on the mountains, they did it all. I didn't do the skydiving, clarified Everett. I hated heights. When the group went free-climbing cliffs, I chose to decline. Anything else, I was pretty much game for. How many of your boys did that? Oscar smiled as he reminisced. It was you, your brother Dylan, Maxwell, Gabe, Mike Garrett, and Marshall. Nate sometimes came as well. Everett reminded him. Ah, Nate, that boy got into some scrapes. Oscar responded fondly. Michael used to teach us how to sail, remembered Everett. He had a knack for it, and when the others went on adventures involving falling out of the sky, Everett had sometimes visited Michael for extra lessons. Shame what happened to Michael, Oscar sobered, taking a sip of water. You mean losing his ability to talk properly, or being in prison for the past couple of months? Sweetly asked Bree, in a slightly dopey way, hoping Oscar would not be too offended by her query. Both, I suppose, the man answered. 
I was wondering if we could talk to you about Uncle David, Everett said mildly. Oscar looked at them sharply. That depends on what you want to talk about regarding my brother. He's in a bit of a scrape at the moment. That was the understatement of the year, Bree thought. He is at the center of an FBI investigation. Oscar gave them both a tight smile. That may be, however he is family. He's a detriment to our family, Everett noted dryly. Did you know he's writing a book? Selling the movie rights? He wants to brag to the world about his lifestyle. How he ran drugs, laundered money through the companies, had multiple affairs and children. By the time this gets done, he is going to drag the Ramsley name through the proverbial mud. You think the tabloids are having a field day now? Wait until David is done. He has detailed accounts of everything. Bree watched Oscar's reaction. Dates, amounts of cash, times, accounts, people involved. He's giving the movie producers and ghostwriter every sordid detail. Oscar paled. It can't be that bad. If you had any business dealings with David that could implicate you in his crimes, it's more than that bad, Bree told him firmly. The FBI could charge you with anything that David implicates you with. At the very least, they'll turn your life upside down while they investigate. I'm not in that deep, Oscar defended himself. I didn't do anything illegal. However, Dad did, declared Everett. David did. You're saying you didn't, but did Uncle James? I could not say, responded a grumpy Oscar. You may not have done anything illegal, Breen noted the turn of phrase. However, if you saw anything illegal or knew about it, you're considered an accessory to the crime. You'll be charged as well. What Everett didn't mention is that I'm a bounty hunter. We're looking for David. If we find him first, the FBI may help with getting a plea deal for Robert to help reduce his time in prison. You know that Robert's health isn't the best. Oscar blotted his sweaty forehead with a napkin. It was obvious the man had a very poor poker face. What do you know, Uncle Oscar? Pressed Everett. Look. We were young. We thought we were immune from everything, confided Oscar. David was my oldest brother. I was happy to be included in his group. I didn't realize until it was too late what was really going on. Everett and Bree waited for him to continue. I was never involved in the drug thing, Oscar told them. I did run some money through the hotel chain as a favor to David. It wasn't a big deal. I thought it was totally legitimate at the time. We used to go out and party a lot. There was always pretty girls. David played fast and loose with a lot of women. He'd even marry them sometimes. I always thought he got a divorce before moving on to the next woman. It wasn't until he married someone after Rachel that I realized he wasn't doing that. I confronted him and he told me to mind my own business. You knew that he was in multiple marriages at the same time, Everett said in disgust. I did confirmed Oscar. I kept quiet about the whole thing. I figured David could handle it. You laundered money through your company as well. Bree shook her head, setting down her mug of coffee. It was legal money, protested Oscar. It had to be. I would never do anything illegal. It wasn't legal, and you know it, Everett cut in, disappointed with the man. You need to turn yourself into the FBI before they figure it out for themselves and come to put you in prison. I can't go to prison, scowled Oscar. I'm an old man. What would Mary say? She would be so angry with me. Maybe you should have thought what Aunt Mary might think before you blindly took David's money and put it through Ramsley Hotels. Everett pushed away his half-eaten brunch. He wasn't hungry anymore. Do you know where David is? asked Bree. I'm not sure. Oscar evaded their eyes, looking elsewhere in the restaurant. We have heard that you're the middleman between David and the movie deal that he's making, revealed Bree. Oscar sighed heavily. David said that if he made a book and a movie deal, he would turn himself in. I thought it was for the best to help him. I never believed that anyone would actually want to make a book or a film about his exploits. 
nor did I think that he would be giving them real data. He made it sound like he would be vague about any details, so none of us would be implicated with him. He lied, Everett stated baldly. He does that a lot. Where is he? Bree pursued their goal. I don't know, shrugged Oscar. Don't lie to us. Everett had an edge to his tone. I'm not lying, Oscar defended himself. Not exactly. I don't know where he is. You have an idea, though, suggested Bree. I could be wrong. Oscar slumped in his chair. If David ever finds out what I told you... He won't, Everett assured him. We won't say a word of where we got the information from. Grabbing a napkin, Oscar pulled out a pen out of his pocket and hastily scribbled down an address. Here, that's the best I can do. Thank you, said Bree as Everett tucked the napkin in his pocket. You still need to talk to the FBI and get your involvement in David's crime sorted out advised Everett. It will come for you later if you don't, and it will go harder for you. Oscar grimaced. I always knew deep down it would come to this. David thought he could get away with everything. I will consult with my lawyers this afternoon to figure out what I should do. Good. Everett stood, holding out a hand to help Bree up. We are going to find Uncle David and bring him to justice. Chapter 9 Bree grabbed a donut out of the box. Marty can run the address, and then we'll see you exactly and how we might want to approach the property. What about those two sketches Michael gave us? Should we have showed them to Oscar? Everett regretted that he had forgotten entirely about them when they had confronted his uncle. He was now driving Bree's car as she happily ate a sour cream glazed donut. That was Miss Everly's apartment. Bree licked her lips. What kind of scum of a father brings his young son to his mistress's house? Everett digested that for a moment. Are you sure? Pretty sure, Bree said dryly. Perhaps we should go up and see Miss Everly again to be certain she isn't hiding him. Everett pulled into a parking spot. I agree that she remains on the list, nodded Bree, getting out of the car. First, we should check the address that Oscar gave us. Everett caught up, getting the door for Bree since she was carrying the donuts. He had a tray of coffees and iced drinks in his hand. Marty smiled in delight when he spotted the food. How did you know? Iced coffee for you. Bree handed over the drink as Marty and Everett raided the donut box. We have an address I would like for you to pull up. Everett pulled the napkin Oscar had written on out of his pocket, giving it to Marty. Marty frowned as he typed it into the computer. It looks familiar. Bree's cell phone rang, so she answered it. Henson Investigations. If you give Crawford back what you took from him and drop the case, you will be all right. A silky smooth voice said in her ear. Bree stood still a moment then slapped Marty on the shoulder, winding her hand and pointing to her phone. Marty immediately clued into what Bree wanted, excitedly tapping away at his computer to get a program to run. Excuse me? I didn't quite hear you. You heard me perfectly, the man said. Quit hanging around with Everett. Give Crawford back what is his. And if I choose not to? Bree watched as Marty raced his fingers across the keys of his computer. Then something very bad might happen. The voice was pleasant as it threatened. He hung up on her. Bree grimaced. I'm sorry, Marty shook his head. He wasn't on the phone long enough to get a trace on his location. You can do that? Everett looked at Marty in surprise. I thought only the police were allowed to do that. Perhaps, shrugged Marty. Bree growled in frustration. David wants us to quit. He'd also like his files returned to Crawford. Then we must be getting close. Everett was excited by the thought. He's feeling uncomfortable enough to try to convince us to stop. What exactly did he say? Just that something bad might happen if I continued. Bree rolled her eyes. 
how dramatic and vague. Everett frowned. He didn't want Bree to get hurt, and David was a vindictive man. He had thrown his own son in prison. While Everett was okay with taking on any risk to himself, he wasn't okay with that risk being transferred to Bree. You had better not get all protective on me. Bree narrowed her eyes at Everett. I'm not dropping this case. I still have a couple of days left to prove to you that I can get David. I wasn't going to suggest you drop the case, Everett hastily replied. He knew she was touchy about men trying to protect her. I know your job is dangerous, and no doubt you're always going to face some element of risk. I'm just thinking that it might be best if I make sure I stay by you, just in case. And what do you think you're going to do that I can't? Bree asked Riley, crossing her arms. That is a no-win question, Marty pointed out as he munched on a jelly-filled donut, watching the pair square off. Don't go there if you value your life. Marty, Bree huffed at him. I'm not saying that I'm going to do anything more than you can. You are the trained bounty hunter, Everett told her. He tried to keep a calm tone as he explained his reasoning. What I'm saying is that it's better to have both of us on the lookout for any retribution that Uncle David might try. I suppose that makes sense, Bree reluctantly allowed. At least he wasn't trying to tie her up in bubble wrap and forbid her from doing anything dangerous. Besides Kepler, he was the first boyfriend to do that. He was her boyfriend. Potentially. At least he said he wanted to make her his girlfriend and that he liked her. Bree mentally hugged the words to herself, pleased by the progress in their relationship. That address is for the mistress that you already visited, Marty announced as the computer showed the results. Really? Bree came to the computer, looking at the map that Marty had pulled up. She was disappointed. Another dead end. Unless she really is hiding David, Everett pointed out. Did you get to explore the entire apartment? No. Bree frowned as she thought back to her time with Miss Everly. I didn't see any signs of another person living there, but then again, it was all very neat and tidy. It would be pretty brazen, talking to me while the guy I'm hunting is watching television in the next bedroom. Maybe that's why she didn't want me to come with you. With two of us, one could distract her while the other person explored, suggested Everett. We need to check out that apartment. Agreed, nodded Bree. Now she was annoyed that Miss Everly might have been hiding David all along in the lap of luxury right under their noses. First, I think we should do a little surveillance if we can. Maybe we can get some pictures of David swimming in the rooftop pool. And if we can get that, we can talk to Kepler, Everett said in satisfaction. How do we go about surveilling the place? Well... We use your riches to rent a place in the building across and break out the high-powered binoculars. Bree tapped Marty on the shoulder. Anything for rent or sale in the area that we can exploit? Directly in line of sight to Miss Everly's? I'll check. Marty started sorting through realtor ads. Great. Bree grabbed another donut. I think we should give Crawford back his file. We have all the information copied already. It wouldn't be a big deal to give back the original. It also gives us a chance to directly confront him about what he may know about David. Sounds good. Everett grabbed another donut as well. I will be a moment. Bree headed to the washroom. You are sunk. Marty eyed Everett with some amusement as the man watched Bree walk away. I told you, but you wouldn't listen. You've fallen for her. I admit that I like her. Everett was unconcerned. She likes me, too. That is what they all say. Marty leaned back in his chair, observing Everett. Everett didn't like the sound of that. Well, she agreed to go out with me. Does she do that with the other guys? Marty blinked in surprise. No, that is new. She's not seriously dated anyone since Kepler. She dated Agent Kepler? Everett scowled. Suddenly, he disliked the man even more. He is a jerk. That's what I said, Marty told him with a dry tone. No one much likes Bill Kepler. How could she date that pompous cretin? 
wondered Everett. Just one look into Kepler's eyes had him shuddering with dislike. It didn't help that Kepler's personality matched his icy gaze. She has bad taste, Marty studied Everett. Hey! Everett frowned at Marty, wondering if the assistant was lumping him in with that statement. That isn't very fair. It's true. We'll see how you treat her. Marty folded his arms. I'll be here with the ice cream when you two break it off. You aren't crushing on your boss, are you? Everett hoped that wasn't the case. This scrawny kid had no chance with Bree. Anyone could see that. No, I have a girlfriend, Marty informed him. I just know a rich guy playboy when I see one. You aren't the type to stick around. This time will be different, Everett told Marty. He didn't know why he was having this conversation with the guy. Marty didn't know him. Sure, Everett hadn't had many serious relationships. When a woman started hinting about rings, it was time to go, in his opinion. Nor did he want any kids. Yet, Bree was different. He really did like her and wanted to see where their future might go. We're just starting to date. It's not like I need to declare my intentions. What are your intentions? persisted Marty, cocking his head to the side as he regarded Everett with a steady gaze. Bree doesn't have anyone to look after her, so I've taken her on, like a sister. I'm glad you're doing that, allowed Everett. However, like I said, we've just started dating. You might be among one of the most expensive group of men in this country, Marty warned him. That won't help you if you make her cry. I promise I will drain all your bank accounts faster than the IRS. Everett didn't think that was necessarily an idle threat. He kind of respected the nerd more for it. I won't worry about that since I have no intentions of making Bree cry. Who is going to make me cry? Bree crept up on them, curious about the tension between the pair. She crossed her arms as both men fell stubbornly silent. Someone had better tell me. I have a rental property. Marty printed off a page and handed it to Bree. You have an appointment with the realtor to view the property in half an hour, so you'd better get over there. This isn't over, Bree warned Marty, snatching the sheet. Come on, Everett, you can explain in the car. Everett grimaced and obediently followed Bree. You are drill sergeant. Yes, I am, readily agreed Bree. Now tell me what you and Marty were talking about. You? Everett allowed. Marty was just making sure I understood that he cares about you and he doesn't want to see you get hurt. That is nice of him, Bree commented, grabbing a parking ticket from her windshield. However, I can take care of myself. While I agree that it's entirely true, wouldn't it be nice to have someone take care of you once in a while? Everett asked as they got into the vehicle. He took the ticket that she handed to him, automatically putting it in the glove compartment with the rest. Just because they want to? Bree thought about it. If that's their only motive. It is. Everett reached over to take Bree's hand. Marty is concerned. I get it. I haven't exactly been the type of guy who commits easily. I have no doubt he looked up my dating history via the tabloids. I admit, I'm not usually a relationship kind of guy, but I want to try with you. Bree contemplated him. That is about where I am, too. This is just beginning. Right now, we don't have to put any labels or boundaries on it. Except for girlfriend. Everett leaned over to give her a kiss. I would like to use that label for you. That is acceptable. Bree replied against his lips, kissing him back. He was a magnificent kisser. Losing herself in the moment, she ignored the outside world until the windshield wiper was snapped down, another ticket placed under it. Hey! Everett blinked, wondering why Bree was so upset as he recovered from the intoxicating kiss. She ripped open her door, chasing down the meter cop. Hey! yelled Bree. I just had a ticket. You can't give me another one. I didn't see any ticket the cop noted. Plus, you gave me more than enough time to write you one while you were busy kissing your boyfriend. 
What I was doing with my boyfriend is none of your concern, Bree said hotly. I have a ticket. I had just removed it from my windshield and was going to drive away. You can't double ticket me. Everett quickly pulled out the pile of paperwork from the glove compartment, looking for the ticket with today's date. There were so many that some of them fell to the floor. Everett tried to sort through them as quickly as he could. I saw no ticket, said the annoyed cop. If you'd left your ticket on the window while you were making out, I wouldn't have written you one. Here's the ticket. Everett stuffed the others into the glove box. Bree ran over, snagging it from him. See, here it is. The cop looked it over. That's nice. Again, if you'd left it on the windshield, I would have passed your vehicle by. You didn't. You were continuing to occupy the broken meter space. Therefore, you got a new ticket. Is there anything I can do? asked Bree. Don't park here, the meter cop told her dryly. Pay your tickets before the city decides to impound your car. Good day. Bree's shoulders slumped as she watched the cop walk away. She returned to the car, handing Everett the ticket. That was annoying. Just how many tickets do you have? Everett began counting the slips of paper. Too many. Bree rolled her eyes. Don't worry, Marty will go in to pay them by the 15th. He does that each month. Each month? Everett looked at her in astonishment. There must be twenty tickets here. How can you get that many tickets in one month? I'm lucky like that, shrugged Bree, clipping her seatbelt on before pulling out into traffic. We're late for the realtor. Everett stuffed the papers back in the glove box, shutting the door. He could not believe that she did business this way. He was going to have to make sure things got taken care of. His sympathies lay with Marty on this one. Everett wondered if the guy was doing her bookwork, because if this was an indication of Bree's finances, they were a mess. Bree pulled up to the pay parking lot, and Everett handed her his credit card. After she was done, he stuffed it back into his wallet. Bree parked and popped the trunk, grabbing a pair of obscenely large binoculars. How are we going to explain those to the realtor? Everett looked at them with doubt. I'm an avid bird watcher, Bree smiled cheekily. I simply must know if there's any nest nearby. I guess that works. He wasn't surprised by her ingenuity. Everett had the feeling it was her prime weapon in her arsenal. Two hours later, Bree and he had convinced the realtor that they were moving in together and wanted to temporarily rent the apartment as it was absolutely perfect in every way. Bree had trilled on about seeing a bald eagle nest on a nearby building, and Everett knew that his pocketbook was about to take a hit. Not that he was that worried. The place came fully furnished, which was a bonus. Everett signed the paperwork, and the realtor promised to give them a set of keys by the next day. That was easy. Bree remarked as they made their way to see Crawford with the USB drive that they had temporarily borrowed from him. Do you really think David is at Miss Everly's apartment? wondered Everett. It makes sense. He feels comfortable there. It's familiar, Bree explained. It's a thing with people. We always seem to return to what is familiar to us. That's how I catch most of my criminals. Are people really that predictable then? Everett was curious. Generally, yes, Bree pulled up to Crawford's house. Can you predict me? asked a curious Everett. Sometimes, smiled Bree. However, we're still getting to know each other. Give it a little more time. Everett followed Bree up to the house. She laid on the doorbell, letting it continuously ring. Everett watched her, amused. A maid answered. Hello? Hi. Bree smiled prettily. We would like to talk to Mr. Crawford. Tell him Aubrey Henson and Everett Ramsley are here to see him. Would you like to wait in the foyer? She asked. Mr. Crawford has been expecting you. Wonderful. Bree preceded Everett into the house. They didn't have long to wait before Crawford came into the foyer. Mr. Ramsley, Miss Henson, how nice to see you both. Crawford? Everett shook the man's hand. Pleased to see you. Bree smiled, pulling the USB stick out of her pocket and handing it forward. 
At the last moment, she pulled it back. You wouldn't be so kind as to tell us where David Ramsley is, would you? I'm afraid I don't know. Crawford fixed a smile firmly in place, trying to mask his annoyance. If I did, I would have let the FBI know. Yet you are tasked with moving the information on to the next person. Bree raised an eyebrow. And you expected us today. Why is that? Excuse me? frowned Crawford. Who said I was expecting you? Your maid? Everett commented dryly. Cut the bowl and just tell us how deep you are in David's schemes. Crawford scowled. All I'm supposed to do is pass on the USB sticks to a colleague. That is it. Do you know what is on it? asked Bree. That is none of my business, Crawford said curtly. Look, I was told that you would be dropping off the data stick today. That is all I know. David is too wily to get caught. You should give up. That isn't going to happen, Everett responded. He wrapped his arm around Bree. We are going to track him down even if it takes every last penny that I have. Here is the stick. Bree tossed it to Crawford. We already have downloaded the contents and intend to give it to the FBI. If I were you, I would be expecting a knock on your door, Crawford, bluffed Everett. What is on that stick is pretty incriminating. I didn't do anything. Crawford's brows lowered in a frown. That isn't what the stick says, shrugged an unconcerned Bree. We should go. Everett pulled Bree toward the door. Good luck. They left the confused man staring at the USB as they exited the house. Waiting until they were in the car, Bree and Everett grinned at each other. You did very well, Bree complimented him. Thank you. Everett gave her a quick kiss. Do you think it will work? He will be popping that stick into his computer in no time, predicted Bree. When he does, Marty will have access to all his systems. Everett wasn't going to squabble over the legalities of this. Crawford and David were not playing by the rules either. Bree started the car. We need to get a good night's sleep, and then tomorrow we're moving into the apartment. Marty will have all the gear we need to get good pictures. He'll track down what Crawford is up to, and hopefully we'll get another lead. Hopefully we spot David. Everett leaned back, enjoying the ride. Maybe we could grab dinner. Bree's cell phone went off. She went to answer it, and Everett grabbed it from her. You are not answering this while you're driving, admonished Everett. Hello? A voice came from the cell phone. Yes? Everett put the phone to his ear. Who is this? A voice demanded. Everett Ramsley, who is this? Everett returned the question. Kepler, I want to speak to Bree. His voice was decidedly icy. Great, one minute. Everett muffled the phone against his shoulder. Kepler wants to speak to you. I doubt he'll let me put him on speaker, so you're going to need to pull over. Bree pulled the car into a parking lot. She killed the engine and grabbed the phone. Bill, this had better be important. Everett tried to eavesdrop the best that he could. Marty had said that Kepler was Bree's ex-boyfriend but had not mentioned that they were still in contact with each other. He tried to tamp down a small niggle of jealousy. After all, she was no longer with the guy, Everett reassured himself. When? Bree looked at her watch. That will be cutting it close. Everett wished he could have put the phone on speaker. The problem was phones tended to echo, and then Kepler would know that Everett was listening in. Okay, see you then. Bree assured the man before hanging up. I'm going to have to take a rain check on dinner. What is going on? questioned Everett. I have a date with Kepler, sighed Bree. Excuse me? Everett was confused. When I asked to date you, I did mean exclusively. Should I have been more clear on that? Bree gave him a wan smile. I'm not dating Kepler. I just go to dinner with him once in a while, put on a good show, and he gives me information on whatever case I happen to be working on. It's a good arrangement. One I don't really like, frowned Everett. What do you mean, put on a good show? Kepler likes to have his colleagues see him go out with a pretty girl once in a while. It builds his reputation. Bree rolled her eyes. 
I go, I simper, he pays for my dinner, and usually we go up to his hotel room, where we talk business and I get whatever information I need. Why not get a real girlfriend? Everett was curious. Because he doesn't like entanglements? Shrugged Bree. She wasn't going to explain further. Phil had confided in her, and she wasn't going to break his confidence. It works for both of us. How is it going to work when you end up in the tabloids? Everett raised an eyebrow. What do you mean? Frowned Bree. Why would I be in the tabloids? You are dating me? All Ramsleys end up in the tabloids, Everett said dryly. That's what happens when you're rich. I suppose my dinners with Kepler would be at an end, concluded Bree with some regret. That is unfortunate. He's been very helpful as a source. Is he taking you out to dinner tonight? Everett took her hand. Yes. Bree ignored him, puzzling it out in her mind. I wonder what he wants to talk about. Only one way to find out. Everett didn't like it, but he supposed he trusted Bree. They had made it this far, and she had followed through on everything she had promised. Hopefully he wants to cut a deal for David and my dad. That is the goal. Bree gave his hand a squeeze and started the car. Bree waited at the bar, sipping her ice water as she waited for Kepler. She had just made it on time, this time sporting a navy number that dipped dangerously low on her cleavage. Paired with the same clutch and shawl, she looked stunning as always. The hotel restaurant was crowded. Kepler approached, and Bree gave the FBI agent a smile. Good evening, Bill. Bree allowed him to kiss her cheek. He took her hand, helping her off the stool. You look beautiful as always. Kepler tucked her hand in his arm and escorted her into the restaurant. The waiter immediately led them to their table. I'm so glad you asked me to come. Bree let him seat her. It has been a busy day, and I'm looking forward to a nice meal. I'm glad I could provide it. Kepler set aside their menus. They chatted about nothing much until dinner was served. We had an interesting development in the case today. What is that? Bree was a little confused. Usually Kepler wanted to talk business after they hit the hotel room, never at dinner. After you and Everett Ramsley were seen with Oscar Ramsley, Oscar immediately went home, packed a bag, went to the nearest airport and tried to skip out of the country. Kepler pinned her with his icy blue eyes. Care to explain? You have Oscar under surveillance? guessed Bree. Everett and Oscar. Kepler steepled his fingers, ignoring his meal as he studied her. I want to know what happened during your conversation at brunch today. Bree decided to go with the truth. She knew Kepler would just find out about it anyways. We gained proof of the drug drops and money laundering. Times, dates, addresses, names, even bank accounts. We discussed the matter with Oscar along with David's many infidelities. It turns out Oscar knew all about David's marriages. He also accepted money from David to run through his company. He was money laundering, although Oscar claims he never once thought the money was illegally obtained. That's what we discussed. I want this proof that you have, Kepler stated firmly. I was planning on giving it to you, Bree told him. However, you were a little impatient with rushing me to dinner tonight. If I had enough time, I would have stopped by the office for it. It's a flash drive. Where did you obtain it from? he asked. Cramarn. David and Robert's lawyer was instructed to give it to a friend of David, Mr. Crawford, Bree informed him. I pickpocketed him. You stole it, grimaced Kepler. I borrowed it, copied the information, and returned the original this afternoon. Bree took a sip of wine to calm her nerves. Usually, Kepler and she were on the same side. She didn't appreciate being questioned like this. Crawford knows all about it, so no worries. He won't press any charges. Illegally obtained information. Kepler scowled at her. Bree shrugged. It's still information. Maybe you can get a warrant and grab the real deal from Crawford. Maybe, allowed Kepler. He sighed. 
What am I going to do with you, Bree? Nothing. I'm no longer yours to do with. We broke up, remember? replied Bree. Why are you surveilling Everett? To see what he does and where he goes, Kepler said tersely. Bree's jaw dropped as a thought occurred to her. You wanted to catch David first. You had us followed just in case we managed to find him. You could sweep him out from under our noses and save face right in front of your boss. Then you would not have to make a deal with Everett to lessen his father's prison time. Kepler shifted uncomfortably. Bree pointed her fork at him. That is low, even for you. In my defense, we've been searching for David and most of my leads have dried up, complained Kepler. I needed to make some progress. So you used me? Bree tossed the fork on the table, leaning back and folding her arms. I did. We use each other all the time, he shrugged. Not like this. Bree stood up. I thought we were friends. Weird friends, but still friends. I guess we aren't. She turned to leave, but Kepler caught up to her, grabbing her arm. I'm sorry, Bree. Come back and sit down. I have good news for you. How can you possibly have good news for me? Bree glared at him. Just sit down. We can finish our meal, and I hope you'll be so pleased with my news that you'll forgive me for putting a tail on you and your boyfriend, cajoled Kepler. Please? Okay, muttered Bree. This had better be good. It is. Kepler drew her back to the table, pulling out her seat for her. Bree made herself comfortable. She waited for him to be seated before expectantly raising an eyebrow. Kepler sighed. I talked to my boss about your proposal of turning in David for a reduced sentence for Robert. He's willing to drop charges on accessory to drug smuggling and ask for leniency for Robert's age and medical conditions, if you hand over the location of David and we capture him at said location. That is great, Bree brightened. That's exactly what Everett was hoping for. I thought you would be pleased. Kepler took a sip of wine. So, how long have you and the rich boy been going out? How long have you been surveilling us? Bree questioned back. We have been tailing him ever since he came back to the country. Kepler eyed her. You do know that he lives in Europe. Bree cocked her head to the side. You almost sound like you're jealous. I'm used to having you around. This is going to change that, admitted Kepler. You are used to having me at your beck and call, Bree admonished him. Maybe we should work on just being friends instead of using each other. Maybe even you and Ever can manage to get along. I have my doubts on that, scowled Kepler. I'm part of the group of peoples that are ripping apart his life. The Ramsleys are never going to be the same after this investigation is through. You are also the man who has helped to broker a deal for his dad, Bree pointed out. I'm sure Everett will appreciate that. Kepler grimaced. I apologize for grilling you. You could have just asked. Bree speared her now cold fish with her fork. This is cold. Skip to dessert? Kepler knew she had a weakness for sweets. Please, agreed Bree. They chatted amicably over cake before Kepler paid and escorted her to her car. He leaned against the vehicle as she unlocked it. I suppose I'll have to find a new girl to take to dinner. I have a friend. She would probably go to dinner with you on occasion, offered Bree. No matchmaking, warned Kepler. You know I'm not good with relationships. She wouldn't want anything involved, Bree assured him. Her friend was permanently out of the dating pool after a bad relationship. Bree knew that just casual was exactly what Rhea would tolerate. Dinner, maybe a movie, or just hanging out. That's all she would be looking for. Kepler sighed, then nodded. Fine. I'll have her get in touch with you. Bree laid a hand on his arm. Bill, you're more than welcome at any time to come and bother me at the office. Or even to hang out together. I just can't be your go-to girl for pretend dates. I truly do want to be friends. Thanks, I appreciate that. He covered her hand a moment, giving it a squeeze. Tell Everett if he ever breaks your heart, I'll come for him. Bree rolled her eyes. 
No, you won't. Good night, Bree, Kepler responded before he went to find his own vehicle. Bree headed back to the office to find Everett and Marty bonding over spicy Italian food. Bree grimaced. It wasn't her cup of tea. She preferred to be able to taste her own food, not have the food scorch her tongue in submission. Noticing a leftover donut, she grabbed it. The guys were poring over a computer screen. What are you looking at? wondered Bree. Surveillance equipment, responded Marty. These are cool. That is impressive. Everett looked over the stats. What are the customer reviews like? Let me scroll down. Marty adjusted his glasses. Ah, not so great. Everett nodded wisely. Always check reviews on equipment. Bree sunk into a chair, flipping her shoes off as she watched them with amusement. Why are you shopping for equipment? You know it's not in the budget. A guy can dream, sighed Marty. First thing tomorrow, I'm going to the courthouse to get you caught up on those tickets. I'll need the keys to your car. Bree grabbed them out of her purse, tossing them to him. How did your non-date with Kepler go? Everett finally succumbed to the temptation to ask. We have decided that he needs to non-date another girl, since I'll be busy, smiled Bree. He took it very well. However, he has been tailing you the entire time, and I feel silly for not noticing it. What? Everett was surprised. He hadn't noticed anyone either. Seriously? Are you sure, or was he just trying to get under your skin? Kepler doesn't lie, Bree said dryly. You've been under surveillance since you came back from Europe. Are you going back to Europe? That would put a big kink in this relationship thing we are working on. No, I'm not. The European Division of Ramsley Insurance is dead, replied Everett. Jake has asked me to take over the Western Division, but that would mean I couldn't live here in the city. I would have to eventually relocate to the West Coast. Would you? frowned Bree. She didn't like the thought of him being so far away. I've decided to turn him down, Everett said calmly. In fact, I've decided to get out of insurance altogether once things have calmed down with the investigation against Ramsley Insurance. Not that I won't help Jake and Dylan when they need it, but I have not enjoyed my job in a long time. I think it's about time to find a new one. What would you do? wondered Bree. He had enough cash that he never really needed to work. However, she could admire that he wanted to. Everyone should have some sort of ambition. I was thinking. Everett hesitated a little. If you would like, I could help out here. It's been a lot of fun working with you. You want me to hire you? Bree raised an eyebrow, secretly delighted at the prospect. I don't think you could afford to hire me. Everett had a slow smile. Not with all those tickets you owe on. However, you might like someone who would be helpful for a small commission on the bounties you collect. Bree pretended to think about it as she got up from her chair. Straightening the collar on Everett's shirt, she had a slow smile. That might be doable. We'll have to talk over the specifics. Perhaps over a late night snack somewhere, he offered. I would like that. Bree gazed up at him and decided he might just be the right height for her. He might even be the right billionaire for her. I would like that a lot. Ugh, mush in the office. Go away so I can get some work done. Marty rolled his eyes. Bree found her shoes and the couple left with a wave to him. Marty typed furiously at his computer and reflected that Bree's relationship with Everett just might last. Everett looked over the city from the window in his rented apartment. Bree and he had a wonderful dessert at a small cafe while discussing the future together. Far from his usual need to avoid such conversations, he had been more than happy to talk about them as a couple. Not that they were anywhere near rings and marriage, something he was grateful for. He could see a future with Bree, but they needed to work through the present first they would take it one day at a time. Alexa called Jake. Okay, calling Jake, the device said in its modulated voice. A moment later, Everett could hear the call going through. Jake Ramsley, Jake responded, sounding a little harried. 
It's your best brother ever, Everett greeted him. Dylan? Hey, Everett protested, a little annoyed. I know it's you, Everett. Jake sounded amused. Any word on our least favorite uncle? He's still not found, sighed Everett. We're getting information, but it's not really leading anywhere. That's too bad. I managed to convince Dad to fire Kramarn and get a team of lawyers who will actually help his case. Jake informed him. That was a fight. Do you think Dad is afraid of Uncle David? Everett frowned over the thought. If we're correct, David managed to kill Ted Searson while Ted was in prison. Jake responded dryly. I would say Dad would have a right to be a little leery. I thought Ted died of an allergic reaction, remarked Everett. So does everyone else. However, Ramsley Pharma was testing a drug, and the main side effect was allergic reactions, replied Jake. Something fell in the background. Ouch! For pity's sake, that hurt. What are you doing? wondered Everett. I'm trying out a new recipe, groused Jake. I didn't use an oven mint and burnt my hand. Since when do you cook? Everett looked at his watch. It's two in the morning. I want to get it right before the weekend. There was running water in the background, and Jake sighed in relief. That really did hurt. What is so important about the weekend? Everett tossed off his shoes and jacket. He happily slouched in an armchair. I'm going to propose. Jake banged something around. What? Everett sat up straight. Seriously? Yep, Jake said proudly. I got the ring today. Everett was surprised. Are you sure? You two barely know each other. She was a tabloid reporter. What if it goes badly and she decides to leak all our lives across the news again? She isn't going to do that. Jake's tone was irritated. I love her. She loves me. I know it's a little quick, but there are reasons why. She's pregnant. Everett guessed heavily. He would have thought that Jake would be more responsible than that. No, Jake protested. She isn't pregnant. We haven't even... No. Everett was surprised at Jake's unfinished sentence. No, Jake said shortly. We were taking it slow. A ring doesn't say slow. Everett cut to the core of the matter. What reason do you have for not waiting till both of you are more secure in your relationship? The FBI came by again, confessed Jake. They've taken all the financial records of the company. I expected that, and I know we're going to be paying out a large fine for illegal money laundering. However, I got the impression that they're looking to pin a few more people to the proverbial wall. You didn't do anything wrong. Everett dismissed Jake's worries. They can't charge you with anything because you were ignorant of what was going on. Like Dylan said earlier, ignorance is no excuse, responded Jake. He and I are the heads of our divisions. We should have been informed about the accounting errors. We should have investigated it by audit and informed the proper authorities ourselves. We have a duty to have done that. I can see the FBI charging Dylan and I. You're not going to prison, Jake, reasoned Everett. Don't let Kepler get inside your head. Well, he did. Jake's voice was frustrated and tired. I just want to make Sterling mine. I want to be married to her and love her. I know that if I go to prison, she will wait for me anyways, but I would feel better if we were married. I want to build some memories to have should the worst happen. Everett was silent for a moment as he thought about his brother's words. Okay. If you need any help with the wedding, let me know. I will, promised Jake. Chapter 10 It's been two days, and we haven't seen anything, complained Bree as she peered through a set of binoculars while she lounged in a comfortable chair. They had been taking turns sleeping, eating, watching television, and looking at the windows of Miss Everly's apartment. Even with the high-powered telescope lenses and a heat-sensing device, all they had seen was Miss Everly and her paid help. If David Ramsley was hiding in that apartment, he was keeping to the bedroom or bathroom. Something that Bree seriously doubted. It didn't make sense. Could someone have tipped him off that we were watching? Everett wondered. 
he struck another name off their list of possible people to question. They had been both calling various persons of interest in the case, asking probing questions as to David's activities. Mostly, they were hitting brick walls. No one wanted to talk about David, or they wanted to vent, giving an earful of anger but no useful information. I don't see how, frowned Bree. I don't think he's there. Then Uncle Oscar lied to us, scowled Everett. He should have known better than to trust the man, but he had always liked his uncle. Now what? I need to think. Bree set aside the binoculars. We know that David is communicating with multiple people, including a film director, ghostwriter, his lawyer Kramar, and Crawford. The film director and ghostwriter said it's through a third party that they won't name. Unless I give up five million. Everett blew out a frustrated breath. We might have to do it. That's a lot of money with no guarantee that the ghostwriter is going to tell us the truth, she cautioned. What about returning to the island to see if we can find any more clues? asked Everett. If I were Crawford, I would have moved them. Bree moved from her chair to sit with Everett, leaning against him. There has to be something that we are missing. Everett wrapped an arm around her, pulling her closer. Then we'll think harder and figure it out. Bree nodded, relaxing. Would you like to come to a wedding with me? Everett asked suddenly. Actually, a couple of weddings? Really? Bree shifted so she could see his face. Who's getting married? I've been invited to Drew and Bethany's wedding, Everett told her. Plus, my brother is going to propose today to Sterling. If she accepts, and it sounds like she will, they will probably be getting married soon. That could be fun, smiled Bree. Okay. Good. Everett had an answering smile before a phone trilled, interrupting the moment. Bree dug in a pocket, pulling out her cell. Hey, Marty, what's up? Put him on speaker, requested Everett. She nodded and touched the screen. I found the most interesting thing when I did. Marty's voice came over the cell. At first I thought Crawford was on a conference call between David and the ghostwriting guy, whose name is Phil, by the way. Then I checked the phone records, and I realized it was a two-way call. There was no third party, which could only mean one thing. When Everett and Bree had handed back the stolen USB drive to Crawford, Marty had put a hidden program that would give him access through the internet to computer files. By making Crawford paranoid about what was on the file, he had checked out the program on his computer, downloading their piggybacked virus that gave Marty free reign through any connected networks. They had discovered, much to Marty's delight, that Crawford had Alexa downloaded into his smart house system. Marty had access to the phone records, the computer, the tablet, even the grocery list that the fridge was tallying up for the grocery delivery service. David is with Phil, breathed Bree. When was the call? This morning, two hours ago. However, that isn't where David is, cautioned Marty. What do you mean? asked Everett with a frown. When I rendered the audio through a couple of programs, I noticed that the background sound when David speaks is the same as when Crawford speaks he said triumphantly. David is at Crawford's, concluded Everett. Grab the cameras. Bree jumped to her feet. We are going to get a couple of pictures, send them directly to Kepler, and bam, we've got our man. Forget the cameras, Marty shouted into the phone. He has an in-home security system. There are cameras all over the house that he arms when he goes away. I took the liberty of turning some on and recording the footage. What? Everett paused in the act of grabbing the car keys from the coffee table. When did you figure that out? Today? Marty's voice danced with excitement. I have grainy video of Mr. Fugitive David Ramsley with Crawford, time-stamped and all. Check out your phones. Everett and Bree huddled over her phone, looking at the picture messages that Marty had sent them. There he is. We have to get this to Kepler, Bree told Everett. Call him and set up a meeting. I want to discuss a plea deal for my dad in person. Everett was grim. Then we can hand over all the information. Thank you, Marty. That's what I'm here for, Marty replied happily. I'll keep an eye on David make sure he isn't going anywhere. You are getting a bonus, promised Everett before Bree ended the call. She dialed Kepler's number. Bill Kepler, came his strong and slightly annoyed voice. Bill, we need to talk. 
Bree grinned in excitement. We know where David Ramsley is. Where? Kepler immediately became more interested. We hand over the location and the photo proof. In return, you give us, in writing, a plea deal for my father. Everett jumped in. Done. I want to get this set up as soon as possible to nail him before he moves again, responded Kepler. Email me the plea deal and we can make it happen. Everett smiled in satisfaction. Give me time to get my supervisor involved, Kepler told them. I'll get back to you. Hurry up, advised Bree. We're not certain how much longer David's going to remain at the location. If he moves, you need to track him, warned Kepler. I will be in touch. The call ended. Bree and Everett grinned to each other. Finally! Everett scooped Bree into his arms and twirled her around. You and Marty are amazing. Admit it. You didn't think we could do it, laughed Bree. I totally admit it. However, you surprised me in all good ways, he assured her. Setting her back on her feet, he gave her a quick kiss. We should go to Crawford's home just in case David does decide to leave. Then we'll at least have a chance at following him. Agreed, Bree said breathlessly. Grab the cameras and let's go. They quickly packed up what they needed and went down to the car. Slow down a little, cautioned Everett as Bree took a corner a little fast. We don't need to lose David just because we're getting a ticket. Bree grimaced, but pulled her foot a little off the gas. We also don't need to lose him because we missed getting there in time. Everett grabbed his cell phone, dialing Marty's number. I have an idea. Tell me, said Marty as he tapped away on a computer. David is getting ready to move. He has his coat on and an overnight bag. Crawford is grabbing his keys. I'm working on trying to get the house alarm to go off, but I'm not sure it will work. Crawford has some nice-looking vehicles. Does he have OnStar? asked Everett. Could you track him through that? If I had two hours to hack in, Marty sounded a little frazzled. Plus, I'd need some VIN numbers and all sorts of information that we don't have. We're running out of time. Tell me you are close. Not close enough. Everett glanced at Bree as she laid on the gas, pulling around a car. He checked that his seatbelt was secure. You need to call Kepler, Bree told Everett. They can track David through the traffic cameras. We can't. I have yet to receive the email for the plea deal yet. He grabbed the dash as Bree slammed on the brakes for a city bus. We lose David, there is no deal, reasoned Bree. She honked the horn. Use my phone so Marty can stay on yours. They've left the house and are getting into the car, Marty informed them. I'm going to try to set off the house alarm now. I will call Kepler, Everett said grimly, searching through Bree's contacts, selecting Bill Kepler. Kepler here, he greeted them. We're sending the deal now. A reduced sentence recommended for humanitarian reasons due to medical conditions and the accessory to drug smuggling charges dropped. Depending on the judge, Robert will spend seven to ten years in a minimum security facility, all in return for the location of David Ramsley. Perfect. Everett breathed a huge sigh of relief. David is at Crawford's, but he's leaving the house right now. We're trying to stall him, but I'm not sure that we can. Everett confirmed the address with Kepler, sending the grainy time-stamp pictures Marty has taken as proof. We're on our way, Kepler told them before ending the call. Bree laid on the gas again. We do want to get there alive, mentioned Everett. We will. Bree concentrated on driving. Marty, what's happening? They're calling the alarm company, said Marty with satisfaction. They think the alarm's malfunctioning. David isn't pleased. He has places to be. Can you find out where he might be going? wondered Everett. I put on Alexa and I'm listening to the audio, but so far they haven't mentioned a location. Marty sighed in annoyance. How far away are you? Ten minutes, announced Bree. Twenty estimated Everett. Slow down a little. Stop worrying. Bree swerved to avoid a cyclist. Everett clenched his teeth and wished he were the one driving. David wants to leave, Marty told them. I'm about to have a fridge malfunction. Can you do that? Everett wanted to know. Oh yeah, ice cube bonanza, Marty yelled in triumph. Spit those cubes out. I want the video of this when it's over, commented Everett. David is royally unhappy. He's motioning to his watch, Marty told them the commentary. Crawford is unplugging the fridge. 
Not a good move with all that seafood in there. Can you make the alarm go off again? asked Bree. Nope, the alarm company has disabled it. It'd take longer than a couple minutes to get into their system now. Marty was mournful. I think that's all I have in my arsenal. The only thing I can do is tell you which way they come out of the drive. The rest is up to you. Bree made a wicked turn onto Crawford's road. They're in the car, said Marty, backing up. Bree slammed on the brakes, blocking the driveway. We're here at the house. Everett got out of the vehicle, walking up to the passenger door. He grabbed the handle, but it was locked. Everett banged on the window with a fist as he peered inside. Cursing, he straightened. It's not him. What? Bree was incredulous. Marty saw him on the video. It's not him. Everett ran a hand through his hair. It looks like him, but that isn't my uncle. Of course it's not him. Now get out of my way. Crawford stepped out of the car, scowling at them. I'm trying to bring my friend to the airport. Open the trunk, demanded Bree. Excuse me? snorted Crawford. That isn't going to happen. I'm a bounty hunter. Bree stalked over to the driver's side of the vehicle, pushing Crawford aside. If I have reasonable cause to believe my quarry is in a house or a vehicle, I have the right to enter. I'll get my lawyer involved over this. Crawford threatened as Bree pushed the button to pop open the trunk of the car. Everett quickly opened it before Crawford could try to shut it. Empty except the suitcase. Is it big enough to put a person in? asked Bree. Not an adult, Everett said grimly. He grabbed out his cell phone where Marty was still listening. What happened, Marty? I don't know. Marty was furiously typing. I can only think that the camera feed was showing old video in hopes that I would mess up. Or he looks so much like David through the grainy feed that we mistook this guy for my uncle, growled Everett. Then David wasn't here at all, said a heavily disappointed Bree. I told you that already, groused Crawford. Now get your car out of my way so we can get to the airport. Kepler isn't going to be happy, moaned Bree. Kepler? Agent Kepler from the FBI? Paled Crawford. What about him? The FBI are on their way, thinking that David was here, explained Bree. You told the FBI to come? Crawford was white. I need to go now. Move your car! Everett frowned as a glint of gold on the luggage caught his eye in the sunlight. Leaning over, he pulled the monogram tag on the zipper sideways so that he could better see it. He pulled in a shaky breath as an idea came to him. It was a bit far-fetched, but why not? Why wouldn't David have done it? He thought about the eyes of the man who had glared at him through the passenger window. They had been arrogant and hate-filled. Everett turned suspiciously to Crawford. What is your friend's name? None of your business. Crawford pushed on Everett and slammed the trunk closed. Really? Everett went past him to try to get a better glimpse into the car, but the driver's side door slammed shut. The man had crawled into the driver's seat and started the vehicle. Get back! Bree cried out as the car's engine revved and it reversed right into her vehicle, denting it. Moving forward, the man drove over the lawn and curb to get to the street. Everett and Crawford barely managed to get out of the way in time as the car zipped past them. Crawford winced as the muffler came off. Let's go! Everett grabbed Bree, hauling her along to the car. Why? You said it wasn't David! Bree quickly got in. Plastic surgery? Everett explained his theory. He had no doubts now that it was true. The monogrammed initials on the luggage were DMR, for David Michael Ramsley. The man was driving away like a maniac. It could only be David. Floor it! She hastily complied, following David down the road. We are going south, Everett informed Marty as he put on his seatbelt. He reached over Bree, pulling hers over and clipping her in. Get Kepler on the phone and let him know. Will do, Marty was jubilant. Do you know the reward on this guy? Ten million? Bree tapped the dash. I think he killed our radiator. What? Everett looked at her in alarm. No. Yep. The car is heating up. Bree was grim. Tell Bill to hurry. David just took a turn. I'm tracking your phone, Marty told her. 
sending the information to Kepler. He's five minutes out. I'm going to end up wrecking this car, grimaced Bree as she watched the gauge go higher. Ten million, Marty reminded Bree. We can afford a new car. Just don't lose sight of David. We want to make sure the FBI gets him. Bree leaned over the steering wheel, ready to take the curb and follow David as he took a shortcut around a corner, leaving a ruts in someone's lawn. He clipped a garbage can and trash was strewn all over the street. Everett braced himself for the bumps. This is crazy. It's fun, grinned Bree. It was. Everett thought it might also be one of the most addictive things he had ever done. He went down the alley. Bree slowed for the turn, making certain to clear the fenced-in area. How far away is Kepler? asked Everett. He should be right in front of you, Marty told them. I can see blue lights, Bree pointed ahead of David's car. David made a wild swerve, then hit the gas, ramming a car that was blocking the alleyway. Bree hit the brakes, bringing their car to a stop. Black cars with blue lights blocked the alley behind them and in front of David. They watched as men raced past them, securing the car. Moments later, David was handcuffed. Kepler knocked on Bree's window. She rolled down the glass. That doesn't look like David, he commented darkly. Plastic surgery, explained Everett. Do a fingerprint or DNA test. It's him. We'll see, grimaced Kepler. If it isn't, we're all in serious trouble. I will pay for any of the damages, offered Everett. The person's lawn back there, the whole bit. Nice. Over that won't save my career if this goes bust, sighed Kepler. It's him, insisted Everett. I hope so, Kepler commented as they all watched David get into the back of the FBI vehicle. If not, I'm sending the bill for this little operation to you. That's fine, Everett assured him. His luggage is in the trunk. Here is a copy of the flash drive. Bree dug through her purse and handed it over. It has all the data on it. It should be more than enough to put David behind bars for the rest of his life. It also implicates Uncles James and Oscar. Everett wasn't happy about that. Marty had delved into the data further, and they now knew that each of the Ramsley businesses were involved in the money laundering scheme. However, it clears everyone else of wrongdoing. None of my cousins knew about the illegal money going through any of the family businesses. That means you can leave my brothers Jake and Dylan alone. I will be the judge of that. Kepler pocketed the USB drive. There'll still be penalties and jail time for certain individuals. We'll see what the justice system decides. Look, we helped you get David. Everett was frustrated. Jake and Dylan are innocent. They didn't know about the money. They were the heads of Ramsley Insurance in this country. Kepler's icy gaze bore into Everett. They're responsible for what happens in their companies. Like I said, we'll continue the investigation. The judges will determine fines and jail times. Bree laid a hand on Everett's arm. There was no point in arguing with Kepler any further. She knew that from experience. Kepler gave them a nod before moving forward to talk to the other agents on the case. Epilogue Two weeks after David Ramsley was caught during a high-speed chase by FBI officials, said the news anchor, the billionaire was transferred to a medical facility for problems with his heart. Officials say that David may have suffered a heart attack and have released no word on his health. Family and friends of the business tycoon have been silent about his capture and his hospitalization, leading to unanswered questions. Max scowled as he shut off the television. He tugged on his tie, loosening it a little. Paget, are you almost ready? Lunch and supper are in the fridge. Just warm them up. Their snacks are clearly labeled. Don't mix them up because Morgan won't eat the peaches. They each get a story before bed. Paget reminded the babysitter. Don't let Ryder try to talk you into staying up, or an extra story. And Morgan isn't allowed to play any video games. He's still grounded for that stunt he pulled. She grabbed her purse and came forward to straighten Max's tie. We are still on time. No one else said that they would be here with the car service in five minutes. Max straightened Paget's necklace, putting the clasp back behind her neck. Have I told you how much I love you today? Paget smiled. 
You did. However, two boys are enough. Stop trying to butter me up for a third. What? asked Max innocently. With Noah's kids, we have almost got a baseball team if you and I just have two more. Not happening. Paget gave him a fond kiss. Let's go meet them downstairs. Can't blame a guy for trying. Max smiled, grabbing an umbrella before opening the door for Paget. Christian Gaines was arrested today on charges of money laundering. A business newsperson spoke over the television. Gaines was head of the Ramsley Pharmaceuticals between the tenures of Michael Ramsley and Noah Ramsley. It's believed that Gaines had full knowledge of David Ramsley's activities within the company and thus is being charged as an accessory to the crime. Michael shut off the television screen. He tied the black strip of silk around his neck in a perfect knot before grabbing his jacket. Anne came to stand beside him, sliding an earring through her ear. I'm so thankful. Michael looked at her in surprise. Not about Mr. Gaines. Anne hastened to explain as she wrapped her arms around her husband. I liked him, and I think that it's too bad that he's caught up in all of this. But I'm grateful that you're no longer being investigated. I'm so happy to have you home where you belong. Michael held her, thankful as well. He kissed her forehead and hugged her tightly. Come on, Anne had a teary smile. We don't want to be late. He took her hand as they left the room. Gaines was arrested. Noah informed Al as he slid the phone from his ear, putting it away. I guess the FBI believes that he knew what Dad was up to all along. Al laid a sympathetic hand on her husband's arm as they waited in the limo for Max and Paget to arrive. The couples had decided to carpool together to the funeral, to make it easier. Elle leaned against Noah. I can't help but think that it could have been you. What do you mean? Noah frowned as he looked at his wife. He put a hand over hers. David decided to target Michael, framing him because he was mad that Michael had forced him to retire, Elle explained. It could have easily been you. You defied your father to marry me. I'm still here, Noah assured her. Dad is in prison. He can't hurt any of us any more. I worry, she told him quietly. David is now cornered. He might be at his most dangerous. It will be okay. He wrapped an arm around her. Let's just get through the day. The driver opened the door as Max and Paget approached the car. Drew frowned a hand on Bethany's back as they waited in the parking lot. The clouds threatened to rain, but were holding off for the moment. Molson and Holly pulled up on the motorcycle. Holly pulled off the helmet, smoothing down her hair and skirt, as Molson stowed the helmets away. Are we early? Molson asked, looking around the parking lot. I suppose we are, Drew responded, looking at his watch. Kind of annoying, since we're the odd ones out. They asked us to come, Bethany reminded him. The Ramsleys want to acknowledge us as part of the family. We aren't, grimaced Drew. Not really. They're treating us like we are, Molson pointed out. I'm headed to the little girl's room to check on my hair, announced Holly. Beth, care to come? Absolutely, replied Bethany, giving Drew a loving pat on the arm before joining her friend. The guys watched the pair go into the building, electing to stay outside for a while longer. Take your hands out of your pockets, Drew mildly admonished. You do that when you're uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable because I got this tie on, complained Molson, folding his arms across his chest. It's near to strangling me. How are you doing with yours? It's a clip-on, admitted Drew. Cheater, groused Molson giving in to impulse and pulling at his neck. Leave it alone. Otherwise the ladies will complain, Drew told him. Oh, I don't know, Molson had a grin. I don't mind when Holly just my tie and collar. Drew rolled his eyes. He paused as he spotted FBI agent Kepler standing a little ways away under some trees. Wait here. Molson spotted who Drew was looking at. Not likely. The pair approached Kepler. Tell me you're not here to try to arrest anyone, 
growled Drew. It's a funeral, for pity's sake. Just observing, Kepler assured him, his icy blue eyes fastening on them. I've noticed how tight you and the Ramsley family are getting. I wouldn't say that, Drew replied dampeningly. It would be nice if none of them were to notice you. Let them grieve in private. Nothing is private. Kepler shook his head. I'm amazed the press hasn't showed up yet. Everyone did their best to keep this under cover, responded Drew. It'll all come out sooner rather than later, but for now they would like to keep it quiet. I won't tip the press. Kepler watched a car pull in. Leave them alone. Wolfson stepped into Kepler's line of vision. Wasn't wrongfully imprisoning Michael enough? Crimes have been committed. Kepler's tone was deceptively mild. It's my job to make sure justice is done. Don't worry. I'll fade into the background and no one will notice. Jake pulled into the parking lot, shutting off the vehicle. Sterling reached out to take his hand. I'm very sorry, Jake spoke gravely. Today was supposed to be a happier day for us. It's not your fault. She took off her seat belt, sliding across the seat to lean against him as he put his arm around her. No one could have known that he was going to die. We can wait a little longer to get married. Everett said he'll cover any of the cost of lost deposits until your funds are unfrozen and you can pay him back. He had a heavy sigh. I can't believe he's gone. It's going to be okay, Sterling gently assured him. They sat there for a minute, ignoring the outside world. We should go in, Jake reluctantly said. Dylan helped Kelly out of the car. Are you sure you're up for this? There's going to be a lot of standing around. Then I will just have fat ankles at the end of the day. It's okay. She reached up to give him a quick kiss. I will be fine. As the only pregnant lady, I'm sure someone will find me a chair if I really do end up needing one. If you wanted to stay home with the boys, I would not have been upset, suggested Dylan. He grabbed her purse from inside the car and handed it to her before shutting the passenger door. Dylan, look at me, Kelly insisted. She waited until she had his full attention, smoothing out the lapels of his jacket. I love you. I'm here because I want to be. I'm here to support you and your family today. Now stop worrying about me. Worrying is what I do. Dylan pulled her into his arms, hugging her. Reassuring you is what I do. Kelly leaned against him. It's going to be a tough day, but we can get it through it together. Thank you for coming with me. Dylan kissed the top of her head. There's no place I would rather be than with you. She responded honestly. Shall we go inside? Dylan nodded, drawing her arm through his as they headed toward the building. Someone has a motorcycle. Everett eyed the machine. Should we get a motorcycle? Only if I get to drive, Bree said impishly. Everett reflected that that might be a bad idea, considering the way she drove a car. Maybe not. Spoil sport. Bree rolled her eyes. She didn't wait for him to get the door for her, hopping out of the SUV and meeting him on their way to the building. She slipped her arm into his. An elderly gentleman solemnly approached them. Mr. Ramsley, pallbearers are meeting in the room right here. Other family members are meeting in this room for the procession. Thank you. Everett took a program that the man offered, handing it to Bree. It started to hit him that this was real. Today, they would be burying one of their own. He swallowed against the emotion that threatened to overcome him. Hey, Bree pulled him to the side. We're all here with you. You're going to get through this. Everett cleared his throat. I don't know why, but it didn't seem real until now. Probably because we've been so busy? Bree allowed him to draw her close. Everett spotted Michael giving Anne a brief hug before the couple separated, Anne going to the room set aside for family, and Michael going into the pallbearer's room. I should go. Bree gave him a quick kiss on the cheek before stepping back, letting him go to the pallbearer's room. Come on, 
Sterling hooked her arm through Bree's. Let's go meet the rest of the family. Bree nodded, letting herself be led into the family room. Gabe heaved an internal sigh as he recognized Brittany Crawford. She was waiting by the doors of the building, watching him approach, no doubt to offer condolences to the Ramsley family. He wished she would not. Britt and he had never gotten along. She was abrupt, rude, and had a habit of picking on him. She was a know-it-all. Somehow he had been paired with her a lot at school for projects, plays, and on student council. She had always been around. When Grabe had graduated and gone on to work in the family company that managed a chain of hospitals, he had been more than happy to leave her behind. Here she was again. It was only natural to see her. They hung around in the same social circles. However, Gabe was a master of getting out of doing the social whirl. It wasn't something he enjoyed. Brittany, he kept his voice neutral. It had been a few years since they had last met. Perhaps she had grown up. Or maybe his memories of her were a little flawed by his personal dislike of her. Gabriel, she returned, eyeing him critically. You have gained weight. Good to see you, too, he said wryly, annoyed. She was the exact same. You should watch that, she advised him, especially after your uncle had a heart attack and now this death. If you're not careful... You'll become like your cousin Ben. Ben is fine, Gabe defended. Okay, Ben could stand to lose some weight. The guy was rather hefty. Gabe thought of himself as a little husky. He was only carrying around an extra 25 to 30 pounds since his college days. Not something to be worried about. If you got a wife, she could look after your diet and make sure you stay healthy, Brittany pointed out. She followed him into the funeral chapel, oblivious to the fact that her company was unwanted. I'm fine. Gabe wasn't about to go all veggie tray. Maybe he could step it up at the gym a little. Angrily, he shoved the thought away. He was always letting Britt do this, making him feel insecure. Her opinion should not matter. It didn't matter. He almost missed her next words. You could marry me and I will look after you, she offered, entirely serious. Gabe's jaw dropped. Find out more about Gabe and Britt in convincing him. Brittany Crawford and Gabriel Ramsley have a lot in common. They have gone to the same schools. They reside in the same social class. Both their fathers are involved with David Ramsley's schemes, and are facing charges and time in prison. However, Gabe just doesn't see it. He thinks Brit's a know-it-all, rude, and annoying girl. He has been trying to ditch her for years. Now she has come forward with an outrageous proposal of marriage to him. Brittany has always had a crush on Gabe. She followed him all around school, and yet he didn't get the hint. For some reason, as outspoken as she is, Brittany was never able to tell him how she feels. Now, years later, she has a chance and is going to let Gabe know that she is the right one for him. Sign up for Josephine's weekly newsletter and get a free book, Kissing Katie. Get a free short story just for signing up for a free e-newsletter. Josephine's newsletter includes polls, showing off covers before they are published, sneak peeks, promotions, contests, upcoming releases, and more. Just go to https semicolon backslash backslash dl dot bookfunnel dot com backslash q i r l nine n g n one zero. Jackson Davis is in a panic. Seven years ago, he sent a manuscript to an editor as a joke. Now he's becoming a famous romance writer under the pen name J D Emerson, and his editor wants him to go on a tour including an interview on a daytime talk show. The problem? He let everyone think he's a woman writer. Katie Sutton is just not making it in life. Her car is an oil-gulping rust bucket. Her hours are being reduced at the daycare center where she works. Plus, her rent has gone up. She's always had a crush on Jackson, her friend Trent's older brother, 
but he sees her as he always has, Trent's buddy. Katie might just be the perfect answer to his problems if Jackson can get her to accept a position to pose as his pen name and do the tour for him. She could be the face of his muse. From mishaps to writer's block and stage fright, Jackson and Katie are spending a lot of time together. For the first time, Jackson is really looking at Katie. What he sees makes him think of taking the romance off the paper and into reality. Kissing Katie, find it on Amazon. And happy reading. <laughs>